And good morning. The court will call State of Wisconsin versus Jesse Kershevsky, case number 21, CF 885. May I have the appearances, please? Abby Nikolai, Randy Sitzberger, and JJ Crawford appearing for the State. Good morning, Judge. Good morning, Your Honor. Donna Kukler, Brad Novreski, Pablo Galaviz appear with Ms. Kershevsky. Good morning. And good morning once again. I am told all jurors are here. State ready to go with the next witness? Yes, ma'am. Anything I need to address with the parties prior to bringing the jury out from the state? No, thank you. From the defense? Your Honor, just letting you know that when it comes to Detective uh, Plenis, that Attorney Navrosky is going to be involved in the questioning. All right, any objection from the state? I guess I would just ask for clarification about being involved. Is he asking the questions or? All right, one attorney, please. So I assume that's what you mean. Okay. Yep, no problem then. Uh, very well, Madam Clerk, you can have the jurors brought out. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. The state may call its next witness. Thank you, Judge. The state calls Detective Nate Plenis. Right, good morning. If you would please make your way all the way up to the witness stand. When you get there, please remain standing. Raise your right hand, and my clerk, Teresa, will swear you in. Testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you, God. I do. Thank you. Please have a seat. 
First thing I will have you do is to state your first and last names for the record and spell each. Uh, Nathan Plenis, N-A-T-H-A-N, P-L-E-N-N-E-S. Thank you. Go ahead, your witness. Thank you, Judge. Sir, how are you employed? I'm a detective with the Waukesha Sheriff's Department. How long have you been with the Sheriff's Department total? I've been with the Sheriff's Department for uh, about 18 years. How many of those 18 years as a detective? Uh, I've been a detective for approximately 13, 14 years. Any law enforcement experience prior to joining the Waukesha Sheriff's Department? Uh, no. Okay. So did you start as a deputy then 18 years ago? I started as a correctional officer uh, and then promoted to deputy. And then in 2014, I was promoted to detective. Is that a pretty easy uh, transition to go from being a deputy up to detective? Uh, there was a testing process and interviews, um, and then having you know your your background as a patrol officer accounted for, and then a promotion, which is decided upon upon supervision and administration. Okay. And what are your uh, sort of standard job duties as a detective as opposed to when you were a deputy? Uh, we investigate the crime, so the, we don't respond to the calls. Uh, calls are normally responded to by uh, patrol. Um, depending on the type of call, we may respond to the scenes um, if requested. Otherwise, the cases end up being referred back to the detective bureau. And you've been in court the duration of this trial, is that fair? Yes. You heard Detective Cole talk about detectives and their movement within your department? Yes. Have you been moved yourself uh, through various assignments? Yes. What kind of assignments have you worked in? Uh, I was assigned to our Drug Enforcement Unit uh, for approximately five years, um, and then to our, I guess, General Investigations Unit where I am currently. In October of 2018, what assignment were you in? I was assigned to our Drug Unit. So were you involved in the investigation into Ms. Jesse Kraszewski at that time? I was not. And that was due to your assignment? Correct. I was not assigned to our General Investigations Bureau. When did you become involved in the investigation into Ms. Kraszewski? I believe I began, became involved around July, end of June, July of 2021. Uh, at that time frame, were you the only detective on the case? No. Did you have a specific assignment then when you were assigned to this case? Yes. What was sort of your job role as it was laid out for you? Uh, when I was asked to assist, I was assist, or asked to assist with reviewing and going through the financial portion of the investigation. What did that include? Uh, going through the bank accounts that have been previously obtained, um, reviewing transaction history, money movement, whose accounts were assigned, just reviewing the documents that they had attained at that point. So given that you were not originally part of this investigation, did you have to send out any subpoenas or anything like that to financial institutions? Uh, I did eventually end up sending out some uh, additional subpoenas. Uh, I believe those would have been like in summer of 2021. Okay, and what was the reason for those subpoenas in 2021? Uh, we're just requesting additional documentation. Uh, I think we had obtained maybe some more account activity that we wanted to see if we could obtain any more information about uh, would have been the subpoenas in regards to things like that. Okay. Prior to you sending out those subpoenas, had your department already received a number of financial uh, records? Yes, I had. The previous detectives that were assigned initially had obtained numerous documents or numerous financial accounts through their subpoenas. So just generally, how do you as a detective at the Sheriff's Department determine what institutions or companies to subpoena records from? Uh, well, it de depends on the investigation. Um, if, if they locate credit cards or account information during an investigation, you would lean information on that. If there's payment receipts, if there's um, like checkbooks, things like that, you would learn, you, would, you could obtain where accounts were done, bills, try and attribute that to any accounts that paid bills. Do you ever, as a detective, just say, let's subpoena every bank we know of to see if somebody had an account? No. Okay, why not? You need some information to state why you believe you're requesting documentations from that financial institution. And you said your department did get financial records in this case? Yes. And do you know how uh, the investigation determined what agencies to subpoena? 
In this case? In this case, I'm not exactly sure exactly how they obtained all the account information. I believe maybe probate may have been involved, but they had obtained these documentations or these financial accounts through their investigation. When you say probate may have been involved, what do you mean by that? Well, the probate account that was filed with the Lynn Hernan estate, we've had some financial institutions identified on it. I believe that may have been one of the resources that they used. Okay. And so ultimately that was kind of a starting, a jumping off point. Correct. Now, likewise, when you're sending these institutions subpoenas, are you able to say, just give me everything for Lynn Hernan from the time she started banking with you? No, you normally have to send some type of like a time frame as to what your scope of your investigation will be at that point. And why do you have to do that? Because you can't just blanket subpoena everything and ask for everything without, I guess, a justification or reason for it. Okay. In this case, did you, I should say your department, before you got on the investigation, did they set a time frame of records they were looking for? I believe they did, yes. And what was that general time frame? I think it was 2016. Do you know why that was sort of a benchmark that was set? At that point, I believe that was when Ms. Hernan and Ms. Kraszewski, I guess, became acquainted or further acquainted. Okay. And when you came on the case, you said you looked at all the financial records? I looked at the financial records that they had obtained along with another detective. And who was that? That was Detective O'Toole. Okay. Did you yourself eventually look at all the financial records that have been received in response to subpoenas in the case against Ms. Kraszewski? Yes. Do you know roughly how many financial records you've looked at? I don't know the exact number. I know there, I believe there's over 25. And whose account information were you looking for? Well, we were looking at Ms. Hernan's, Ms. Kraszewski's, and I believe we obtained some for Jennifer Flower, Ms. Kraszewski's mother. Okay. Fair to say that Ms. Hernan and Ms. Kraszewski were the primary two for account holders you were looking for? Correct. Why were you looking at Ms. Hernan's accounts, for example? Well, we were looking at Ms. Hernan's accounts to, I guess, determine what her pattern of life was, figure out what she spent money on, where she went, things of that nature, to figure out a little bit about her, a little history about Ms. Hernan. Could you just explain a little bit more what you mean by pattern of life? Pattern of life would, everyone has a pattern of life. In a financial aspect, pattern of life would consist of identifying where transactions are made, how bills are paid. Everyone has, I guess, I wouldn't say, I guess, consistent way that they live. Like, they may have certain bills that they pay every month. They may have certain stores that they go to. They may have certain locations that they frequent, areas that they're at, things of that nature would help identify what a pattern of life is, what this person's pattern of life was. And why, as a detective, is that important for you to know? It's important to see who, to see what that person did. Obviously, I didn't have a whole lot of, I guess, I didn't know Ms. Hernan, I didn't know Ms. Kraszewski, I didn't know Ms. Flower. Just, it was to get an idea as to what their lives were like at that point. When you look through all these financial records and you're looking for pattern of life, are you also looking for changes to those patterns? We would notate any type of changes. And why would you do that? Because it's just, in and of itself, it shows a change. It shows a difference in their pattern of life. Did they move to a different area, it might indicate. Did someone, I don't know, it would indicate, you know, it would show where they went. If they normally went to certain locations and all of a sudden they started going to a different location, is that because they moved? Is that because something happened to that previous location? That's what would indicate changes in their life. Did you also look at financial account information for Ms. Kraszewski? Yes. And were you also looking for pattern of life type of things in those accounts? Yes. Okay. Thank you for that background, Detective. With that, I'm going to ask to show just the witness a number of exhibits. Exhibit 98, 117, 118, 122, 121, 106, 99, 133, and 134 at this point. Go ahead. Is it? 
on the witness screen? Yes. All right. I just have to catch up here at my council table. And I think if you, I had to turn my monitor, oh, there it is. All right, I think all the TVs are up now. Um, Detective, do you see exhibit 98 there in front of you? And we can scroll down if you need the exhibit number sticker. I do. Okay, and do you recognize what exhibit 98 is? Uh, this would be the uh, bank account records for Lynn Hernan's uh, money market account, identified as the 7601 account the last four digits of the account number. Yeah, I'm sorry if I missed it, but what bank is that through? Uh, BMO Harris. Okay. And now on the right side of that exhibit, do you see how many page numbers that is? Yes. All right. In advance of testifying today, you actually looked through the hard copy of all these financial records. Is that correct? That is correct. And if I were to pull out of that box in front of the judge, the actual hard copy, would your initials be on those financial documents? Yes, they would. And why did you initial the first page of each of these financial documents we're about to go through? To identify the fact that they appear to be a full and correct version of the account records that we received. Okay. And to be fair, you verified that these electronic copies that you're viewing are the same thing as those hard copies that you initialed? Yes. All right. So is Exhibit 98 then a fair and accurate copy of what BMO Harris sent you related to that 7601 account? Yes. Okay. If we could show the witness 117, please. And Detective Plantis, do you recognize uh, Exhibit 117? I do. And what is it? That is a uh, certification of business records. And who is it from? Uh, it's from BMO Harris. Uh, the signature on it, I believe it says, is Cami Schneider. Okay, now what's the date on that certificate? That is August 4th of 2021. Now, Detective Plantis, when you took over the investigation, were you able to track down all certificates of authenticity that maybe your predecessor detectives got a hold of? Uh, no. Okay. So you had to do some work, and, and in 2021, you asked for additional certifications. Correct. Why is a certificate of authenticity from a bank important to you as a detective? The cert cert certification of auth authenticity indicates that uh, BMO Harris is advising that these records are their records, they're an accurate record, and they're citing it saying that they declare that these are true records from BMO Harris or okay. their financial institution. I'm sorry to cut you off. Thank you. And, you know, this is on the front of Exhibit 117. Does that apply to all the BMO Harris records that you uh, received and reviewed in this case? Uh, yes. Okay. And if we scroll down to page 2... Do you see uh, whose account this is? Uh, yes. And whose account is it? This is Lynn Hernan's uh, checking account through BMO Harris. Uh, it was identified as the last four digits of the account as 5336. Okay. And again, do you know this to be a, a fair and accurate copy of the financial records to that account of Ms. Hernan's? Yes. All right. If we can move on to Exhibit 118, please. And if we could scroll down to page two, actually, of this, or three, or four. There we go. Uh, Detective Plantis, do you recognize what's on page four? I do. And what is it? This is the checking account um, records from Wells Fargo for Jesse Krzyzewski's uh, checking account, identified as the last four digits of the account, 8149. And again, I'm sorry if I missed you saying it, but what bank is this checking account through? Uh, it's through Wells Fargo. Okay. And the first three pages that I had Mr. Vulcan here scroll through, what, was, what were those three pages? Can you scroll back up? Sure, Apologies. absolutely. Mr. Vulcan here, please. Thank you. Oh, that was the business records uh, declaration showing what, um, that these were records obtained uh, from Wells Fargo. They provided them, and then it lists the records that were provided. Okay. And is uh, Exhibit 118 a fair and accurate representation of Ms. Kershevsky's Wells Fargo checking account? Yes. All right. If we can move to Exhibit 122, please. 
And again, what do we see on page one of Exhibit 122? This is another certification of the custodian of records for From U.S. institution for U.S. Bank. Okay. And if we scroll down, uh, do you recognize what's on page two? I do. And what is it? That is start of a, a banking, or it's a statement for the U.S. Bank uh, account for Jesse Krzyzewski. Uh This would have been the. Uh, 99, so it's 9994 account for Jesse Krzyzewski. I believe it was a uh, credit card. Okay. And again, is this a fair and accurate representation of documents you received from U.S. Bank related to that account? Yes. All right, thank you. If we could go to 121, please. And uh, Detective, again, what are we seeing on page 1 of 121? Uh, this is, again, the uh, certification of the business records declaration from Wells Fargo. Okay, and Mr. Vulcan, if we could go to page four. Thank you. Uh, Detective Plenis, <coughs> excuse me, do you see what's on page four? Yes. And what is it? Uh, this will be, was a statement uh, for a savings account uh, associated with uh, Jesse Krzyzewski. Uh, it was the ending in 7587. And... Again, this is through Wells Fargo? Correct. This is through Wells Fargo. And is this a fair and accurate representation of the financial information you received related to Ms. Krzyzewski's savings account? Yes, it was. All right. If we could go to 106, please. Again, uh, on page 1 of 106, do you recognize what that document is? Yes. What is it? This is another certification in regards to um, some J.P. Morgan Chase uh, bank records. Okay. And if we go, uh, if we scroll down, Mr. Volkanier. Thank you. And we're on page three now. Do you recognize uh, the information on page three? Yes, this is a Chase uh, credit card uh, associated with Lynn Hernan. Uh, the account, I believe it ends in five, it's five, six, three, nine. Okay. And is this a fair and accurate copy of the documents you received in relation to Lynn Hernan's Chase uh, card account? Yes. All right. And finally, if we go to Exhibit 99, uh, Detective Plenis, do you see Exhibit 99 on your screen? I do. And do you recognize what Exhibit 99 is? I do. And what is it? This would be um, an, expert, or an excerpt from a forensic download of a cell phone. Do you know whose cell phone? This was Jesse Krzyzewski's cell phone. Now, before we go further, you did not personally conduct the download of Ms. Krzyzewski's cell phone, correct? I did not. In your normal course as a sheriff's detective, do you ask fellow detectives to download phones? Yes. Are you aware generally of how that process works? Generally? Generally speaking, I, I, I know, I guess, what happens to download a cell phone? You don't do it yourself? I do not. You kind of know that they get it done for you, though? Correct. Okay. <laughs> Nevertheless, have you seen excerpts like Exhibit 99 before? Yes. Okay. And um, is that, to your knowledge, a fair and accurate representation of an excerpt from Ms. Krzyzewski's cell phone download? Yes. All right. Your Honor, I'd move Exhibits 98... 117, 118, 122, 121, 106, and 99 into evidence, please. No objection, Your Honor. All right, for the jury exhibits 98, 99, 106, 117, 118, 121, and 122 are received. Thank you. And I would ask to publish those documents. Go ahead. Thank you. I'll wait for my thumbs up from the jury box. All right, thank you. Detective Plenis, kind of jumping right in. I want to start with, actually, I'm sorry. Can we take it down for a second? I forgot one exhibit I wanted to talk about. Sorry. Uh, Detective Plenis, in addition to the financial records that you got from BMO Harris specifically, you've been in court when you heard about a lockbox at BMO Harris? Yes. 
Was some of the records you asked BMO Harris for related to that lockbox? Yes. Did you receive records back? I did. And what were those records pertaining to? They were pertaining to a uh, safety deposit box uh, associated with Lynn Hernan. I, I believe it was at BMO Harris. And did BMO Harris keep records of who accessed that box and when? Uh, they did. And they sent those to you? Yes. All right, I'm going to show you what's been marked Exhibit 133, please. And again, what's the, uh, in slide one there of Exhibit 133? Uh, that is, again, the Certificate of authentic Authenticity for Business Records from BMO Harris. Okay, and as we go to the next slide, what do you see there? That is the Safe Deposit Box uh, Authorization Form. And does it say who has access or who has authorization to access that Safe Deposit Box? Uh, it does. Who, who are those individuals? Uh, Lynn Hernan uh, and Jennifer Flower. And at the top right, does it talk about a date in which the lockbox was opened? Uh, yes. And what was that date? Uh, March 11th of 2015. If we could scroll to the next slide. Uh, what's on slide three here? Uh, it's another, it's an additional authorization form for the safe deposit box. And who has access here? Uh, Anthony Poza. Okay, and if we go on to the next slide. Uh, it's another safe deposit box authorization form. And who is this authorizing access to the safe deposit box? Uh, Jesse Krzyzewski. Okay, and if we go to the next slide. All right. So now we're on to something different. There's no more authorization forms? Correct. All right. And um, before we go any further, do these appear, do these uh, slides appear to be fair and accurate depictions of what you received back <coughs> from BMO Harris as it relates to the lockbox? Yes. All right. You know, at this time, I move Exhibit 133 into evidence. No objection. Exhibit 133 is received and, when necessary, permission to publish granted. Thank you, Judge. And, Detective, before I put up the screen again, I'll just have you look at Exhibit 134 as well. And while that's coming up on your screen, uh, you went through these financial records, is that correct? That's correct. And what kind of things were you looking for? Uh, we were looking for deposits, um, withdrawals, uh, locations that transactions occurred, checks, um, anything associated with any type of transactions, whether it be a withdrawal, a deposit, a payment uh, associated with these accounts. And uh, are these relatively short financial uh, accounts, or are they rather long in, in length, in page number, I should say? They are normally very long in length. To, well, they were long in length due to the duration of time that re records were requested. Okay. And you said earlier that you were essentially getting monthly statements for about two years' time. Correct. And you went through all these financial accounts sort of line by line, is that correct? Yes. At the conclusion and in advance of testifying today, did you put together um, a sort of summary exhibit? Yes. Why did you do that? Uh, due to the amount of, I guess, due to the amount of pay, pages associated with these accounts, trying to move back and forth between pages, we, I worked with April the Vulcanier, the paralegal, to put in a summary exhibit together to try and minimize the amount of paperwork we would have to page through and make it easier to see. And do you see 134 on your screen? Yes. And as we scroll through the slides for you. Uh, While well, you and I continue to talk, does this appear to be the summary exhibit that you helped put together? Yes. All right. And again, that's more to sort of give the highlights of the work we're about to go through that you did? Correct. All right. Your Honor, at this point, I move Exhibit 134 into evidence as well. No objection. Exhibit 1. 34 is received permission to publish granted. Thank you. Now I've asked to publish all of those exhibits. I got them all this time. <coughs> if, yes, thank you. So that's exhibit 98 on your screen, Detective, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And if we uh, can go to page 37 of that document. Actually, I'm sorry. Don't do that yet. Can you just scroll down to page uh, 3, Mr. Vulcanier? <coughs> Thank you. Detective, what information can you see on page three uh, that you took note of? 
page three uh, appears to be the the opening of this uh, account, the 7601 account, because um, the balance uh, as of October 1 of 2014 was zero, and then the ending balance on October 10th of 2014 was $250,010.27. There were two deposits made, uh, teller deposits that were made into that account during that time frame. And through your, and I'm sorry, when was that account opened? This account was opened in October, uh, I think it was October 1st of 2014. And in your investigation, did you learn of anything significant in Lynn Hernan's life that coincided with that 2014 time frame? I was advised that uh, Lynn had received uh, an inheritance from, I believe it was her mother passing. Uh, in 2014, she received the, some money. <coughs> Okay, and so we have this balance of a little, I think you said like $10 over $250,000. Correct. Did you see a lot of use of that over the next few months from October of 2014? No. In fact, was... if we skip ahead to page 37, please. Can you see there uh, what the beginning balance is as of uh, February 10th, 2016? Uh, the, be the beginning balance as of February 10th, 2016 was $250,512.05. Okay. So it's it's gone up since October of 2014? Correct. Okay. Is there any uh, withdrawal activity as of that February-March 2016 time frame? Uh, yes. During this statement period, there was a $500 withdrawal. And can you tell, was that... Uh, a transfer to a different account? Was that a cash withdrawal? Can you tell anything about that specific transaction? All, all it states is it was a request of withdrawal. Okay. And here's a good point to ask you. If, if somebody goes to the bank and takes out cash, and you're trying as a detective to follow that, are you able to follow cash very well? Cash is very difficult to follow um, due to nobody maintains the serial numbers, um, nobody else. Once you have cash, it's not like you have to negotiate a check where you'd have to go to take it to a bank or somewhere that could cash that. So cash is a difficult thing to follow. The only times you're able to necessarily follow cash is if there's a large purchase made or if there may be an associated bank account mm -hmm. where a cash deposit was made immediately after or relatively soon after uh, a withdrawal was made. And so... If you can't really follow this withdrawal, why did you note this $500 coming out of the account? Well, this was the first activity. Any money coming out of this account occurred during this statement period. And that was, again, what, what month and year? That w this was the uh, account. It was February 10th of 2016 with an, and ended on March 10th of 2016. Okay. If we can skip ahead to page 48, please, of this exhibit. Detective, do you see the uh, beginning balance on page 48? Uh, yes. And what date is it related to? And what, I'm sorry, let me ask you one question at a time. What date is it related to? This statement? Yes. The statement is from July 10th of 2016 through August 10th of 2016. And what is the beginning balance? The beginning balance is 250000 $166.87. And so we've skipped ahead a few months from that $500 withdrawal, but based on those balances, did you see any activity between that March 2016 withdrawal and this July 10th to August 10th statement? No. Do you see any withdrawals on this statement that you took note of? Yes. On uh, July 29th, uh, during the statement period, there was a $10,000 telephone transfer. Now, is a transfer different than a withdrawal? Yes. And how so? A transfer would be you're transferring it to another financial account. Does this uh, exhibit in front of you tell you what account or anything about the account this $10,000 was transferred to? No. Were you able to track it down nonetheless? Yes. Tell this jury what you had to do to track down this $10,000 transfer. Uh, this this one we had to just we were comparing other accounts associated with Lynn. 
So you had to go through every one of Lynn's accounts for this sort of time frame and look to see if $10,000 was being sort of transferred into a different account? Correct. And did you, in fact, if we can go to uh, Exhibit 117, please, Mr. Volkner, page 72. Did you, in fact, find where this $10,000 was transferred to? Yes. Okay. And do you see page 72 of Exhibit 117? I do. And do you see that corresponding uh, transfer? Yes. And does it appear to match the date from the 7601 account? It does. It's the same date. Okay. And so then beneath that, where the $10,000 comes in, is a list of withdrawals from that 5336 account. Is that correct? Correct. And what kind of uh, expenditures do you see? Uh, there's uh, looks like a payment to Chase. It looks like a telephone payment to Chase. Um, there's a purchase with cash back at the Pick and Save in Pewaukee. Uh, there is a $6,500 uh, withdrawal. Uh, there's a um, there's a fifty dollar and sixty cent purchase of pick and save in Pewaukee. There's a hundred twenty one dollar purchase at uh, the Walgreens in Waukesha. It looks like there's a telephone payment uh, to a first bank card. There's another purchase uh, at the Walgreens in Waukesha, and it appears there's a payment for believed to be the safe deposit box. Okay, now. First off, I want to make clear, this $10,000 went from one of Lynn Hernan's accounts to another Lynn Hernan account, correct? Correct. Why take notice of it then? What's the, what's the interest to you as the detective on the case? Uh, just trying to figure out, okay, well, there's $10,000 moving from one account, going to another account of hers. Well, was there something going on in her life that she needed this money? Why was there a necessity to have a $10,000 transfer? And you looked at some of those expenditures to try and figure that out as best you could? Yes. And again, earlier you mentioned patterns of life. Did these spendings kind of give you a, a start to some sense of a pattern of life? Yeah, for, for Lynn, yes. Okay, and what, what is that generally at this point? Well, based on this statement period, there weren't many withdrawals. Uh, there was bills being paid. Uh, there was purchases at stores that would be associated with the area where she was residing, Pewaukee, in Waukesha, you know, in Waukesha, things, I guess, close to her. So one of the things in a pattern of life is where the money is being spent geographically? Correct. And so far, Ms. Hernan's in Waukesha County? Yes. Okay. If we can go back to uh, Ms. Hernan's money market account, Exhibit 98, and uh, specifically to page 50, please. Uh, before we scroll, I'm sorry, before we scroll down, Detective, can you see what uh, monthly statement this is for? Uh, this will be the next monthly statement. Uh, it was August 10th of 2016 to September 10th of 2016. Okay. And do you see the beginning balance that month? Yes. And what is it? The beginning balance that month was $240,198.12. And did you take note of any uh, withdrawals on this month's statement? Yes. And what were those? On August 12th, there was a $7,500, it says teller withdrawal. Okay. And then stop you there for a second. Anywhere further you can go with that withdrawal again? Uh, not at that point. Okay, just something you noted? Correct. Okay. What other withdrawals did you see? Uh, there was a check. Uh, it was check number 2001 uh, in the amount of $22,806.37. When you get these financial records, Detective, and you see checks referenced on them, did Emo Harris also send you images of those checks? Yes, they send the uh, images of the checks that were cashed from this uh, account. All right, could we please go to page 119 of Exhibit 98, Mr. Balkanier? And, Detective, do you see the same check you just referenced for that $22,000 figure on page 119? I do. And what can you tell us about that check as you see it? Uh, it's a check uh, written out to Wild Motors um, in that amount of $22,806.37. Uh, the memo line shows that the check was written 
for a 2016 Jeep Wrangler. Now, again, you were assigned the financial aspect of this case, correct? Correct. Do you work with other detectives assigned to different portions of this case to sort of compare notes and gain information? Yes. In doing so, did you learn anything about Lynn Hernan purchasing a Jeep? I did learn that, yes, she had purchased a Jeep in 2016. Important? I'm sorry to keep cutting off. Was that important for you to know, related to check number 2001 from her money market account? Yes. And why? It show, we can corroborate the fact that this check was used to purchase, to purchase a, a, uh, the vehicle. Okay. And if we could go back to uh, page, well, actually go to page 53 of Exhibit 98, please. And again, Detective, what time frame are we looking at here? Uh, this will be September 11th of 2016 to October 10th of 2016. And again, what's the, if we can scroll down the page, please. What's the starting balance for this month? Uh, the starting balance of this account uh, is $209,918.82. Okay. Do you see any, again, do you see any withdrawals that you took note of? Yes. And how many? Uh, we saw one. Okay, and what was that? That was a telephone transfer on September 22nd in the amount of $12,000. Again, as we talked about before, did you try to figure out where that $12,000 was transferred to? Tried to, yes. Okay. If we go to page 77 of Exhibit 117, please, Mr. Volkanier. And if you could scroll down, please. Actually, I'm sorry. Uh, Detective, can you see on Lynn's checking account here what month we are in? Uh, yes, the checking account for the, it's the 5336 account. Uh, it's the statement date of September 20th, 2016 till October 19th of 2016. Okay, so the same time frame we were just on in the money market account? R roughly, yes, same time frame. Okay, and if we scroll down... Did you, in fact, find that $12,000 coming in to yes. this account? Yes. All right, so Lynn has transferred money into her account again. Correct. Okay. And, again, if we scroll down to page 78, do you see the uh, expenditures after that influx of $12,000? Yes. What kind of things are you seeing here in this month? Similar uh, as last time, there's some payments to credit cards, there's uses at the Walgreens in Waukesha, um, low payments uh, at that point in the account. There are multiple checks written. Okay. We'll come back to those checks. Um, let's go back to page 53 of Exhibit 98, please. In addition to that $12,000 transfer, if we scroll down... Do you see any checks written from Lynn's money market account in this uh, time frame between September and October of 2016? Yes, there was one check written. And does it have a check number with it? Yes, it's check number 2002, and it should be the amount of $9,900. Again, from this page alone, page 54 of Exhibit 98, are you able to tell us anything more about the check? From this page, no. Okay. And 2002, check number 2002, that's sequential in order from the Jeep payment you testified to a few moments ago? Uh, yes. Okay. And Mr. Volkner, if you could go back to page 119 of Exhibit 98, please. Do you, in fact, see check 2002 on this page? I do. And can you tell us a little bit more information about it now? Uh, yes. And what can you tell us? Uh, check 2002 uh, was written to Jesse Krzyzewski. In the amount of nine thousand nine hundred dollars, uh, there's a memo of Cone or Con, I believe it's K O H N office. Did you sort of investigate Cone office any further? Yes. Did you learn what Cone office is? I did. What is it? The law office. Okay. If we could go to Exhibit One Eighteen, please, specifically page thirty nine, Mr. Volkner. And remind us, Detective, at this point, whose account are we looking at now? This is uh, Jesse Krzyzewski's Wells Fargo 8149 account. Okay. And if we scroll down the page, 
Do you see any influx of $9,900 related to that check number 2002? Yes. Okay. Do you see a date associated with that? Yes. And what is that date? Uh, September 20th. Okay. Now, if we continue scrolling down, we can see uh, Ms. Kershevsky's spendings after that check was deposited in her account, correct? Correct. You said there was a purpose written on the memo line of that check? Yes. And that was for the law office? Correct. Any of the subsequent spendings that you see on Ms. Kershevsky's account here, do they relate to any law offices? Nothing that I could attribute to any law offices. Do you see any professional services at all listed in those expenditures? No. Did you, in fact, investigate the following month of Ms. Kershevsky's checking account to see if any, maybe she waited till the next month to pay that money out? Yes. And did you find anything? No. Okay. If we could please go back to Exhibit 98. Now I'd like to go to page 56, please. And do you see what time frame we're talking about here? Yes. And what time frame is it? Uh, October 11th of 2016 through November 10th of 2016. And do you see the starting balance there? I do. And what is it? Uh, $188,042.89. And do you see any withdrawals that you took note of on uh, this month's statement? Yes, there was a check. Okay, does it have a check number? It's check number 2003 in the amount of $9,135.62. And again, if we go to page 119 of Exhibit 98, please. Do you see check 2003 written out there? Yes. Can you tell us more information about it based on its image? Uh, it was a check dated 1014 of 2016 written to Jesse Krzyzewski in that amount of $9,135.62. Uh, there's nothing in the memo line. Okay. Nevertheless, if we go to page 46 of Exhibit 118, please. Do you see that same amount that was written on check 2003 come into Ms. Krzyzewski's account? Yes. And uh, do you see a date associated with it? On, yes, October 14th. And that appears to match close in time with that check date? Correct. Do you see the uh, spendings by Mr. Chesky <laughs> after that check was deposited into her account? Yes. Can you sort of summarize in general what types of things are, are being purchased or money is being used on? Uh, there's stores, uh, bars, um, ATM withdrawals, there's Walmart, there's uh, Stalis Palace, I guess there's restaurants, noodles and company, and I believe Scotty's Pub, everything in the Milwaukee, Hales Corners, Greenfield, Franklin area. Okay. Did that... Uh sort of start you on a pattern of life, as you testified before, for Ms. Kershevsky? Yes. You said one of the things you're looking for with pattern of life is geographic purchases? Correct. Where is Ms. Kershevsky primarily spending her money geographically? In the Milwaukee County area. Okay. And, Detective, I could keep bouncing back between Exhibit 98 and 117 and 118, but... Essentially, what we've been doing with three checks now is all the work you did to follow the money from Lynn's money market account. Is that fair? Correct. And do you recall how many checks you followed out of Lynn's money market account? I believe there were a total of 21 checks, but the one check was the check Lynn wrote to um, Wild Motors. The other 20 checks were checks written to Jesse Krzyzewski. Okay. And, in fact, did you put Exhibit 134, that summary exhibit, together so that the jury wouldn't have to sort of go through the same exact process of account to account jumping around? Yes. All right. So now that we've sort of shown a taste of the work you did, let's go to Exhibit 134, and I'll have you walk the jury through that. If we could start it. Thank you, Mr. Falconer. So we're going up to slide one. Okay. 
Detective, tell us what we're looking at, and some of this will be repetitive from what we've just done, but we'll move through it a little quicker. What is on slide one? Slide one is the opening uh, deposits made into the 7601 money market account that we had talked about previously with the two deposits and the total ending of the, or the total um, ending balance of the account being $250,000. Okay. And if we go on to the next slide, what are we looking at here? This was the initial, uh, the first withdrawal we saw from this account in March of uh, 2016. And again, why was that noteworthy? It was the first withdrawal. It was the first activity other than like interest uh, observed in this account. Okay. And moving to slide three, what are we looking at here? These are um, withdrawals that, she made, that, that were made from the account. These were the withdrawal slips. Um, associated with the initial $500 withdrawal from that account. So when we're talking about pattern of life, as we stop on this slide, does this tell you anything about Lynn Hernan and how she sort of lived her life? Yeah, I mean, it, it, this shows that she, and we had information, but this is cash. Like she took out cash, um, and up to this point, like I said, there weren't any withdrawals, there wasn't any activity necessarily in that account. These particular slips on slide three, those are like forms you would fill out in person at the bank, correct? Correct. Did you ever see, as you went through all of her financial accounts, did you ever see Ms. Hernan uh, use ATMs? No. Did you see like cash advance fees at the end of her monthly statements? No. She appeared to be a person who went in and filled out those slips? Correct. All right. If we can go on to slide four, please. Detective, tell the jury what we're looking at here, please. This is the, uh, the statement from the J July 10th of 2016 through the August 10th of 2016. This is that initial, that $10,000 telephone transfer that is made from that account. Okay, and again, if we go to the next slide, you ended up tracking that down to Ms. Hernan's 5336 account. Correct. All right, and going on to the next slide then. Again, what are we looking at here? This is the, uh, accounts, the account um, from August 10th, 2016 to September 10th of 2016. This is the $7,500 uh, teller withdrawal and the check number 2001 uh, in the amount of $22,806.37, which was the check paid to Wild Motors. And again, if we go to the next slide, uh, we see that cash withdrawal slip again. Correct. And next slide, please, is that picture of the check we already previously looked at. Correct. Okay, and as we keep going through these slides, please, we're going to get into more of those uh, 20 other checks you said to were, were to Ms. Kershevsky. Yes. All right. And so what month are we in here? And I'm sorry, Mr. Lopin, what slide are we on? Can you tell? Nine. Slide nine. Thank you. What time frame is this covering? This is September 10th of 2016 till October 10th of 2016. Okay, and again, just to kind of fast forward what we've already done, this relates to that check number 2002 for $9,900 to Cone Office. Correct. Okay, next slide, please. Slide 10. You also took note of the $12,000 transfer we've already discussed. Yeah, this, this portrays the transfer from the 7601 and it being deposited into the uh, 5336 checking account. Okay, let's go to slide 11 then. There's a picture of the check we've already talked about. We'll keep going. Again, this is documented what you just testified to when we were thoroughly going through the steps you took, right? This is the incoming money into Ms. Krzyzewski's checking account? Correct. Okay. Next slide, please. And again, we talked about check 20032 as well, right? Correct. Okay. If we could skip ahead a few slides. Next one, please. Okay. Now, Detective Plenis, we are uh, now into new territory with a new check number circled, correct? Yes. And what time frame are we in? This is the November 10th, 2016 to December 10th of 2016. And is this still looking at Ms. Hernan's money market account ending 7601? Correct. Okay. You circled check 2005? Yes. And uh, if we go to the next slide, You've uh, captured the image of that check off of Exhibit 98, fair? That's fair. 
What can you tell us about this particular check now? Uh, that check has a uh, memo line that it's hard to read, but I believe it says court order pay, could be payment, not exactly sure what that last word may be. Okay. Yeah, next slide. Again, what are we looking at here? This is the uh, bank statement from the Ms. Krzyzewski's 8149 account showing the deposit that was made of that check. Now, on this slide, the again, the expenditures Ms. Krzyzewski makes after putting that check in, do you see anything related to a court or a clerk of court's office or anything to that nature? No. Did you check the following month statement like we discussed before? Yes. Did you ever find any payment from Ms. Krzyzewski to any sort of court-related matter? No payments that I can relate to any court-related matter. Okay. Next slide, please. What are we looking at here? This is the uh, 7601 uh, account uh, attributed to the December 10th of 2016 to January 10th of 2017 uh, statement. Okay. Any, I know you have blue circles on the screen, but anything significant on this page? Yeah, there are. Uh, there is on December 19th, there's a $4,000 telephone transfer. And on January 6th, there's a $29,000 teller withdrawal. There also is a check identified by check number 2004 in the amount of $3,000 associated with the account activity of this month. Okay, and as we go to the next slide, were you able to track down that $4,000 transfer? Yes. And whose account did it go into? That went into Lynn Hernan's uh, 5336 BMO Harris account. Did you try tracking down that $29,000 cash withdrawal? Yes. Were you able to? No. Okay, again, cash is hard to follow. Correct. I was unable, unable to figure out where that money went. Okay. If we go to the next slide, though, you mentioned a check as well, correct? Yes. Does this appear to be that same 2004 check? It, it does. And what can you tell us about this particular check? Uh, this is a check uh, issued to Jesse Krzyzewski in the amount of $3,000. The memo is listed as CV18249. Were you able to determine what, if anything, that CV18249 meant? I believe that, well, we couldn't figure out what it was. We okay. thought maybe it was a court payment of some sort, or maybe that was a court number. I, I couldn't figure out what that was. So sometimes that CV initials, that's sometimes how courts refer to civil cases? Correct. Again, if we go to the next slide... I might be skipping ahead. Did you see any payments from Ms. Krzyzewski's account to any court matters or any civil attorneys or anything like that? I wasn't able to find any payments associated to anything I could attribute to a court payment. Could you find any payments in her uh, expenditures related to anybody with the initial CV? No. Anything with those numbers that were referenced in that check? No. Moving ahead to the slide that's up on the screen, what are we looking at here, please? This is the 7601 account uh, from February 10th of 2017 to March 10th of 2017. And what did you take note of on this screen? So during this period, uh, there were two checks, um, one totaling $4,500, and it was associated with check number 2008. And then there was also a check identified by check number 2009 in the amount of $5,735.66. Didn't see any other deposits or withdrawals associated with that account. And just to sort of loosely keep track, what's the beginning balance of Ms. Hernan's money market account now in February of 2017? On February 10th of 2017, there was $133,808.84. Okay. And again, those two checks you've referenced, uh, does this statement indicate what date they were written out on? They're both written out on February 16th. Okay, and if we go to the next slide, please. Do those appear to be the same check numbers you just referenced? Uh, they do. And starting with check 2008, who is that made out to? Uh, Jesse Krzyzewski. Is there anything in the memo line on that check? The memo line says cash call. And then moving down to 2009. Uh, 2009 is also written out to Jesse Krzyzewski. And the memo line indicates prosper funding. And if we go to the next slide. Now, Detective Plenis, you have here a deposit circled 
that is a different figure than either of those two checks? Why did you circle that amount? Because those, that was the amount of those two checks that we previously had. That was the amount of both checks uh, added together. Okay. Again, as soon as this money goes into Ms. Kershevsky's account, do you see anything paid out to anything related to a prosper funding? I did not. Again, uh, I know we only have a few expenditures on this slide, but did you go through the subsequent statements of Ms. Kershevsky's checking account to see if there was any future payments to prosper funding close in time to that check? I did not find any. And again, Ms. Hernan, uh, by the appearances, wrote out two checks on the same day to Ms. Kershevsky. Correct. Did you take note of that? Yes. Why? Well, because they're both written on the same day. Okay. Next slide, please. Uh, again, what time, and I'm sorry, what are we looking at here? This is the account uh, summary of the 7601 account between the dates of March 10th of 2017 and April 10th of 2017. So that's just one month after we were just talking about. Correct. And what do you see here that you've circled in blue? Uh, there were two checks, uh, both dated March 13th, or at least indicated as March 13th. Uh, the first check was... Uh, number 2010 in the amount of $7,330.87. The second check was identified as check number 2011 in the amount of $9,416.36. And if we go to the next slide, please. Do you see those two checks? I do. Do they appear to be the same ones you were just talking about on the previous slide? Correct. They correlate with the checks that were just discussed. And starting with check 2010, what information can you tell the jury about that uh, check based on its picture? Uh, that check was issued or written to Jesse Krzyzewski. Uh The memo is identified as Advance America, and that was in the amount of the $7,330.87. What about check 2011? 2011 is a check issued or written to Jesse Krzyzewski in the amount of $9,416.36. The memo, again, states Advance America. And what are the dates the two checks were written out on? Uh, both checks were written out on March 10th of 2017. Again, did you take note that uh, Ms. Hernan was apparently writing Ms. Krzyzewski two checks on the same day? Yes. In fact, these two have the same uh, information, at least, in the memo line? Correct. All right, go to the next slide, please. And what have you circled here? What are we looking at? That was the... Um, the total of both checks. Whose account are we looking at? This is the uh, Ms. Krzyzewski's 8149 Wells Fargo account. Okay, and you said the, the figure you have circled in the middle of the page, that's, what is that figure? That figure is $16,747.23. And it's your testimony that's the total of the two checks from the previous slide added together? I believe that was the total of both, yes. Are you able to see what the last reported end balance on Ms. Krzyzewski's checking account was prior to that $16,000 going in? Uh, the ending balance previous to those checks was $93.44. And subsequent to that, uh, those two checks being deposited into that account, did you see any subsequent payments to anything related to Advance America? I did not. Did you see any checks written back to Lynn Hernan? No. When you looked at Ms. Hernan's financial accounts, did you see any deposits that were close to $16,000? I don't believe so. We can go to the next slide, please. Again, just orient the jury to whose account and what account it is we're looking at here. This is Lynn Hernan's uh, BMO Harris. It's the 7601 account. Uh, it's the account statement from April 10th of 2017 to May 10th of 2017. And what is the beginning balance for that month? The beginning balance for this month was $106,854.13. Okay, and again, you have uh, a blue circle in the middle of the page. What is that? The activity associated with that account, other than interest, was one check, uh, identified as check number 2012. Uh, the date on the st statement shows April 25th, and the amount was $12,000. If we go to the next slide, please. Does this appear to be an image of that same check? It does. What can you tell us about it? Uh, it was issued to Jesse Krzyzewski in the amount of $12,000. Uh, 
Uh, the memo indicates an IRS payment. If you go to the next slide, please. And who, wh whose account are we looking at here? This is Jesse Krzyzewski's 8149 Wells Fargo account. Does it appear to have the same $12,000 deposited? Yes. What was the balance just prior to that $12,000 going in? Uh, it was $252.13. And Detective, correct me if I'm wrong, but this uh, account is just one month after the $16,000 went into Ms. Krzyzewski's account, correct? Correct. And so we're down to $252 prior to this $12,000 coming in? Correct. Okay. Uh, Again, did you see any outgoing payments from Ms. Krzyzewski uh, related to IRS payments? I did not. In fact, uh, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but when you looked at all of Ms. Krzyzewski's financial accounts, did you in fact see that she received refunds for tax returns? Yes. So she should not have owed the IRS any money per your review of the financial documents? Per the refunds, I would believe she didn't owe them any money. Okay. Next slide, please. And I did get ahead of myself. What are we looking at here? This, was, this is the account statement from Jesse Krzyzewski's 8149 account. And this is between uh, January 31st of 2017 and February 28th of 2017. And why did you take note of that uh, monthly statement? Due to the fact of the, uh, the deposit of the Wisconsin Department of Revenue, uh, like a, a tax refund. Okay. And then on the right, what are we looking at? Uh, that is the same statement, uh, period, for the 8149 account for Ms. Krzyzewski, and it shows the IRS Treasury tax refund, uh, I believe that's February 23rd. And how much was that from the uh, sort of U.S. tax return or the federal tax return? The, the federal tax return was $812. Okay. Next slide, please. Again, uh, Detective, can you tell us what statement and what month we're in here? Uh, this is going to be the Lynn Hernan's BMO uh, Harris 7601 account. This is between May 10th of 2017 and June 10th of 2017. Um, the starting balance of this account was $94,866.52. There, there is one withdrawal. It's a telephone transfer on the amount of $4,000 on May 11th. And then there is one check uh, written during this period uh, dated May 24th, the check number is identified as 2013, and it's in the amount of $6,000. Okay, next slide, please. Again, you tried to track down where that $4,000 was transferred to? Correct. Again, did you find it? Yes. Where did you find it? It transferred into her, 50, her BMO Harris 5336 account. Was this uh, transferring of money from the money market into Ms. Hernan's checking account becoming a pattern as you saw it developing here? Yes. Okay. Did you see what she was sort of subsequently spending her money on after these transfers into the checking account? For Lynn? Yes. Normal, her, her normal quarter or patterns of life that we had previously identified. So businesses where geographically? In the Waukesha area. Okay. And if we go to the next slide? Uh, now we see that check image of 2013? Yes. What information can you tell now looking at the actual check? Uh, it's written to Jesse Krzyzewski, the amount of $6,000. Uh, the memo says, I believe it's doctor endoscopy. I don't know exactly what that was or what that necessarily means, but that's what the memo was. Understood. Next slide. And what are we looking at here again? Whose account? This is Ms. Krzyzewski's 8149 Wells Fargo account. And what do you have circled at the bottom there? That would be the deposit of the $6,000 check. Okay, and again, what was the, I'm sorry, can you go back one slide? What was the balance in Ms. Krzyzewski's checking account just prior to that uh, check being deposited? Uh, it was $22.84. Okay, now if we can go to the next slide, please. And uh, what are we looking at here? This is the account statement for Jesse Krzyzewski, um, the 8149 Wells Fargo account. Is and this sort of a continuation after that check was deposited of expenditures? Yeah, you can see the check, the $6,000 check previously on this slide. Okay. And did you see any outgoing payments to any doctor's office of any kind? 
No. Next slide, please. Again, can you orient us to whose account we're looking at here? This is the 7601, uh, Lynn Hernan 7601 uh, account, July 10th of 2017 to August 10th of 2017. Starting balance was $84,888.11. And what do we have circled there in the middle of the page? Uh, for the withdrawals in that account, there was a $5,000 telephone transfer on July 19th. There yeah. were also two checks written during that statement period. Uh, the first check was July 13th. Uh, the serial number was 2014 in the amount of $9,400. And then there was a check, the date on the statement here is July 10th, or I'm sorry, July 28th. Uh, the serial number is 2015, and the amount of the check was $17,221.93. Okay, if we could go to the next slide then. <coughs> What are we looking at here? This is check 2014. This. And who is it written to? It's written to Jesse Krzyzewski. And what is the memo line, if anything? The memo line says car payment. Okay, next slide. Again, what are we looking at here? Uh, this is Jesse Krzyzewski's 8149 Wells Fargo account. And what do we see circled at the very bottom there? At the very bottom there, there's the $9,400 uh, deposit made into her account. Can we go back to the, I'm sorry, go to the next slide, please. I'm sorry, Mr. Morgan. Um, again, now, what are we looking at here? This is uh, the account summary from Lynn Hernan's 5336 account during, uh, between June 19th of 2017 and July 19th of 2017. And what do you have circled there? That's the uh, $5,000 transfer, telephone transfer that was conducted from the 7601 account. So that was two slides ago? Correct. We sort of mixed up the order now of when we show the check as far as the transfer. Sure did. Okay, keep everybody awake. All right. right. So you tracked down that $5,000 transfer. Now if we go to the next slide, we see that next check that was two or three slides ago in July of 2017? Yes, that was check 2015. Okay. and. Who is this made out to? Uh, Jesse Krzyzewski. And anything written in the memo? Uh, it says Citibank, possibly May. Okay. Next slide. What are we looking at there, Detective? Uh, that would be a deposit of the check, the $17,221.93. And, and that would be, a, this is the account statement for uh, Jesse Krzyzewski's 8149 uh, Wells Fargo account. Perfect. And... Did you see any subsequent payments from Ms. Kershevsky's account to Citibank? I do not believe so. Not in this statement, no. Nothing that I could find that I could attribute to that. Did you see any payments from Ms. Kershevsky's around this time related to that other check uh, dealing with a car payment? No. All right, next slide, please. Again, what are we looking at here, Detective? This is going to be Lynn Hernan's 7601 account, um, the BMO Harris account. This is from August 10th of 2017 through September 10th of 2017. Uh, the balance of the account at the beginning of this statement period was $53,274.41. I noticed uh, you've switched up uh, one of your circle colors. Yep. Why, why is that? Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. You made this a little while ago? Yes. Okay. Um, what is that, sort of that uppermost, that green circle, what is that referencing now, the information you can see? That's going to be a teller deposit. Okay, so this time not a transfer out or anything like that, but money going in? Correct. Okay. Is that why it maybe is a different color? That's probably why, yeah. There we go. Um, and then under that, we have, what do we have circled in blue again? In the blue, we have the checks. There's, there's two checks attributed to this account. Uh, the first check... It was August 21st of 2016 in the amount of $9,117.04. The second check is August 24th, check number 2017, and it's in the amount of $5,972.53. Okay, and if we go to the next screen, what do we see here? That's check 2016. Okay, who is it made out to? Jesse Krzyzewski. Anything written in the memo line? It looks like the, uh, well, we've Bar Barclays Bank paid off. Okay, if we go to the next slide. 
What are we looking at here again? That would be the deposit of that check. Okay. Um, what is the balance just prior to that check going in? The balance of this account, and this is the 8149 account associated with Jesse Krzyzewski. Uh, the balance of this account at just previous to um, the check being deposited was $958.51. Okay. And that memo line was for a Barclays bank account, did you say? Correct. After this check went into Ms. Krzyzewski's account, do you see any subsequent payments uh, either on this page or from your review of her account information to Barclays Bank? Not th no. Okay. Next slide, please. What are we looking at here? This is check 2017. Okay. And who is it made out to? It's made out to Jesse Krzyzewski. Can you see what's written in that uh, memo line? Uh, no. It says first something paid off. Okay. Tried your best to make it out? Yeah. Don't know what it is? Not sure. Okay. Next slide. Again, whose account are we looking at? This is Jesse Krzyzewski's 8149 Wells Fargo account. Okay. And you see in the middle of the page you have a circle or a long box? Yep. What is that? Showing? That's the deposit of that check, the okay. $5,972.53 check. Okay, and then you have another box below that, correct? Yep, below that there is a payment. Uh, it's a card member services web payment uh, to a 9994 account, um, which is an account associated with uh, Jesse Krzyzewski. Do you recall what that 9994 account is, who the, the cardholder? I believe that was the US, U.S. Bank account. Okay, so nothing to do with first in its title? No. Any uh, of these subsequent transactions beyond that uh, $5,972 check going in have anything to do with first something? No. Okay, next slide, please. And again, what are we seeing here? Uh, these are uh, cash deposits. Okay, this is that, again, that's. This is the $5,000 teller deposit, yep. So this is Ms. Herning going in in person? Correct. Okay. Next slide. Again, Detective, what are we looking at here? Uh, this is the Lynn Hernan 7601 account uh, with BMO Harris between October 10th of 2017 and November 10th of 2017. The beginning balance of the account at October 10th was $43,196.14. And you have uh, another check number circled there? Correct. It was a uh, check. The date on the statement is November 8th. Serial number of the check was 2018, and then the amount is $1,400. Okay, next slide, please. What do we see here? Uh, that's check 2018. It's written to Jesse Krzyzewski in the $1,400, and the memo line said, Dr. Tumor Removal. Okay, next slide. Again, what are we looking at here? Uh, we're looking at the 8149 account, uh, which is... Jesse Krzyzewski's Wells Fargo account. Okay. Now here you have a $3,000 figure circled, correct? Correct. That last check we looked at was not for $3,000, was it? No, it was not. So why did you circle this information? Because that deposit was made around the time of that deposit. Uh, the check was issued or cashed around the time of that deposit. Okay. So I believe... Have... Yeah. Go ahead. I believe that check was uh, deposited... Possibly with cash. Okay. So you can't say for certain, but this stood out to you as a deposit going into Ms. Krzyzewski's checking account. Correct. Okay. And again, if we look at the balance right before that uh, $3,000 comes in, what is Ms. Krzyzewski's checking account balance? Uh, it's in the negative. It's negative $27. Okay. And after that uh, check and whatever cash, that $3,000, did you see any payments to any doctor's office? No. Next slide. Again, Detective, whose account are we looking at here? This is Lynn Hernan's 7601 uh, BMO Harris account between November 10th of 2017 and December 10th of 2017. The starting balance on November 10th of 2017 was $41,801.63. What do you have circled there? There was uh, one telephone transfer dated November 17th in the amount of $5,000. And 
and there was one check written from this account uh, dated December 7th, and the check number was 2019. If we go to the next slide, please. This is the account summary or statement from Lynn Hernan's 5336 account uh, between October 19th of 2017 and November 19th of 2017. This uh, identified the $5,000 telephone transfer made from the 7601 account to the 5336 account. And again, would you describe these phone transfers from one of her accounts to another as a, a, a pattern you've seen? Yes. Okay, next slide. And what are we looking at here? This is the 2019 check from the 7601 account. Uh, it's written to Jesse Krzyzewski, the amount of $5,300. And believe it says car. Can't remember if it said car repaired or car, the memo's tough to read. Something to do with a car. Yeah. Okay. Next slide. Again, detective. I know this is becoming a pattern for us, but what are we looking at here? This is the account statement for the Jesse Krzyzewski's eighty-one forty-nine account, the Wells Fargo account. Uh, this statement identifies a deposit of $5,300, which was the check attributed to that check. Do you see any outgoing payments having to deal anything with a car? No. A car dealership, a mechanic, anything like that? No. Okay. Next slide. Again, can you orient us to whose account and what time frame we're looking at? This is Lynn Hernan's 7601 BMO Harris account it's from January 10th of 2018 to February 10th of 2018. Uh, the beginning balance at this time was $31,510.21. Um, during this statement period, um, there were two withdrawals. Uh, January 19th, there was a $15,000 telephone transfer. And on January 26th, there was a $1,500 teller withdrawal. Okay, next slide. Again, what are we looking at here? This is Lynn Hernan's 5336 account, uh, the BMO Harris account. This is between December 19th of 2017 and January 19th of 2018. This identifies the $15,000 telephone transfer from the 7601 account. And again, at this point, I'll just kind of interject. Did you see any changes in Ms. Hernan's spending habits on account 5336 around this time? Um, I believe... This was the time frame that she had made a purchase of some jewelry. Okay. Did you ever come to understand why Ms. Hernan was taking money from her money market and putting it into her checking account as opposed to just paying bills from the money market account? I believe the money market account, she can only, you necessarily can't pay bills because you, get, you have to pay fees when you pay from a money market account. You only are allowed to make so many transactions for bill, for bill pay. Okay. Moving on to the next slide. What are we looking at here? This is uh, Lynn Hernan's um, Chase credit card. It was identified as the last four of the account as the 5639 account. And you looked at the raw data for this account in Exhibit 106. Correct. Okay. So why did you take this excerpt from Exhibit 106? Because this would, I guess, go hand in hand with the $15,000 transfer from the 7601 account to the 5336 account because she makes a $15,000 payment on January 19th. Okay, so this $15,000 transfer you had to track to multiple accounts of Ms. Hernan. Correct. And you started saying uh, something earlier about this was the time frame where you thought Ms. Hernan purchased something? Yeah, I believe she made a large purchase. And um, you Jewelry. Okay. And do you believe that's the basis for that uh, previous balance we see on Exhibit 106 excerpt that's up on the screen? Yes. Okay. Next slide. Again, what are we looking at here, Detective? This is um, a money mark, the, uh, the $1,500 withdrawal from the 7601 account associated with Lynn Hernan. And again, this is her taking cash out? Correct. Are you able to follow it any further? No. Okay. Next slide. 
What are we looking at here? This is the Lynn Hernan 7601 account uh, with BMO Harris, it's March 10th of 2018 to April 10th of 2018. Okay, and here we actually have a deposit circled instead of a withdrawal? Correct. Are, were you able to tell where that $9,900 came from? I don't believe so. Okay, don't know if it was cash or a check coming in? No. Okay, and uh, next line. Is this helpful at all in, in figuring yep. out? Well, let me ask you this. Is it helpful figuring out where the $9,900 came from? It's not helpful figuring out where the actual cash itself came from, other than the fact that she deposited the cash. This shows that she deposited the cash into the account. Okay. Next slide, please. Again, what time frame are we looking at here, Detective? This is the 7601 account uh, for Lynn Hernan, that BMO Harris account, from April 10th of 2018 to May 10th of 2018. And what do you have circled in that uh, green box again this time? We, there's a $700 teller deposit on April 20th. And then what do you have circled in the blue box there? There were two withdrawals. Uh, April 13th, there was a telephone transfer and then on April uh, of $2,000. And then on April 23rd, there was a $3,000 teller withdrawal. So again, the, the withdrawal of $3,000, are you able to track that any further? No. The $2,000 transfer, could you track that? Yes. Okay, next slide, please. And again, what is this? This is Lynn Hernan's BMO Harris uh, 5336 account. This is between March 19th of 18, I'm, I'm sorry, March 19th of 2018 and April 19th of 2018. This statement identifies the telephone transfer of the $2,000 on April 13th. Okay, next slide. What are we looking at here? This is the um, deposit, looks like of $700 into that account. That would have been the, the teller deposit uh, indicated on the statement. And while we have one of these bank forms up, Detective, uh, do you see anywhere on these forms that uh, Ms. Hernan was filling out in person, do you ever see that the bank provided her a balance of her account? <clears throat> No, I'm not seeing any balances on these deposit tickets. Okay. To be fair, you were not with Ms. Hernan? I was not. A teller might have verbally told her her balance, for example? V very possible. But there's nothing printed on these, these bank forms we see? No. Okay. Next slide. Again, what are we looking at here? This is going to be... A withdrawal of three thousand dollars. That's the one we referenced from the financial document a couple slides ago. Correct. Again, even on a cash out slip now, do you see any reported balance printed printed on that form or those forms? No. Okay. Next slide, please. And what are we looking at here, Detective? This is the seventy six oh one. Account associated with Lynn Hernan. This is between May 10th of 2018 and June 10th of 2018. Um, the balance at the start of this account was $20,614.19. Um, there were no deposits made. There were two checks uh, issued during this time period. Um, May 11th, check 2020 in the amount of $1,450. And then June 5th, uh, check number 2021 in the amount of $500. Next slide, please. All right, you probably expected this, but what are we looking at here? This is, these are both checks. The first check on top is 2020. It's a check issued to Jesse Krzyzewski in the amount of uh, $1,450. Uh, the memo line indicates car. Um, the second check is check 2021. Again, issued to Jesse Krzyzewski. Um, in the amount of $500, it says Scott's possibly car or card. Um, not exactly sure what the second word is, but it definitely says Scott on the, is the first in the memo line. And those are the two checks attributed with that account during that time frame. Okay. And between sort of the options you thought of between the second word car and card, does one of them make more sense when we're talking about $500? 
Uh, yeah, I think probably card would be more uh, appropriate. I'm sorry, car with a D or not? I just with a D. With a D. Okay, like a credit card. Correct. All right. Next slide, please. And what are we looking at here? This is Lynn Hernan's 7601 account uh, between August 10th of 2018 and September 10th of 2018. Uh, the balance at the start of this pay this period was eighteen thousand six hundred sixty-six dollars and fifty-six cents. Um, there was a telephone uh, banking withdrawal or transfer on the amount of uh, three thousand dollars. Okay, next slide. And did you track that uh, transfer down again? I did. That three thousand dollars was transferred into Lynn Hernan's fifty-three thirty-six account. Okay, next slide. Let's go back to slide. This is getting ahead of me. Going back to those last two checks related to, uh, one of them said car, and one of them we think maybe said Scott's car or card, one of the two. Did you see those go into Ms. Krzyzewski's checking account? I believe so. Okay. And would you have looked at then the subsequent payments? Yes. Did you see any payments for uh, a car at all between either Jesse or Scott? I didn't have any of Scott's. I guess history, I don't have his accounts, but I looked at Ms. Krzyzewski's and the accounts that we had. I okay. didn't see any payments attributed that I could attribute to those memo lines. As far as outgoing payments, though, did you see any outgoing payments to any credit cards that you didn't recognize to be Ms. <coughs> Krzyzewski's? No. Did you see any outgoing payments to, again, car dealerships or mechanics or something related to cars? No. Okay. Now... On the slide we're currently sitting at, we're in August of 2018, correct? Correct. And this is Ms. Hernan's checking account? Correct. And what is her balance? At the beginning of this account period, uh, the beginning balance is $347.76. Okay. And uh, we see that $3,000 transfer, is that right? Correct. And then what are the, what are the expenditures here? Did they... Did they seem consistent with Lynn's past spending, or were they different? Uh, these payments seemed, um, now granted they are two what appear to be credit cards. Uh, the difference is there are now payments that are denoted as web payments or mobile payments and online payments, which were new, not normal for Lynn. You've heard a number of people say that Lynn didn't own a computer? Correct. Didn't know how to use the internet, really? From what I'm told, no, she did not. Prior, at least on this account, ending 5336, prior to these mobile payments and online payments, had you ever seen in the preceding monthly statements anything like that as far as how Lynn paid her bills? I don't believe seeing any type of mobile or online payments. Okay. Again, was that significant to you in your investigation? Yes, because that was would be a new, would be different than her pa uh, pattern of life that we had previously identified. Okay, and if we continue on to the next slide, what are we looking at here, Detective? This is the seventy six zero one account uh, associated with Lynn Hernan. Uh, that's the BMO Harris account between September tenth of twenty eighteen and October tenth of twenty eighteen. And you have. Uh, circled a large chunk of the middle of that statement. Is that fair? Yes. Why did you do that? Uh, during that time frame, the time frame that we have these withdrawals, um, they, they don't necessarily fit any of the information that we had previously seen in any of these account statements. We knew at the time Lynn had been in the hospital, I believe from September 15th to September 28th, um, so the telephone banking transfers seemed, I guess, could be a bit suspicious due to the fact that she's in the hospital. There's also some ACH convenience fees um, for bill payments. We haven't really seen Lynn pay any bills directly from the 7601 account. She seemed to transfer her money from the 7601 account to the 5336 account and then subsequently pay her bills. But these are the first transaction limit fees that we're seeing. 
We also found that there was a Ford, a Ford payment. Uh, we weren't aware of any Ford payments or Ford loans that Lynn had at that time. Did you eventually learn of somebody having a Ford Motor Company uh, loan or, or payment due? Yes. Who was that? Uh, we learned that there was a loan in Jennifer Flowers' name for a vehicle that Jesse Krzyzewski was operating. Okay. But again, Lynn paid that $22,000 figure, I think, for a Jeep. Correct. She didn't have any loans through Ford that you were able to locate? No. Okay. And again, beneath that uh, large circle, you have two additional circles. What are we looking at there? Uh, there were two checks. Um, there's a check 9900. It says it, on the statement it has October 5th and the amount of $5,000. There's another check. Now, this date is October 3rd. The serial number of that check is 9901 in the amount of $2,805. Now, interestingly here, the serial numbers, we have been in the 2000s, sort of the low 200 numbers. Would you agree? Yes. And now all of a sudden these checks are in the 9900 series. Is that fair? That's correct. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. Well, let me ask you this before we get to that. Do you know why the series number on the checks changed? I don't know personally why. It would be, have to be a new checkbook. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. Can you again orient us to what account, whose account it is, and what time frame, please? This is Lynn Hernan's 5336 checking account. Um, this would have been from September 19th of 2018 to October 19th of 2018. Okay. And again, we've seen some transfers coming into that uh, 5336 checking account? Correct. Okay. Again, they appear to be telephone transfers? There's telephone transfers and there's that PC transfer credit. Do you know what a PC transfer credit is? I'm not 100% sure what that is. It could be, it's definitely, it, it's some type of transfer into the account. Okay. It seems different than a telephone transfer? It's denoted differently than a telephone transfer. And again, prior to that October 1st entry of 2018, had you ever seen a, uh, a transaction labeled PC transfer credit? I had not. And again, when we're talking about things you've seen, you look through, if you had to put a ballpark, is it hundreds, is it thousands of transactions between all these accounts? I would say to say probably thousands. And so when you say you've never seen something like that before, are we talking sort of trends? It's, it's definitely out of the ordinary. Okay. Next slide, please. Now, um, what are we looking at here, if you know? This is the uh, payment that was made from Lynn Hernan's uh, account. This is the Ford Motor payment to the loan in Jennifer Flower's name. Okay, next slide. And okay, here, what are we looking at here now? These are um, electronic checks. Uh, is there anything different about these two checks than we saw through the other ones we've been looking through from Ms. Hernan's account? Yeah, these are the... Sorry, let me just correct our From her Money Market account. Yes. And what is different? Uh, they're electronic. They're not written out as in like handwritten checks from a checkbook. Okay. Nevertheless, who are they made out to? Uh, the first check, which was the 9900 check, which is uh, written out to Jesse Krzyzewski, and that's a total of $5,000. And I'm sorry if I missed you say this. What is the date printed on that check? October 1st of 2018. And now if we go down below that to 9901. 9901, uh, that is a check written out to Whitnell Point Apartments. Um, that's dated, again, October 1st of 2018 in the amount of $2,805. Uh, the memo on that check says apartment, leave it 6226 Jennifer Flower. Okay, could I switch uh, to Exhibit 99, please, briefly? 
Detective, earlier you talked about Exhibit 99. And do you recall what that was? Yes. If I could direct your attention to line 16 along the left-hand column, uh, what is that entry on Exhibit 99? Uh, that entry is a BMO Harris mobile banking uh, app. Okay. In sort of in the fifth column over, kind of in the middle column, does it indicate anything about when that app was purchased or installed or something like that? Uh, it shows a purchase date of October 1st of 2018. And you said again, whose phone is that from? This would be from Jesse Krzyzewski's phone. In all of the financial records that you reviewed, did you find any BMO Harris banking accounts in Ms. Krzyzewski's name? No. And if we go back to Exhibit 134, please. Are these what are sometimes referred to as electronic checks? Yes. Okay. And again, that's the same date that a mobile banking app was downloaded on Ms. Krzyzewski's phone? Correct. All right, next slide, please. All right, and so what are we looking at here, Detective? This is the 7601 accounts belonging to Lynn Hernan uh, from October 10th of 2018 to November 10th of 2018. And this uh, covers the time a little bit after Ms. Hernan died. Correct. And that balance, again, is, is left at what? Uh, $87.72. And then that November 6th date that you have circled, would that correspond to the estate account being open for Lynn Hernan's estate? Uh, yes. Okay. Next slide. And, uh, Your Honor, at this point, I probably have about 10 minutes on this area, if we can... Hang on for the morning break. I just wanted to let you know. <coughs> All right, I think that will be a good uh, stopping point. It is 10 12, so we will take our morning break, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Um, so I'll rise for the jury. Oh, 15, 20 minutes. I don't know. What? Did you hear oh, it's okay. I said I have about 10 minutes left in this area, oh. but if people need a break, I get it. I think we could all. Use a break. So I thought you said we'll take a break or you, this would be a good stopping point, but. I can do it. All right, thank you. I was writing notes about my notes. Oh. Thank you, Michelle. All right, thank you everyone. We are in recess. Uh, we'll start up in about 15 to 20 minutes.
or stay seated because we'll bring the or standing because we'll bring the jury right in. They're all back. They don't go anywhere, so we'll bring them in. Oh yeah, well. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. All right, you'd like to pick up where I decided to take a break? <laughs> I, I guess so, yes. <laughs> It's all good. All right, uh, would you like the exhibit published then? Yes, please. All right, go ahead. Thank you. Just wait for the jury screens to come on. All right, thank you. Uh, Detective Plentis, when we took a break, we were on slide 75, I believe. And do you know what is in this uh, slide? I believe this is the um, it's the ending payout of Lynn Hernan's 7601, 7601 account and her 5336 account. And again, this is after Ms. Hernan's death that these slips are dated? Correct. And what is the 7601 account valued at at the time of Ms. Hernan's death? Uh, well, these... These are dated 11-6 uh, of 2018, so approximately a little over a month. But the last ending balance of that account was $87.72. And what is the ending balance as of that November date for account ending 5336 of Ms. Vernon? Uh, $1.04. And if we go to the next slide, um, what is depicted in that slide 76 of Exhibit 134? That is the closing of the BMO Harris uh, accounts, the check that was received. And who uh, is that check written out to? It's written out to the estate of uh, Lynn Hernan. And what's the total amount of that check? Uh, $88.76. And does that appear to be the total of those two accounts from the previous slide? Yes. Okay. And then next slide. Um, what I want to direct your attention to for this point, Detective Plenis, is that, uh, well, technically fifth line down where it says BMOX7601. Do you see that line? Yes. Um, you talked about 21 checks total for Ms. Hernan's money market account? Correct. Was that just you focusing on checks written to Jesse Kraszewski? No, that was just checks issued from that account. So... From the time of October 2014 until this November 6, 2018 date when the account is closed, there were only 21 checks written from Ms. Hernan's money market account. Correct. And you said 20 of them were written to Ms. Krzyzewski. Correct. Did you total up the value of those 20 checks written to Ms. Krzyzewski? Yes. 
And is that the figure that's on slide 77? Yes. And could you just read that value out loud, please? The total of the 7601 account was $134,337.01. Okay. And between October of 2014 and that November 2018 date, that account started at $250,000, you said? Correct. And ended at $87. Correct. And how many sort of big purchases did Ms. Hernan make that you can attribute to her? Uh, we're aware of the large purchase of the 2016 Jeep Wrangler, and she made a purchase of jewelry. Um, I believe that was in January of 18, uh, end of December of 17. She made a large purchase of jewelry. Those are the two large purchases I was able, we were able to identify. Okay. But these 20 checks was worth that $134,000 figure? Correct. Okay. And as we go through the next slides, uh, did you, with the assistance of Mr. Volkenier, kind of put up some quick summary illustrations of your observations of this money market account? Yes. All right. So if we go quickly through the next slides, can you kind of just describe what, what you put these slides together for? This was just, I guess... A brief, a quick, quicker synopsis of the account activity associated with this, with, with the accounts, the 7601 account. Uh, Lynn inherited the $250,000 uh, from her mother after she passed, and that would have been in 2014. We know that in October of 2014, that money market account, the 7601 account, was opened, and those monies were deposited into that account. And there was no other activity except for interest in that account. Um, from the opening in October of 14 through February of 2016. The only activity was interest pay, or interest earned. Okay, and if we go to the next slide, again, what are we looking at here? This is the uh, 7601 account continued. There's, there was $250,000 um, in that account, a little over, um, in July of 2016. We know in August of 2016, we know that that check can be attributed to, um, the check 2001 is attributed to Wild Motors. Um, then we know that in September 20, on September 20th, 2016, there's a check for, uh, it's 2002 in the amount of $9,900. We know that check was deposited into Jesse's, Jesse Krzyzewski's Wells Fargo 8149 account. Okay. And so these are just really illustration slides of everything you've been testifying to. Correct. Can we just cycle through the next few slides um, pretty quickly, Mr. Volkanier? Okay, and on this final slide, which I think is... 88. Um, this, what are we looking at here, Detective? Uh, this is, these are the checks that were written from Lynn Hernan's 7601 account to Jesse Krzyzewski. Okay, and again, you've included the, the individual check amounts? The individual, the, the dates of the, on the check, the check amounts, uh, the check number, and the notes, if there were anything noted in the memo line. And then we see that total figure again from those checks from that account, 7601. Correct. And again, if there was ever a memo written on the check, did you search if it ever appeared to go to that purpose? We searched the accounts that we had, yes, to see if there was anything attributed to that deposit or any memo associated with that check to see if that was paid. And when you searched for that, did any of those 20 checks appear to go to the purpose written in the memo line? None that we could find. All right, thank you. We can take down Exhibit 134. Thank you. And if we could take down the screen for a moment, and Mr. Volkner, I'd ask you to bring up for Detective Plans Exhibit 117, uh, 120, and 149, please. And Detective, well, Mr. Volkner is getting those ready. Oh, I'm sorry, did I tell you 118? Sure, absolutely. 117, 118. 
120, and 149. Thank you. And while those are coming up, Detective, we cycled through some illustration slides uh, that you made in Exhibit 134, correct? Yes. And largely because you've already testified in depth to what they illustrated, fair? Correct. Did you do that with a fair amount of the accounts you looked at? Yes. And again, what was your purpose in creating these summary exhibits? Um, the purpose was to, I guess, I don't want to say a Cliff Notes version, but to break down the amount of paperwork that would have to be reviewed to go through to see these uh, transactions. Okay, but all the information included in your summary accounts, is that taken from the actual financial records that you personally reviewed? Yes. Okay. Detective, if you could uh, look at Exhibit 117, is that up on your screen? Yes. Do you recognize what Exhibit 117 is? I'm sorry, this one's already in as is 118. Let's go to 120. Sorry. Do you recognize what Exhibit 120 is? 120 uh, is it's a record certification and landmark credit union. So, yes. Okay, and again, that certifies that these records from Landmark are, are accurate records? Correct. Okay, and if we scroll down from page one uh, to page three, perhaps. Okay, what do we see on page three? Uh, page three is the individual summary of a Landmark credit account uh, is with the name Jesse Krzyzewski associated with the account. Okay, so this is Ms. Krzyzewski's landmark account? Correct. All right, and if we scroll down a little bit further. On page six, or beginning on page six, do you recognize uh, what that is? Yes. What is it? These are the uh, beginning of the statements associated with Jesse Krzyzewski's landmark credit union accounts. Okay. And... Is it a fair and accurate copy of those financial statements related to Ms. Krzyzewski's landmark account? Yes. All right. Your Honor, I'd move Exhibit 120 into evidence. No objection. Exhibit 120 is received. And if we could switch for the witness to 149, please. 149? Yes. Not 140? No. Okay. Do you have 149 on your screen, Detective? I do. Do you recognize what it is? Yes. What is it? This is going to be the summary exhibits for uh, Lynn Hernan's uh, 5336 BMO Harris account. Okay. Now, I move Exhibit 149 into evidence, Your Honor. No objection. Exhibit 149 is received. Okay. And I'd ask to publish Exhibit 149, please, Your Honor. Granted. Thank you. Now, Detective, to try and make this go a little more efficiently, I'm going to try to focus on your summary document then, because you've said this is all taken from the actual records that we've moved into evidence. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So, when we're looking at Exhibit 149, tell us what this first slide depicts. Why did you put this information on the slide? This first slide is, I guess, a summary of the 5336 account from July of 14 through approximately September 9th of 2018. And what type of activity or patterns did you see over that time span on Ms. Hernan's uh, account ending 5336 as depicted in the upper left corner? Um, almost all of her transactions occurred uh, in the Waukesha County area. Uh, during that time, there were payments that were made to Jennifer Flowers' uh, apartment complex. Um, this account was used to pay bills, like monthly bills that we had discussed earlier, but there are monthly bills used, or monthly bills are paid from this account. During that time frame, from July of 14 to September 9th of 2018, there were no ATM withdrawals associated with that account that we could find in the records. And just to sort of refresh my recollection, this 5336 account, that's the account that Ms. Hernan appeared to transfer money into to pay bills, money from the money market into this checking account? Correct. That would have been money from the 7601 account. She would do the telephone transfers into the 5336 account to pay bills. Okay. Next slide, please. 
What time frame are we looking at here on slide two of Exhibit 149? This is between September 19th of 2018 and October 19th of 2018. So just a one month snapshot? Correct. And why did you uh, want to highlight this particular month? Uh, this was the month where we, where I began to see transactions and things associated that were not associated with the known pattern of life that we had identified of Lynn Hernan. You have something up there called irregular transactions? Correct. What did you mean by that? Irregular transactions were transactions that had not shown up on Lynn's accounts previously. They had been at locations that we had not seen Lynn uh, frequent or, I guess, ever be at. Um, we saw um, th those were the transactions were just not normal with the previous years of Lynn Hernan's transactions. And if I move to the bottom for a second, jumping around, you have a note there. What does that pertain to? That pertains to the number of withdrawals that occurred during this time frame. And why was that significant to you? Because it was very high compared to what we'd seen previously. And in the middle, are those just sort of uh, specific examples of those irregular transactions, or is that something different you included? Those no, things? those are some of the transactions that were irregular. We saw transactions at... Scotty's Pub, Stalas Palace, Potawatomi Bingo Casino. Those are places we'd never seen Lynn at previously in any of her account statements. And along the left, sort of in the lower left corner, what do your notes there indicate? Uh, that the balance was $2,118.82 on September 19th of 2018. And October 19th of 2018, the balance was down to $52.54. In your review of Ms. Hernan's checking account 5336 prior to that September into October of 2018, had you seen her balance drop that low before? Um, I believe I, I don't. I believe her balance at times had dropped low, but you know, normally she would do a transfer into her account if she ever had a low balance. Okay. If we go to slide three of Exhibit 149, please. What time frame are we looking at here, if you know? Uh, this is the time frame, well, there's, I guess this is July of 16 through um, October 23rd of 2018. Okay, and let's start at the top uh, with your illustration. What, are you, what have you indicated there? Uh, we identified checks written to Jesse Krzyzewski between July 16th, uh, July of, I'm sorry, July of 2016 through August of 2018. Okay, I want to jump ahead for a second to slide six, and we'll come back to slide three, but if we can go ahead to slide six, thank you. What are we looking at here in relation to what you just testified related to some checks? These are the, some of the checks, I guess these are the beginning of the checks that we had identified written to Jesse Krzyzewski during that time frame. <laughs> and you said there were eight total? Yes. If we could go ahead and switch to slide seven. And slide eight, please. And slide nine. Right. And now if we could go back to slide six. Detective, those four slides you just looked at, do those appear to be the eight checks you uh, have referenced? Correct. Who are those checks written out to? Uh, they were all written out to Jesse Krzyzewski. If we start on slide six there, would you agree there's two checks depicted on that slide? Yes. The top check, what is the number of that? The, the check number is 1052. And again, you said all these eight checks were made out to Ms. Krzyzewski? Yes. Does check 1052 have anything written in the memo line? Uh, it does. Okay, and what is that? Gift. Okay, and what is the amount? Uh, $2,612.17. And earlier you talked about the efforts you went through to, to sort of track a check. If you saw it leave someone's account, you tried to figure out where it was deposited into, fair? Correct. Did you do that in uh, with these checks? Yes. Okay. Were you successful in finding out where they had all been deposited? No. And why not? Because uh, a lot of these were just cashed. Okay. And in fact, if you look to the right of check 1052, uh, I guess on what would be the image of the back of the check, do you see any notation indicating that that check was cashed as opposed to deposited? 
it's obviously scanned upside down when you look at it, but you can see that it says cash and then it's CHK. Would you mind, just so we all know what you're talking about, just using that touch screen to circle what you're talking about? Thank you. I don't think we need to annotate that. I think we can clear the screen. And so, Detective, I won't have you go through all the steps again. I think you've described it. But did you find uh, that Ms. Krzyzewski then cashed that check as opposed to deposited into her checking account? Uh, I believe so, yes. Okay. Moving down to uh, the second check on slide six, what number check is that? Uh, that is check 1055. And uh, does it have anything written in the memo line? It does not have anything written in the memo line. And what's the amount? Uh, $2,000. And looking to the right, can you determine if that was deposited or cashed? Uh, it appears it was cashed. Okay. If we move to slide seven, please. Again, do you see two checks depicted? Yes. What's the number of the top check? 1057. And is there anything written in the memo line on that? Uh, Springleaf. Okay, do you know what Springleaf is? I uh, believe Springleaf is going to be a, or it was at one point, I'm not sure if it's still operational under that name. Springleaf was like a, a payday loan type business. Okay, and what's the amount of this check? Uh, $4,522.39. And did you determine whether Ms. Krzyzewski cashed that check or deposited it into an account? I believe this check was deposited. Do you remember which account of Ms. Krzyzewski's? Um, I believe it may have been into the Landmark Credit Union account. Okay. If I show you Exhibit 118, page 39, please. Again, Detective, before I ask you any follow-up questions, are you aware of what account we're looking at there in Exhibit 118? Oh, yeah, this is the Wells Fargo um, 8149 account associated with Jesse Krzyzewski. Okay, and do you see any uh, deposits matching that 452239 figure go into Ms. Krzyzewski's checking account? Yep, uh, there is one uh, 919 Okay. There's a deposit. And subsequent to that check going into Ms. Krzyzewski's account, are there any payments that you can see that go out to any sort of uh, loan company or, or a spring leaf or anything like that? No. We can go back to 149, please. What's the bottom check there on slide 7 of Exhibit 149? Uh, it's check number 1077. And does that have anything written in the memo line? Yeah, I believe it says medical. And what's the date of that check, if you can see? January 17th, 2018. Were you able to tell if Ms. Krzyzewski cashed or deposited this check? Uh, that was deposited. Do you remember which account? Um, I honestly can't say right now. Okay. Um, did you see any expenditures related to medicine or anything like that, or again, a doctor's office coming out of Ms. Krzyzewski's account? I don't recall being able to tie that to anything associated with any memo, or any anything, any payments associated with the memo of these checks. Okay. Moving to slide eight then of 149, please. Again, do you see two checks depicted? Yes. And. What is the top check numbered? 1079. Does it have anything written in the memo line? Uh, it just says bank. And what is the amount? Uh, $200. And can you tell if Ms. Krzyzewski cashed that or deposited it? Uh, it appears to be a cash check. Okay, and again, you can't really follow cash very well? No. What about the bottom check? What's the number of that check? Uh, it's 1082. And does that have anything written in the memo line? I believe it says air. Do you have any idea what that means? I don't. Okay. Do you see the amount written for that check? Uh, yes, it's $400. And can you tell whether Ms. Krzyzewski cashed or deposited the check? Uh, looks like it was 
cached. Okay. And finally, moving to slide nine. Again, do you see two checks depicted in that slide? Yes. Let's start with the top check again. What's the number on the check? 1084. And anything you can make out in the memo line? It just says, uh, I believe it says Walker Walgreens. Okay, and the amount? Uh, $89.99. And can you tell what Ms. Krzyzewski did with that check? That check was deposited. And into what account of Ms. Krzyzewski's? That would be her landmark uh, 3480 account. And that's Exhibit 120 we had you look at? I believe so, yes. Now you can see uh, to the right of check 1084 that it, it certainly lists Landmark Credit Union there in the sort of stamped or printed information, fair? Yes. Did you confirm that information though by looking at Ms. Krzyzewski's Landmark Credit Union account? I would have, yes, gone through her Landmark Credit Union account. Okay, so you saw this $89.99 go into her account? I believe so. Did you see any payments out to Walgreens or any medical facility at all for a walker? No. Okay. What about the bottom check, that eighth check from this account? Uh, that's check number 1085. And can you make out anything written in the memo line on that check? It looks like Walker Personal. Okay. And in relation to check 1084 to 1085, what are the dates of those checks? Uh, 108, they're within a day. 1084 is August 27th of 2018. And 1085 is August 28th of 18. And both have the word Walker written in the memo line? Correct. And what's the amount of check 1085? Uh, $192.02. And again, what did Ms. Krzyzewski do with that check, if you can tell? Uh, it was deposited into her Landmark Credit Union account. Again, did you see any outgoing payments for a medical facility or any place related to a walker? No. Okay. If we can jump back to slide three, please. So that was sort of that top line documenting those eight checks, correct? Correct. And it looks like you might have tallied up the total of those eight checks? Correct. And what was that total? Uh, the total of the eight checks was $10,000. $10,316.57. Okay. Now moving to that middle section you have illustrated, What? why is that important for you to note in this slide? Uh, those were debit card transactions associated with Lynn's 5336 account that occurred between September 21st, 2018 and September 28th of 2018, which is important during that time because Lynn was in the hospital. I believe she was in the hospital from September 15th through... Um, uh, September 28th. If we can go to slide four, please, of exhibit 149. Um, what, what have you highlighted here for the jury? These were transactions that were made using Lynn's 5336 account while she was uh, in the hospital. Again, as you look through those purchases, do you see kind of generally what sort of purchases they are? There's ATM withdrawals, um, there's a DMV payment, uh, looks like there's a Chase credit card, like an ePay. Um, there's withdrawals from numerous uh, ATMs. Uh, there's a, so from ATMs, in, there's some in Pewaukee, there's some in Greendale, there's some in Hales Corners, there's uh, some at uh, Pottawatomie Bingo, um, and there's Credit card payments. Okay, you've uh, testified, but you've also heard others testify that Ms. Hernan was in the hospital between September 15th and September 28th of 2018? Correct. Fair to say Ms. Hernan wasn't going to Pottawatomie? I don't believe Ms. Hernan, based upon her being in the hospital, went to any of these places. Fair to say she wasn't going to any ATMs, let alone in Milwaukee County? No. We can jump back to slide three, please. Again, moving down to that, that third item or the bottom illustration you have, why did you include that? Those are transactions that occurred um, between uh, October 5th of 2018 and October 23rd of 2018. Those are all transactions that occurred after Lynn Hernan's death. And if we can please jump to slide 10. 
And again, in slide 10, did you capture an excerpt from Lynn Hernan's 5336 account? Yes. And what is this uh, blue box to the right side of the screen? What is that highlighting? Those are the those are the payments or the transactions that occurred after Lynn's death. And again, what kind of just generally, what kind of purchases are being made? You don't have to go line by line, but if you can kind of give a general overview. There's ATM withdrawals at uh, Potawatomi Bingo and Casino. There's ATM withdrawals uh, in Milwaukee. Looks like there's purchases at restaurants um, and ATM fees. There's ATM withdrawals uh, at Stalas Palace. Um, all places, obviously, that Lynn, well, Lynn wasn't here to make those, so. Right, so those are after she died. Correct. But even when she was alive, prior to, I think you said sort of September 2018 was the change you saw? Yes. On this account, at least, right? Correct. Prior to that September of 2018 time, did you see uh, Ms. Hernan's 5336 account being used at ATMs? No. Did you see it being used at places like Stalas Palace? No. Did you see any purchases at Potawatomi Casino? No. Okay. So not only were these after she died, but they didn't fit that pattern you talked about before. Correct. Okay. One uh, charge I do want to point out on slide 10 is if you see towards the middle of that blue box where you mark these are sort of post-death transactions, if you look toward the middle, do you see a particular ATM at, uh, let me get this right, 1721 West Canal Street? Yes. Are you familiar with that address? Yes. Why, why are you familiar with that address as it relates to this case? That's the, an address associated with Potawatomi, Bingo and Casino. And so there's ATM usages from Potawatomi Casino that you testified to earlier? Yes. And that's how you know it based on the address? Correct. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that was clear. Thank you. We can take down Exhibit 149, please. And uh, actually, if we could bring up, I'm sorry, that was my fault. If we could bring up 133 for the detective and to publish it. Um, <coughs> Detective, we've talked about female Harris bank records. You earlier mentioned the documents related to <coughs> Ms. Hernan's lockbox, correct? Yes. And you said, I think, four people had access to it? Correct. You remember who those four people are? Uh, Lynn, uh, Jesse Krzyzewski, Anthony Poza, and Jennifer Flower. Now, as part of the records you got from Bemo Harris, did they show you when various people would access that box? Yes. Okay. And if we could scroll ahead, please, Mr. Vulcanier. Oh, go back one, please. All right. What are we looking at uh, on the screen here from Exhibit 133? Uh, this is going to be um, a safe deposit, I guess, considered, considered an access ticket, uh, just identifying that. Lynn entered the vaults and then and to um, review or add or whatever she did with her safe deposit box. And it's dated March 11th of 2015. Did you have to sort of familiarize yourself with the process of accessing a lockbox in your investigation in this case? A little bit. And are you familiar with the general process one must go through to access a lockbox? Yeah. What is that process? Well, you have to have your key, and then to act, the only way you can access the box is to have you have one key, and the bank has the other key. So you go there to access your account. One of the, as these are identified, one of the bankers or the vault custodians would have the key. They walk you into the vault. You, they use their key. They use your key. They open it. They usually leave. You remove the box, and you're able to review the contents of your box. There's some notes as to various people approving or inspecting various things. Yeah. Do you know who those individuals are or those initials belong to? I, I don't. Okay. But it's not a situation like going to your P.O. box, for example, at the mail uh, post office, thank you, 
and just going and getting your mail, right? No. You can't just walk into a bank and go directly to your own lockbox? No, you cannot. Okay. At least BMO Harris caused people to fill out these access forms. Correct. Okay, if we could go to the next slide, please. What are we looking at in this next one? This is another safe deposit box access record. Okay, and again, it's the same lockbox number, does it appear? Yes. What is that lockbox number? Uh, 514. Did you ever become aware of any other lockboxes that Ms. Hernan owned or rented? No, this was the only one that I was aware of. And are you able to tell when Ms. Hernan accessed the lockbox uh, with this access record? Uh, it looks like October 17th of 2016. Okay, next slide. Again, what are we looking at here? Uh, another uh, safe deposit box access record. And who accessed it? Lynn. And can you tell the date in this one? This one looks like it was November 26th of 2016. Okay, next slide please. Again, what do we see here? Another access record to that safe deposit box. And who accessed it uh, during this period? Lynn. And can you tell the date? Uh, April 20th of 2018. Okay, so for uh, between November of 2015, I think the first one was, till April of 2018, it appears Ms. Hernan was the only one to access this box. Correct. Okay, next slide please. What do we see here now? This is another safe deposit box access record. And does it depict the lockbox number? Uh, yes, the safe deposit box 514. And does it uh, state who accessed it? Yes. Who are those individuals? Uh, Jesse Krzyzewski and Jennifer Flower. And does it give a, a date? It gives a date of October 4th. Okay. Uh, no year given. No year given. Were these access records given to you in the order uh, we've gone through them? Yes. Do you have a belief as to what year this October 4th refers to? I believe. Your Honor, speculation. Overall, based on his investigation, he may answer. I believe it was, uh, would have been entered uh, October 4th of 2018. And was that significant in this investigation? Yes. Why? Because that was the day after Lynn Hernan died. Thank you. And now we can take down the screen, please. And if I could show the witness uh, exhibit 100, please, Ms. Buckner. And 121. Here, the exhibits I'm going to be referencing? No. Oh, it'll be 100, 118, and 121. Those two are already in evidence, uh, and 135. So 100 and 135 will be the new ones. Okay. Just to the witness. Thank you. Detective, do you have Exhibit 100 up on your screen? Yes. Are you aware of what that is? Yes. What is it? This is, uh, these are the records associated with the Goldman Sachs um, loan. Okay. Why uh, did a Goldman Sachs loan become important in this investigation? Uh, it was, upon reviewing all the, the records, uh, we identified a, um, a Marcus Goldman Sachs loan that was deposited into Jesse Krzyzewski's uh, Wells Fargo account, the 8149 account. Uh, it was deposited in March, I think it was March 8th of 2018, uh, but the, the loan was associated with the name Lynn Hernan. Is Exhibit 100 a fair and accurate representation of the documents you received from Goldman Sachs? Yes. I would move Exhibit 100 into evidence. No objection. 
Exhibit 100 is received and then permission to publish when needed. Thank you. And if we could switch, uh, Mr. Volkenier, to Exhibit 135, please. Detective, do you see Exhibit 135 on your screen? Yes. Do you recognize what this is? Yes. What is it? This is, what is the exhibit? Yes. It's uh, the documents associated with the Marcus Goldman Sachs loan. Is Exhibit 135 something you put together? 135 is the summary exhibit that contains the items that we just saw in the previous exhibit from the Marcus Goldman Sachs loan. Okay. And uh, I would move Exhibit 135 into evidence, Your Honor, and ask to publish. No objection. Exhibit 135 is received permission to publish granted. All right. Detective, what are we looking at on slide one of Exhibit 135? This is the, I guess it's identified as a customer profile, but this would be the name of the individual that's obtaining that obtained the loan through Marcus Goldman Sachs. And going down the left-hand side there, as you look at the screen, whose name is associated with it? Uh, Lynn Hernan. Anything that stuck out to you as, as it relates to that personal information sort of column along the left side? Well, it has Lynn's name and it has her address in Pewaukee. However, the primary phone number identified is the primary fo phone number that had been identified as belonging to Jesse Kraszewski. So that... A phone number ending 1039, you're saying, is not Lynn Herman's? Correct. Whose is it? Uh, Jesse Krzyzewski's. And what about the email? The email is an email that had been identified, I believe, on several, uh, on other accounts, um, as an email, like financial accounts, for it's Lynn Hernan 1955 at gmail.com. Uh, but what struck me as odd is, Lynn didn't have a computer, and from everything we were told, she didn't use the Internet, didn't use email, so didn't know where this email would come from. Okay. Moving on to slide two of Exhibit 135. What are we looking at here? That was a credit score from the, uh, I guess, the credit application or the credit loan for that Marcus Goldman Sachs. Okay. And that credit score of 779... When you reviewed other financial documents of both Lynn Hernan and Jesse Kershewski, did that credit score uh, align more with one or the other? Yes. Who did it align with? It aligned with Lynn. Okay. If we go to slide three, please. What is on slide three? Slide three was, I guess, information provided for the loan, um, for the loan application. Uh, there's a photograph of a driver's license, uh, a part, I guess it's a partial, it's not the complete driver's license, but a picture of Lynn Hernan's driver's license. Um, on the left, it's, there was a financial and employment section. Uh, the annual income was identified as $160,000. Uh, listed the employer as locks by Lynn. Gave a work phone number of the 262-421-5290. What about that phone number? Did that belong to Lynn Hernan? That was a phone number that we had never been able to attribute to Lynn as a number belonging to her. She had a landline and a cell phone, but neither telephone number was that number. Okay. Did that uh, phone number ending 5290 come up? in other financial documents and paperwork you reviewed? I believe so. Okay. Are you able to tell us about this loan application thus far? Uh, was this like an in-person loan application or online, or, or do you know? It would have been an online loan um, from what it appears to be an online loan. Um, the driver's license obviously looks like it was uploaded. This information was inputted. There was a copy of... Um, a check, which wouldn't be uncommon with a loan because you'd want money deposited into a checking account. Um, but in looking at the check, there were things that stuck out that I guess it just seemed out of place, seemed, I guess, suspicious in regards to this check, the way it was uploaded. Well, let's go through that. What looked suspicious about this check? Obviously, you included a picture of it in your 
slide presentation. The check itself, it, it denotes the name Lynn Hernan kind of in the header in the top left. It says Lynn A. Hernan, it's got her address on Meadowgrass Circle. You know, that, that is Lynn's address. It's very bold um, in comparison with everything else on this check. Everything else, like the check number, the pay to the order of, seems, it, it just seems off. It seemed a little more, um, I don't want to say hazy, but it, it's not as easy to read. It's not as bold. It's not as definitive as the Lynn A. Hernan. And then, at the, then at, underneath the pay to the order, it's got the Wells Fargo. Well, it, it says Wells Fargo, because it, but it doesn't have an address. Normally, checks have an address of attributed to the bank that's issuing the checks or the checkbook. Um, the issue, you know, and then further through, you can make out the numbers for like routing numbers and transit, you know, routing numbers and the account number, and it ends in the eight one four nine. The only account at that point. Uh, for Wells Fargo was Jesse Krzyzewski's Wells Fargo account, which ends in the 8149. And, in fact, in your review of all the financial records that we're going to talk about today, did you ever find Lynn Hernan to have her own Wells Fargo account? Did not find her to have her own Wells Fargo account. Did find her to be added to a little Wells Fargo account during, I guess, in March of 20. 18. Okay, let's talk about that. Whose Wells Fargo account was Lynn Hernan added to? She was added to Jesse Krzyzewski's 8149 account, and I believe it was March 8th of 2018. Okay. Do you recall when this loan through Goldman Sachs was applied for? I believe this loan was applied for on February 25th of 2018. So if this check was sent to Goldman Sachs on February 25th, Lynn Hernan had not yet been added to Ms. Krzyzewski's account. Correct. And going back to that left-hand column, in your review of Ms. Hernan's financial records, did you ever find her annual income to be $160,000? Uh, no. Did you, in fact, know whether that locks by Lynn was ever a business or employer of Lynn Hernan? I believe it was... I think. It was what she used on, I think it was her, uh, there was a bank account she used, Locks by Lynn, when she was a hairstylist. You know, at the time of Lynn's death, was she actively working or retired? Uh, she was retired. Next slide, please. <coughs> and what, what information are we looking at here? Uh, this information shows, uh, I guess, the loan application for the account. It was okay. a, for the Marcus Goldman Sachs account. Okay. Now, you've highlighted some information on this page. Um, I want to start with those first two boxes that popped up. Why did you circle those various amounts? Well, it was the amounts that were requested for the loan and the amount that was actually approved. Okay. And, again, earlier you stated you thought it was applied for on February 25th? Correct. And this would support that? Yes. And when was the uh, $30,000 that was approved, when was that dispersed? Uh, the $30,000 that was, was dispersed on March 8th of 2018. Okay. Next page, please. And what are we looking at here? This was the information from Marcus Goldman Sachs as to who the Lynn, or, I'm sorry, to who the loan was dispersed to. Okay, and who was that? The customer for the disbursement was Lynn Hernan. But whose account is that towards the lower box you've circled? That was Jesse Krzyzewski's Wells Fargo 8149 account. Okay. Next slide, please. What are we looking at in slide six, uh, Detective? This was the relationship change application from Wells Fargo that was obtained um, from the Wells Fargo account for the 8149 account. Uh, this was the, I guess, the change in relationship, as it states. This is the document that, I guess, addressed Lynn as being added to the account. Okay, and again, you circled the date? Correct. What is that date? March 8th of 2018. Okay, so after that February 25th application date? Yes. Okay. And if we could go to the next page. This is just a continuation of that form, is that fair? Correct. And you circled uh, something under Lynn Hernan's name. Why did you circle that? 
Well, she was, this is where she was added as a secondary joint owner of this account. And do you see in the lower right corner the phone numbers listed? Yes. Do you recognize either of those phone numbers to be associated with Lynn Hernan? I believe the, yes, the 9702 number was associated with Lynn Hernan. Okay. What about the other one? I can't recall. I believe her cell phone ended. It was like, I don't believe it was those numbers. It was like 85, 89 or something to that effect. Okay. But at least the first number you believe was a phone number belonging to Lynn Hernan. Correct. Okay. Next slide, please. And again, here, why have you included this information? Well, it's showing the date that this that Lynn's allegedly added to this account uh, as a secondary user. Uh, it's got a signature, and it does have the date of March 8th of 2018. Okay, next slide. What, what information have you included here? So these were payments, uh, I guess, once the loan was obtained, these were payments to Marcus Goldman Sachs for, I guess, the loan, the loan payments that they would make monthly. Okay, so I see that you've included at the bottom working up, you've included two payments from April 1st and May 1st of 2018? Correct. And uh, does that show what account those payments were made from? Yes, those payments came from the, the well, the, I guess at this point, it would be the 8149 Wells Fargo account. Uh, there were payments made on uh, April 1st of 2018 and May 1st of 2018. Those are the only payments that were located in that account record. And then there's nothing between May 1st and November 27th of 2018. Why didn't you include those months? Because there were no other payments. When we talk about uh, Lynn's pattern of life, was it like her to leave bills go unpaid? Uh, it, it was, it, no. I mean, she would have, she would pay her bills. She may have a balance, but she would pay her bills. Okay. Was it like Ms. Krzyzewski's pattern to leave bills go unpaid? Yes. And then we have these payments, these three payments at the top that are all after Lynn Hernan passed away. Correct. And can you tell what account those $5 payments were made from? Those $5 payments were made from the, it was the Hernan Estate account, the Tri-City Estate okay. account. Next slide. When this application for a loan went through, uh, was the applicant uh, made to submit bank documents? Uh, yes, it appears so because Marcus Goldman Sachs provided what was obtained f for them to disperse a, a loan. In your career as a detective, have you investigated loan applications before? Yes. Is it pretty standard to have bank documents associated with the loan application? Yes. Okay. So as we move into this slide of Exhibit 135, what are we seeing pop up on the left hand of the screen? On the left hand side of the screen is the document that was provided to us from Marcus Goldman Sachs. So the left hand part of the screen is going to be documents that were provided to obtain the loan. Is there a bank account number related to the Wells Fargo everyday checking account? Yes. What is that account number? It's the 8149. Now, you've been testifying today quite a bit about that account. And whose was it? It was Jesse's account. And was it in Jesse Krzyzewski's name? It was. On this document that you received from Goldman Sachs, though, who is the account holder now associated with 8149? Well, since Lynn was added, technically, in March of 18, uh, these statements that were provided have a date of November 29th of 2017 through December 28th of 2017. At that point, Lynn had not been added to that account, and the name on, I guess, this account at that time with those dates identifies locks by Lynn, Lynn Hernan. Now, we've talked a lot about Exhibit 118 and the records you received directly from Wells Fargo, correct? Yes. And if we cycle ahead... What do we see pop up on the right side of the screen now? So the right side of the screen is the actual documents that were subpoenaed and received from Wells Fargo associated with the 8149 account. The documents on the right hand of the screen were certified records that were provided by the bank themselves. And again, we're looking at the same time frame from the left to the right, at least as far as what's reported at the top of uh, each statement? Correct. And the same account number is reported there? 
The same account number is recorded. Just visually right off the top of your head, do you see any glaring differences between the two? Um, if you go through the, the top, I guess Wells Fargo everyday checking, okay, you have the account number. The account number seems, from what we're provided, obviously it seems a little more, the numbers seem, I guess, different, more bold, um, but they're associated with the 8149 account. You move over to the date, the date's in there, the, I guess the font, it just seems not the same. The way it's uploaded, it, it just looks different. I don't know if it's a different font, size, it's just not, it doesn't mimic the, the actual statements obtained. For the page, the one that was provided to Marcus Goldman Sachs shows pages one of four. The actual documents that we received it was pages one of six. Moving down, obviously, the legitimate uh, statement has the name of Jesse Krzyzewski. It provides a P.O. box of 320603 Franklin, Wisconsin. Um, in comparison to the document provided to Marcus Goldman Sachs, it's got locks by Lynn, like we talked about, Lynn Hernan, with her Pewaukee address. Uh, moving down, uh, you go into the account options section, which obviously it, it is highlighted. It's just off. If you look at the legitimate one on the right, the checks are in the boxes. You know, it shows, okay, the check's in the box. You look at the one on the left, they're not centered. They're not necessarily where they should be as opposed to the legitimate statement that we received. You go down to the activity summary. The beginning balance at 11.29 is indicated on the statement on the left, which was provided to Marcus Goldman Sachs, identifies $29,563.29. That's the beginning balance on 11.29. If you compare that to the activity summary on the legitimate statement on the right that was provided from Wells Fargo, the beginning balance is actually $3,332.05. Continuing, continuing to move down in that activity summary, the ending balance as of December 28th is indicated in the Marcus Goldman Sachs document as $16,227.50. The ending balance in the actual statement from Wells Fargo shows $1,631.43. The account number underneath account options on the legitimate statement shows Jesse R. Krzyzewski, and the statement provided to Goldman Sachs shows Lynn A. Hernan. I believe those were the items that on that necessarily on that form. Okay. Let's move to slide 11 again of exhibit 135. Again on the left hand side is this still what was submitted to Goldman Sachs? Correct. And now if we uh, add in the right column that's what you received from Wells Fargo. Correct. Why did you highlight these two pages uh, next to each other? Uh, because they're different. The, the documents provided to Marcus Goldman Sachs are not consistent with the actual bank documents that were provided from Wells Fargo. Um, a majority of the withdrawals are removed in the documents provided to Marcus Goldman Sachs. Um, it shows a lot of deposits. However, those aren't necessarily on page two of the actual document from Wells Fargo. You can see in, um, like on December 8th in the Marcus Goldman Sachs, it's got an authorization or a purchase at Sally's Beauty. It's got a card number. It's listed at 1383. You know, that's consistent with Jesse's account at that point. It wasn't Lynn's account because it was in Jesse's name at this point. It had never been, Lynn, Lynn hadn't been added at that point. Um, there is odd spacing, probably because a, a lot of things have been removed from the legitimate statement. You go down, there's, author, or there's online transfers. It shows online transfer from Hernan, way to way saving, 7587. Well, if it's online transfer from 7587, it shouldn't be a withdrawal in this account. It should be an addition. Um, so, you know, and it's, it's got the same reference numbers. 
So anytime there's an online transfer, there's going to be a different reference number. The same reference number isn't going to come through. The reference numbers show up. They would be, they're always different because they can't have the same reference number because how would a bank ever refer to a transaction if they all have the same number? And then continuing on with those, um, I mean, there's an ending balance of 1128 shows $16,000, which we already shown on the previous page that that wasn't correct. Um, however, the ending balance date shows 1228. It's listed on the document provided to Marcus Goldman Sachs as 1128. Okay, next slide, which is slide 12 of Exhibit 135. And if we could pop up the right column too, please. Why did you compare uh, the I guess I'll call them the page threes between what was given to Goldman Sachs and what Wells Fargo provided you. They're not the same. Yeah, tell us how they're not the same, despite it maybe being obvious. I mean, you're missing all this transactional history. Um, it's just gone. It's not here. At the top of the page, um, you can see that there's an account number on this page. The account number is different. The account number refers to the 7587 account which was an account associated with Jesse Krzyzewski. It was a Wells Fargo account. However, I guess mid-statement, this document changes what account it's actually discussing. And if we go to the next slide. And again, please pop up the right column. Okay. Again, on the, I'll call them the page fours now between the two. Uh, on the right side, which is what you got from Wells Fargo, there's still... Uh, more spend expenditures for that month's time, correct? Correct. What is page four on the left-hand column? Uh, the statements. It, it, it's a state. It's it's a form that a bank would have in an account when they give you an account statement. It's just there's no other um, there's no other transactions. It would be like the end of the account, uh, and it again does notate that the statement associated with this account is again the 7587 and not the 8149 that was originally portrayed to be. Okay, next slide. What are we looking at here? This is the legitimate account. These are things that were missing from the Marcus Goldman Sachs documentation that they received. In fact, the documentation they received only had four pages associated with this legitimate Wells Fargo account. Correct. So that's why there's nothing on the left-hand column here? Correct. Okay. Nevertheless, what do you see that you've highlighted on page five of the actual Wells Fargo document? Well, we're missing this. This section is missing. Uh, it's the um, the total amount of direct deposits. It's just going through the number of posted Wells Fargo debit card purchases or payments that wasn't on there. So, if I understand you correctly, that should have followed the uh, withdrawals or transaction report on page two of the submission to Goldman Sachs. Correct. And it just wasn't there. It wasn't there. Okay, next slide. And then again, why did you include this? Because it's still a legitimate statement that was originally provided to us from Wells Fargo. Okay. Next slide, please. All right, so what are we looking at now? This is going to be another uh, financial statement that was provided to um, Marcus Goldman Sachs for that loan. And what account number is it? Uh, it indicates that it's the 8149 account. Okay, so same account we've just been talking about. Correct. Is it a different time span? Yeah, it's December 29th of 2017 through January 29th of 2018. It's just the following month's time. Correct. All right, if we pull up the right column, you again appear to have compared this to the actual Wells Fargo documents. Correct. All right, and we can start to kind of move through this a little quicker, but what are the differences you see as, as you've added some animations to it? As we, you know, as we talked about previously, you know, the names on the accounts, you know, Lynn wasn't on this account at this point. Um, it was Jesse's account. Uh, the pages, you know, provided to Marcus Goldman Sachs was pages one of four. The legitimate statement actually had six pages. Um, the check marks, as we discussed, you know, in the account options, they, they don't match up. They, they're just off as opposed to the legitimate statement. The activity summary, it doesn't 
it doesn't match up to what the legitimate statement is. You know, the, the numbers aren't what were actually in that account at that point. Um, it indicates that, again, Lynn Hernan's account underneath account options when in all actuality it was Jesse Krzyzewski's account. Um, Are the amounts again changed in the starting balance and ending balance between the two documents? Yes. And uh, let's start with the left-hand side. What was the reported totals uh, submitted to Goldman Sachs? For the the beginning balance reported to Goldman Sachs was sixteen thousand two hundred twenty-seven dollars and fifty cents. It indicates that there were seventeen thousand nine hundred sixty-six dollars and five cents in deposits, and that there were fifteen thousand nine hundred thirty dollars and twenty-four cents in withdrawals or subtractions. And what about the ending balance? The ending balance was eighteen thousand two hundred sixty-three dollars and thirty-one cents. Now, if you go to the actual uh, bank document. What are the amounts? The actual bank doc. Uh, the actual amounts are uh, beginning on December 29th of 20 of December. December 29th was one thousand six hundred thirty-one dollars and forty-three cents. The deposits were eight thousand dollars. Eight thousand four two two point one zero. So eight thousand four hundred twenty-two dollars and ten cents. With the withdrawals or subtractions of eight thousand seven hundred fifty-nine dollars and ninety-six cents, with an ending balance of one thousand two ninety-three fifty-seven. Thank you. Let's go to the next slide. And again, you can bring up the right-hand column too. Thank you. Again, detective, we can see these are different in the transaction histories. Correct. Okay. And if we can, you bring up the keep going. Okay. Uh, did you see that just pop up on the left side, that sort of orange box? Yes. Okay. Uh, can we just walk through that a little quickly? On the last statement, uh, you were starting to explain it, and I think I kind of moved on quickly. Why is this word to, T-O, highlighted in the middle of that orange box? Well, because it's an online transfer. The statement indicates that it's an online transfer from the 7587 account. You can see that it says online transfer from Hernan L., Way to save savings, and it's got seven five eight seven. It shows a withdrawal of fifteen thousand dollars or a subtraction. If it was an online transfer from, if it was an online transfer from the eighty one forty nine account, it wouldn't have account seventy five eighty seven. It would have two seventy five eighty seven. Okay, so the fact that it says a transfer from a different account. You're saying that fifteen thousand dollar figure should be in the additions column. Correct. Okay. And so when you you put in the word two there in the middle of that orange box. Correct. Because based on what you're seeing, that's what the word should say. Correct. Okay. Thank you. And then, if we can go one more, Mr. Vulcanier, what have you highlighted here in green? It's the reference number in regards to the transfer. It was the same reference number as. The previous statement that was provided. And again, you stated a bank would not give out the same reference number for now three different transactions. Correct. Okay. Moving on to slide 18 of Exhibit 135. Again, rather quickly, just explain why you included these. Because they're not the same. Okay. A lot of transaction history has been removed from the Goldman Sachs submission. Correct. Moving on to slide 19. Um, and you can go one more, Mr. Walkenier, please. Thank you. What do we see right at the top when comparing these two? It shows that it's the 8149 account. It shows page 404. However, the uh, date is incorrect. Um, it changed from November. It changed from what it was previously to now. It's November 29 of 17 to December 28 of 17. Okay. So whoever was altering these forgot to change the date at the top of the left again. Correct. Okay. And again, we can see, can you go one more, please? We can see at the bottom again, there's some things that were missing on the submission to Goldman Sachs. Yes. All right. Moving on to slide 20. Again, why did you include this? Just because it's, it's the uh, legitimate document that we received, just to show that it was not a legitimate document that was provided to Marcus Goldman Sachs. All right. And same with uh, slide 21. Correct. Okay. All right, now we're going to move on to slide 22. And here are, what account are we talking about now? 
This one we've we've changed to the seventy five eighty seven account for, with Wells Fargo. Okay, and at least as far as what was given to Goldman Sachs, whose name is on that account? Lynn Hernan. And what time frame are we talking about? Uh, well, October. I'm going to assume because this document doesn't have a year, but it's October twenty eighth of twenty seventeen to November twenty ninth of seventeen. Okay, and to your knowledge, was Miss Hernan ever added as a second user or user of any kind? to account ending 7587? No, the documents we have show that she was added to the 8149 account, but never the 7587 account. Okay, and if we bring up the right-hand column, again, what are we looking at on the right? Uh, this is the legitimate document that we received associated with the 7587 account from Wells Fargo. And whose name is that legitimate document in? Uh, Jesse Krzyzewski. Same account, 7587? Correct. And uh, same rough time frame anyway? Uh, yeah, roughly. What is the difference? The difference is the statement is actually from November 1st of 2017 to November 30th of 2017, as opposed to the document that was provided to Marcus Goldman Sachs, which indicates October 28th with no year through November 29th of 2017. Okay. And as we cycle through a couple more uh, animations, you've highlighted, again, some, some glaring differences between the two documents. Correct. All right, I'm going to go ahead to slide 23, please. And again, if we could bring up, yep, thank you. What are we looking at here in slide 23? Uh, 23 on the left is the Marcus Goldman Sachs document. On the right is the legitimate Wells Fargo document. Okay, and again, you can cycle through all of them. What are the big differences you notice between these pages? Again, with the dates at the top, um, the statements don't match. That they don't have the same content, you know, the, the statement given to Marcus Goldman Sachs doesn't have the content that should be on there according to Wells Fargo and their legitimate statement. All right, if we could go to slide 24, please. What are we looking at here on slide 24? Uh, the actual, on the, on the left is the Marcus Goldman Sachs statement that was, that was provided to Marcus Goldman Sachs, and on the right is the statement that was provided by Wells Fargo. And on the left, you've, you've put a note in this one. Uh, what are you trying to indicate there with that note? That this isn't the information that would be provided on that savings account if it was legitimate documentation from Wells Fargo. Do you have a theory of how uh, that disclaimer came to be on a savings account then? I believe it was probably, um, I believe that a checking account statement was used as opposed to a savings account statement. Okay, so whoever was altering these documents was likely using a checking statement to try and make look like a savings statement? Correct. And again, we can see that on the image on the right? Yes. And again, you've indicated the dates are off again? Correct. Okay. Moving on to slide 25, please. Why did you uh, capture these two pages? Well, the year, well, the, like I said, the, the dates are consistently off throughout that four page document provided to Marcus Goldman Sachs. Okay. If we go to slide 26. Again, what account are we talking about here? This sort of starts a new statement that was submitted? Correct. What account is it for? This is the 7587 account from Wells Fargo. And again, what time frame are we sort of around? Uh, November 29th of 2017 through December 28th of 2017. And again, when you look to the statement on the right that you received from Wells Fargo, what should the actual dates read? should be December 1st of 2017 through December 31st of 2017. And then again on this, as you have in past slides, did you highlight the major differences? Correct. Okay. And we can see those up on the screen. Let's move ahead to slide 27. Again, what are we looking at here? We're looking at the transaction history. And uh, what does it show you between the two documents? It shows that they're not, they're not the same. Okay, you would agree that they're at least roughly the same in, in size or length at this point? Oh, in size or length, yes. They indicate... The legitimate document 
is similar to the document provided of Goldman Sachs, but the dates are off. There's things that just don't match in regards to what's going on with the account. Okay. The totals for the account that were provided to Marcus Goldman Sachs are off. Let's talk about those totals. On the left-hand side, the document that was given to Goldman Sachs for this loan application, what does it indicate the ending balance of the account was at the end of December? Uh, it indicates that it was uh, $37,000. Is that the ending balance or? Oh, I'm sorry. The ending balance uh, was $81,000. $432.56. And now if you look at the legitimate Wells Fargo account information, what was the ending balance on December 31st of 2017? Uh, zero. If we go to slide 28, please. Again, what was your purpose in including these? Just to um, compare the differences in the documents. Okay. Again, the wrong disclaimer on the wrong kind of account. Correct. And fair to say, when you uh, generated this exhibit, did you include the entire, uh, if it was a six-page document, did you put all six pages in for the legitimate documentation? Yes. Okay. Moving on to slide 29, please. Again, do you see any uh, errors at the top of the page between the left side and the right side? Just the dates that were consistent throughout the statement, but. Right, so the side that was given to Goldman Sachs consistently, but wrong with the dates as opposed to the legitimate document. Yes. Okay. Moving on to slide 30. Again, what this is a, a beginning of a new statement that was submitted? Correct. What statement or what account was it for? This was again for the 7587 account. What time frame? Uh, the legitimate statement shows January 1 of 2018 through January 31st of 2018. What does the uh, document that was given to Goldman Sachs say? It says December 29th of 2017 through January 29th of 2018. And again, as you have with past accounts that were submitted, did you highlight the glaring differences between the two? Yes. Okay, if we could bring all of those up, Mr. Volkanen. Okay, and if we move to slide 31. Again, why did you include these? Because they were different. And this time, the item on the left side that was given to Goldman Sachs actually indicates there's more pages than the legitimate document. Correct. Okay. And again, are the amounts or the ending balances specifically different between the two? Uh, significantly different. What is the ending balance for the document given to Goldman Sachs? Ninety-six thousand four hundred fifty-three dollars and fifty-six cents. And again, what is the legitimate bank information ending balance? Uh, zero. If we could go to slide thirty-two. Can you go two more, please. Again, you highlighted some differences you saw. Correct. And finally, slide 33, please. Now, here we have a document that pops up on the left and nothing on the right. Correct. Why is that? Because there was only three pages in the legitimate document from Wells Fargo. Okay, but somebody added a fourth page to whatever was given to the loan company. Correct. All right. And we can take that exhibit down at this point. Detective, um, as you went through all of those differences, is it fair to say we've gone through it much quicker than you had to go through it to evaluate all those differences? Yes. When you looked at those differences and took what you knew about Ms. Hernan and her technological capabilities, do you believe Ms. Hernan was capable of altering those documents? I do not. Okay. Now, this is, um, I can keep going if people want, but this is probably a good breaking point if we want to break for lunch. Are you exciting. done with these exhibits? For I now? am, yes. I think that'll be a good place to stop rather than start up with a new one and then break for lunch. So uh, we will do that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the admonition that I've given to you every single day uh, at the end of the day in full, but just to summarize for you today, please do not discuss this case among 
yourselves. Don't do any research. Um, and uh, enjoy your lunch. Uh, we'll have you back here. Um, I think we'll start up close to one today. Thank you, everyone. Please rise for the jury. All right, we are in recess then until 1 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you.
Detective Planas, you can retake the witness stand, please. All right. Even though it's a, about a minute and a half before one, you're all here, so I'm just going to call the case. We are back on the record in State versus Kershevsky. Appearances are as they were before. We have Detective Planas back on the witness stand. I know the jury is ready to go. Anything uh, I need to address prior to bringing them in from the state? No, thank you, Your Honor. From the defense? Nothing that I can think of, Your Honor. Thank you. All right, very well. Madam Clerk, please have them brought in. Oh, was it? I'm going to have to try that at the break. You guys got that down to a science on the end. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. Attorney Sitzberger, when you're ready, then you can continue with your examination. Do you need any exhibits up? I think we will jump back into looking at some exhibits, Judge, please. And if I could show the witness um, exhibits 124, 125, 126, 150, and 164, please. Let me just confirm that. 124, 125, 126, 150, and 164. Yes, ma'am. All right. And these are new ones, correct? Yes. All right. So just to the witness, he should have them. So go ahead. Thank you. Detective, do you see Exhibit 124 up on your screen? Yes. Do you know what that is? Yes. What is it? Uh, it's a business records affidavit, like a certification of records. For, for what institution? Uh, Capital One Services or Capital One Bank. Okay, and if we scroll down. And we get to page two here. Uh, do you see whose Capital One account uh, exhibit 124 uh, details? I would be... Uh, Jesse Krzyzewski's uh, 9976 account. Okay, is that a fair and accurate depiction of the records you received for Ms. Krzyzewski's account ending 9976? Yes. All right, I move Exhibit 124 into evidence. No objection. Exhibit 124 is received and when needed, permission to publish is granted. Thank you. And moving to Exhibit 125, uh, Detective Plenis, do you see page one of Exhibit 125 on your screen? Yes. Do you know what 125 is? Uh, it's a Discover um, record certification. It's an affidavit for Discover. And if we scroll down a page, please. Oh, I'm sorry, all the way to page eight, actually. Thank you. Uh, are you able to tell whose Discover card account this is in relation to? Off of this page, I don't believe we have a name on this one. I'm not on this page. 
if we scroll further down that same page, page 8 of Exhibit 125, can you now see, now that we've scrolled down the page for you, can you see the account holder's name? Yes. Who is it? Uh, Jesse Krzyzewski. And is there uh, a way to identify this account by its last four digits? It would be the 9975 account. Again, is this a fair and accurate depiction of what you received from Discover in relation to Ms. Krzyzewski's Discover account? Yes. I would move to Exhibit 125 into evidence, Your Honor. No objection. Exhibit 125 is received and permission to publish is granted. And turning to Exhibit 126, Detective, uh, do you see page one of that exhibit? Yes. Can you identify what it is? That's a certificate of authenticity uh, for Credit One Bank. And as we uh, scroll down in that document, can you tell us whose account this is in reference to? Mr. Balkanier, could you jump to page 17, in fact? And uh, Detective Plenis, what is on the screen on page 17? Uh, it's a credit card statement for Credit One. Okay, and if we scroll down uh, briefly, Mr. Balkanier, on that same page, 17 of Exhibit 126, can you see who the account holder is for that account? Uh, Jesse Krzyzewski. And is there uh, a last four digits you can identify that account by? That's 1650 account. And is this a fair and accurate depiction of the records you received for Ms. Krzyzewski's Credit One account? Yes. Okay, I'll move Exhibit 126 into evidence, Your Honor. No objection. Exhibit 126 has received permission to publish granted. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> and so, Detective Plenis, just as a means of recapping from this morning until now, um, we've talked about uh, Ms. Krzyzewski's Wells Fargo account ending 8149, correct? Co correct. We talked about a Wells Fargo account ending 7587. Correct. We talked about a landmark account for Ms. Krzyzewski ending in 3480. Correct. And Exhibit 122 was Ms. Krzyzewski's U.S. bank card ending 9994. Correct. And now we have these uh, three exhibits you just testified to this afternoon. Fair? Fair. So my count puts that at seven financial records you reviewed uh, that belong to Ms. Krzyzewski. Correct. Do you believe that's the total of the financial accounts you received uh, in response to your department's subpoenas for all financial records pertaining to Ms. Krzyzewski? I believe so, yes. Okay. And this morning you talked about putting together sort of summary slides for these accounts because your work researching them was was lengthy, fair? Correct. All right, I'd like to bring up uh, Exhibit 150, still just for the witness, please. And we are on slide one of Exhibit 150. Can you, can you recognize what that uh, item is? Yes. What is it? It's the summary of uh, Ms. Krzyzewski's 8149 Wells Fargo account. And you assisted in putting that together? Yes. I move Exhibit 150 into evidence. No objection. All right, 150 is received and permission to publish granted. Thank you, Your Honor. And before I do so, I'll just switch over to Exhibit 164 as well. Detective Plentis, when you uh, concluded looking at all of Ms. Krzyzewski's financial accounts, um, did you put together sort of a summary of sort of money coming in and money going out from all of those accounts? Yes. And do you see Exhibit 164 on your screen there? Yes. And if we just quickly uh, scroll through the three slides from Exhibit 164, can you identify what 164 is? Yes. What is it? It's the summary of the accounts uh, that we went through this during this investigation, the spending of, this, of these accounts and income. Okay. I would move Exhibit 164 into evidence as well, Your Honor. No objection. Exhibit 164 has received permission to publish. Granted. Thank you. I'd like to begin by publishing Exhibit 150 from <coughs> Mr. Vulcan here.
Thank you. I saw that. Light come on and the thumbs go up. Thank you, jurors. Uh, Detective Plentis, again, remind us why you put Exhibit 150 together. This is a summary of, I guess, all the account records that we went through associated with Ms. Krzyzewski's 8149 account. And in this particular exhibit, uh, did you try your best to take it sort of uh, month by month? Yes. And do you believe in this exhibit you'll be able to see some patterns? Again, this morning you were talking about patterns of life. Do you think some of those will be depicted in this exhibit as we go through it? Yes. Okay. And so why don't we start with slide number one. Why don't you tell us what is uh, depicted in slide one? So this is the uh, opening of the 8149 account. Um, it was opened on February 26, 2016, and there was a $50 deposit uh, that opened the account. Uh, this would be the first, I guess, statement associated with that account starting on uh, February 26th. Uh, during this statement period, there was $482.11 deposited into the account. There was $449.36 worth of transactions or withdrawals. Uh, and at the end of the period, of the statement period, the account totaled uh, $82.75. As far as this formatting goes, did you try to be consistent with that across the monthly statements as we go through this? Correct. And so we start with like the bank image on the left, correct? Correct. And as we go up to that piggy bank icon, what does that depict as we go forward in this slideshow? That depicts the amount of uh, money in the account at the time. Okay. Money in the account or money coming into the account? Money coming into the account. Okay. During that time period. Okay, thank you. And if we go to the bottom where we see that like cash with wings on it, what does that depict? That would be the withdrawals, transactions, money leaving the account. Okay. And then finally that bank icon or building with pillars icon on the right, what does that depict? That would be the ending balance of that account at the end of that statement period. Okay. Anything significant uh, on a one-month sort of look-in on Ms. Krzyzewski's checking account? <coughs> no. Okay. If we can go to slide two of Exhibit 150, please. All right. And what are we looking at here? This is the account period between uh, March 26th of 2016 to April 27th of 2016. And if we go across the top, again, what do we see coming into the account? Uh, $911.15. That would include... A paycheck um, that Ms. Krzyzewski received. So when you were going through these monthly statements, were you paying attention to things like that, paychecks, for example? Yes. Now, in the last slide from the month previous, I noticed there were no paycheck icons. No. Does that mean you didn't see any paychecks, at least directly deposited into her checking account? Correct. Okay. And then along the bottom, what do you have noted there? Those would have been the transactions made with that account during that time period. Um, the amount of transactions totaled uh, $1,003.52. Um, the transactions, uh, I guess, in the account during that time period, um, these were the locations that some of them were notated, like the Speedway in Greenfield, uh, Speedway in Franklin, West Dallas, Brass Monkey in West Dallas, Dallas Palace Bar. Okay, so when we talk about uh, $1,000, and three dollars leaving the account. When we look to the right of that, you're not telling this jury that all of the one thousand three dollars went to those bars and Speedway gas stations and things like that, are you? No. Okay. So why did you include those places in that uh, right or right column? Well, those well, I guess would indicate some of the things we're looking for to identify, like a pattern of life, to determine if these were going to be normal locations that someone would frequent places that Ms. Krzyzewski may purchase, items, things of that nature, where she would be or where she would go. Okay. And then again, on the bank icon on the right, what are we left with there? Uh, the ending balance of that account, which was negative uh, $9.62. Okay. Let's go to slide three, please. And Detective Plentis, does it appear we're in the very next month? Correct. Okay. And what can you tell us about uh, this slide three? There were... $3,955.60 worth of like, money coming in. There was two paychecks during this time period. Um, during this time period, there was 
a total of $2,645.11 within withdrawals, which could be transactions, things of that nature, that were being deducted from this account during that time period. The account ended with a balance of $1,300.87. Okay, and in this slide, you at least noted sort of geographically where most of the purchases um, contributing to that 2,000-plus figure went. Correct. And those were primarily Milwaukee County locations? Yeah, in the West, Al or in the West Dallas and Hales Corners area. Okay. And so far, we're about three months into this financial record, right? Correct. Is it really fair to say whether any patterns are developing at this point? Not yet, no. Okay. Let's go to the next slide then. Fair to say we're just going month by month still? We haven't skipped any months? Correct. Okay. Uh, what do you have to say about this slide? Uh, during this time period, there was another, you know, there was two paychecks that were received by Ms. Kraszewski. There were also uh, two, um, I guess what you consider payday loans or cash advance loans that were received during this time period to supplement the income going into the account. I'll just stop you for a second, Detective. When you say uh, payday or cash advance loan, what are those? Do you know? Uh, those are loans that we, people can apply for to receive money if, if they need money. Um, it's a quick loan. Usually it's a very high interest rate to pay them back. Um, but those, that's what those kind of loans are. Why did you take note of them in your summary exhibit here? Uh, well, because there's... They're, they're money, they're, they're a, way, a means of money for Ms. Krzyzewski or at least into this account. Okay. And I kind of cut you off. I think you were going to go into the bottom half where we have uh, expenditures of that account. Correct. And what was the total amount spent from that account? Uh, $5,073.55 during that time period. Okay. And then to the right of that, what do you have? Uh, th these were the monies that were spent at these locations during that time, during that statement period. Uh, there was $933.50 uh, we can attribute to Stalas Palace, whether, and then there was $176.27 at Scotty's Pub, and then there were um, $1,641 in ATM cash withdrawals. And when you reference these specific locations, uh, do those include like ATMs at that particular establishment or just like paying off a food or a bar tab? I believe, well, some of them are ATMs at some of these, look at these locations. Okay. So it could be ATM usage and buying goods at these places. Correct. Okay. And again, why did you highlight these uh, locations along with the ATM withdrawals? Because these are, I guess, starting to, we're, we're trying to determine uh, these are regular transactions or courses of behavior or how Ms. Krzyzewski, I guess, lives, where she hangs out, what she's doing. Okay. And then at the end of the month, what's the balance? Uh, it's negative $50.40. Okay. If we go to the next slide, please. Uh, again, have we skipped any months? No. Okay. We're just into that next calendar month. What do you see on this slide, which for the record is slide 5 of Exhibit 150? Uh, this is going to be the time period between June 28th of 2016 through July 28th of 2016. There's... Uh, Deposits into the account, $6,381.61. Uh, there's paychecks coming into the account. There's deposits at bank branches, a $3,000 and a $2,000 deposit uh, coming into the account. There's also um, $6,323.55 worth of uh, withdrawals or transactions associated with the account during this time period. And again, you've noted some specific... Locations where a portion of that total expense uh, total goes to. Correct. Um, again, why are you listing these specific uh, locations? Because we're, we're starting to, I guess, these are locations where money's being spent, and some of them are starting to become, I guess, I guess regular in these statements as we're going through them. Like we notice them more than oh, it just didn't happen once, that kind of thing. Okay. And what's the ending balance between June and July of 16? Uh, $7.66. Okay, let's go to the next screen, please. Again, what are we seeing here? This is the account activity between July 29, July 29th, 2016, and August 25th of 2016. What's notable on this screen? 
there's no paychecks. There's cash being deposited, um, which we haven't necessarily seen, uh, large amounts of cash. I guess not large, but cash deposits. Um, there's also $7,149.24 worth of withdrawals or transactions associated with the account during the same time frame. Okay, and again, you've put those, uh, some of the locations that money is spent at, correct? Correct. I noticed you included uh, the geographic location of Speedway and Pick and Save. Why did you do that? Because it's in West Dallas. Okay. Another area that seems to be, okay, frequent in these accounts, or in this account. Okay. And despite having no paychecks coming into this account, what is the ending balance of that account? Uh, the ending balance is $178.42. And again, we talked this morning about when somebody's taking out cash or putting cash in, is there a way for you to really trace it back any, anywhere? Not necessarily, no. Okay. Let's go to the next slide, please. Again, we're in the next consecutive month? Correct. Okay. What do you see here? Uh, this is August 26, 2016 through September 28, 2016. Uh, there's $19,480.39 worth of uh, deposits coming into this uh, account. There's three different payday loans. Uh, there's a cash net, a Sun Trust, or two Sun Trusts. Um, there's a cash deposit of four thousand nine hundred twenty-two dollars and thirty-nine cents. There's also a ninety-nine hundred dollar check from Lynn that was identified as the um, Cone Office check that we had previously talked about. Okay. And again, in the upper right corner, despite that income you've talked about, any of that related to paychecks that you could see? No, no paychecks that we could see. Okay, what about expenditures? Uh, there were $8,411.34 worth of expenditures associated with that account during that time. Uh, we identified $632.50 worth of purchases that we can attribute to the location of Stalis Palace. There's ATM withdrawals, and there's also uh, withdrawals from uh, ATMs uh, at Potawatomi. And as we noted this morning, no payments that you saw to any cone office? No. And so what is the ending balance uh, at, at September 2016? Uh, the ending balance is $11,247.47. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. Again, are we in the next consecutive month? Correct. Okay, what do you see? Uh, money coming in, uh, $11,038.64 worth of money coming in from um, a cash deposit of $1,475. And then there's also the, the check from uh, Lynn Hernan's account, uh, check 2003, the $9,135.62. Any, again, any income based on paychecks that you could see? No income from paychecks that we could see in, those account, in that account during that time frame. And again, of that 11000 plus figure, the bulk of that was from that check 2003 from Lynn? Correct. And then let's move to the expenditures that month. That month there were $19,187.33 worth of expenditures. Um, there were $1,743.75 worth of purchases at Stalis that we could attribute to Stalis Palace. There was $4,600 uh, in ATM withdrawals. And there was a withdrawal from, or there's $306.50 worth of withdrawals from an ATM at Potawatomi. Okay, so we've sort of split the ATM at Potawatomi from the other ATMs? Correct. And likewise, you said attributed to Stalis Palace. Does that top figure, the 1743.75 figure, does that include ATMs at Stalis Palace? It would. It, the, the address for the ATM shows up on the transaction. Okay. So that middle amount is ATMs not associated with Sales Palace or Potawatomi Casino? Correct. Understood. All right. And then what is the ending balance, please? Uh, the ending balance is $3,098.78. All right. If we could go to the next slide, please. Again, um, the starting balance there was the same as the ending balance from the last slide? Correct. We're in the same or the next consecutive month, I should say? Correct. All right, let's talk about the incoming money. The incoming money was $12,077.32. There's a $4,500 or $4, cash deposit. There's a $7,000 cash deposit. There were no paychecks that we could attribute during this time frame, but other than these cash deposits. What about expenditures then? 
there was $11,159.58 worth of expenditures. We had the and $1,745 worth of uh, purchases we could attribute to Stalis Palace. There were $3,151.75 worth of ATM withdrawals. And there was also $920.25 with ATMs at we could attribute to Potawatomi. And you were able to pick the dates of those three Potawatomi ATM usages? Yes. Okay. And then finally, what's the ending balance for that uh, <coughs> month? The ending balance is 4000 Sixteen and fifty-two cents. Next slide, please. Again, are we into the next uh, consecutive month here? We are. All right. Let's talk about the income again, please. The income um, was nine thousand seven. It was nine thousand seven hundred ninety-five dollars and forty-eight cents. Uh, the income coming into this uh, a trip was attributed also to a check from Lynn Hernan that we have previously talked about. It's check two zero zero five. The nine thousand one fifty. $9,152 check that was denoted as a court-ordered payment. Uh, we didn't see anything in regards to paychecks coming into the account at that time. And again, the, the check from Lynn makes up the bulk of the total income for that month? Correct. Let's move down to the expenditure side then. Uh, during this period, we had $13,793.08 worth of expenditures. Uh, again, we had <clears throat> purchased, We had one thousand one hundred eighty-one dollars for the purchases. We could attribute to Stalis Palace. There was five thousand seven hundred twenty-one dollars worth of ATM withdrawals, and then there were seven hundred sixty-seven dollars and ninety-one cents worth of uh, like ATM or withdrawals associated with Potawatomi. And again, related to that check, nothing out to a court or clerk of courts or anything like that. No. So what does the uh, ending balance look like? Uh, the ending balance is $18.92. Next slide, please. Again, um, at this point, why don't you just let me know if we've skipped any months, but otherwise it's fair to say we're in the next consecutive month here? Correct. Okay. And we can see the starting balance is that same eighteen ninety two. Correct. And let's talk about the incoming money that month then. The incoming money was $17,525.78. There were... Cash deposits of one thousand dollars, cash deposit of six thousand dollars, and a cash deposit of ten thousand dollars. There were no. Say where any of that cash came from? No. Okay. Uh, up in the right corner, I noticed you noted no paychecks again. Correct. There were no paychecks coming in. What about the expenditures this month? Uh, the expenditures this month were seven thousand four hundred and twenty-eight dollars and sixty-two cents. Um, there was $285 for the purchases attributed to Stalis Palace. There was $614.25 worth of ATM withdrawals. And we could attribute $453.50 to Potawatomi transactions. And ultimately, what is the ending balance uh, as of 1.30 of 2017? $10,116.08. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, we're into January into February of 2017? Correct. Tell us about the income here. The income here uh, was $13,302.51. Okay, anything notable about the income as opposed to the prior few months related to payroll income? There was a payroll check this month um, totaling $1,247.52. There were also... Uh, Two checks attributed to uh, Lynn Hernan, um, one for $4,500, one for the $5,735.66. The $4,500 check was identified as the cash call check, and the uh, other check was identified as the prosper funding check. Uh, there was also an $812 tax return. And we talked about that this morning as well. Correct. Okay. And now moving down to the uh, expenses that month? Uh, there was $15,242.56 worth of expenditures. And again, you've highlighted some specifics related to that ultimate total? Correct. What did you note there? There was uh, 17 of these transactions occurred at Stalis Palace, and there were also $2,683.50 worth of ATM withdrawals. We didn't see any payments 
in regards to cash call or prosper funding. Okay. And then the ending balance that month? Uh, $8,176.03. Okay. And if we could please go to slide 12. Again, sorry, slide 13. Thank you. Again, are we in the next calendar month there? Correct. All right. And what do we see as far as incoming money? Our incoming money is $18,912.71. There are two payroll checks that are deposited into this account at that, during that time frame. There are also, uh, the first check is March 3rd of 2017. It was $1,000. It was $1,080.13. Um, she has a second payroll check that's also deposited with that same amount on March 17th of 2017. In between those two checks, there are the two checks from Lynn Hernan. Um, the first check was the $7,330.87, uh, identified as the Advance America check, and then the $9,416.36 check, identified again as the Advance America check. Okay, and so a bulk of the total income that month came from the two checks from Lynn. Would you agree? Agreed. Okay. Now moving down to the expenses, what are the total expenses uh, between March 1st and March 27th of 2017? Uh, they're $21,928.18. And <coughs> you noted a, a number of places where you saw money spent. Can you go through that list? Yeah, there was uh, 18 transactions or purchases attributed to Stalis Palace totaling $2,682.51. There was $1,518 worth of ATM withdrawals. There were $787.64 worth of Potawatomi ATMs, which was, it looks like it was probably one occurrence. There was a $905 payment to Daniel Management, which we able to determine was for her mother, Jennifer Flowers, rent. Um, there was a $3,500 Payment to a Capital One card uh, identified as belonging to Jennifer Flower, or at least in the name of Jennifer Flower. Um, a $1,500 payment to Ms. Krzyzewski's U.S. bank card, ending in 9994. Uh, $948.29 um, payment it was a check that was written for a mattress. It was check 1999. There was another $3,122.84 payment to a, uh, Ms. Krzyzewski's U.S. bank card, again identified as 9994. Uh, there was a $396.59 uh, payment to Ms. Krzyzewski's Discover credit card, identified as 6997. And then there was a $4,612.04 payment to a Capital One card uh, associated with Jennifer Flower. Okay, and ultimately after all those expenses, what was the ending balance? Uh, the ending balance was $5,160.56. Okay, next slide, please. Again, are we in the consecutive month? Correct. Okay, and what do you see as far as money coming into the account? Uh, there's a paycheck on April 4th, 2017, uh, totaling $1,486.19. Um, there is a $400 online transfer from the well, her Wells Fargo savings account, identified as 4587. There's a second payroll check, uh, totaling $1,210.25. Um, and then there is a $12,000 check from uh, Lynn Hernan's account, the check that was identified as the IRS payment. And then moving down to expenses. There were $9,432.54 worth of ex uh, expenditures that month. Um, there were purchases at, again, at Stalis Palace totaling $2,441. There was $1,659 worth of ATM withdrawals. There was another payment for uh, Jennifer Flowers' rent. Uh, there was money spent at Potawatomi. There was a payment to Jesse Krzyzewski's Discover credit card, identified as a 6997 card. 
There was another payment to Ms. Krzyzewski's uh, U.S. Bank credit card, the 9994 card. There was $500 that went to her savings account, and then there was $480.89 uh, charge or transaction at Potawatomi. And ultimately, what's the end balance there on that one? $11,030.67. Okay, and next slide, please. And as we start to go through this, um, and I'm sorry, for the record, we're on slide 15. Can you just kind of highlight the, the biggest portions of the incoming money you see that month? Okay. Uh, the biggest portions of money coming in during this month uh, would be the $6,000 check uh, that was deposited from Lynn Hernan's account uh, with the doctor endoscopy for the memo. Okay, and if we shift down to the expenses, if you could just highlight some of the locations you're seeing that total figure that we can see on the screen. Where, where is the money being spent this month? Uh, Stalas Palace, Potawatomi, um, Jennifer Flowers Rent, Jesse's U.S. Uh, Bank credit card, um, and at ATMs. Okay, and we're left with uh, what for the ending balance that month? Uh, $240.46. And there's a note right above the check for $6,000 from Lynn. What is that in reference to? That was in reference to the um, balance of the 8149 account um, prior to the deposit of the $6,000 check from Lynn. Next slide, please. Again, when we see that total money coming in, uh, where's the bulk of that coming from? Um, the bulk of that money is coming from uh, a check from Republic Bank. Do you know what that is? I believe it was like a loan. Okay. Um, again, here in we still have two paychecks. Is that fair? Correct. Okay. And dropping down to expenses, what are some of the places you noted um, that you saw some of the spendings go to? Again, it's somewhat consistent to what we've started to see is you know Stalas Palace. There's ATM withdrawal, ATM withdrawals, Potawatomi. Uh, Jennifer Flowers rent payments to Ms. Krzyzewski's Discover card um, and her U.S. Bank card. And ultimately, what's the ending balance there? Negative uh, $46.81. Next slide, please. Okay, as far as incoming money here, what do we have? Uh, this month, we have a total of incoming money. The total was $29,452.83. There are two... Um, paychecks, however, the bulk of the money is associated with two checks uh, from Lynn Hernan's uh, 76 of 1 account. Could you just explain your notes above each of those checks? So the first check uh, was a check totaling $9,400 uh, from Lynn Hernan's 76 of 1 account. It was check 2014. That was a check that was denoted as car payment. Uh, at the time that that the balance of the 8149 account was at $25.59 uh, at the time the check was deposited. Okay. And you've noted, again, uh, the same type of expenditures, Potawatomi, credit cards belonging to Ms. Krzyzewski, that sort of thing? Correct. And that's in regards to the second check that was deposited that month. It was similar. That second check was a $17,221.93 check, identified it as... Um, check 2015 from Lynn's 7601 account. That had the memo that said Citibank May. At the time that check was deposited, during that same month time frame, the, the bank or the balance of that account had been down to $265.35. And ultimately, even after that $17,221 check is cashed, what's the ending balance? The ending balance of the account? Yes, sir. Uh, $17,000. $247.96. Okay, next slide, please. And as we continue to go through this, uh, Detective Plenis, we see a note at the very top, it looks like over the third source of income that month. What is that? That was um, the balance at the time that that was deposited. Okay. So you wrote that the balance was $958.51 at the time 
check number 2016 was deposited? Correct. What is the note as far as uh, items to still process the same day? Those are items that hadn't been deducted from the account yet. Okay. So is that like over the course of a weekend when the bank might not process payments yet? Correct. Okay. So, in fact, had check 2016 not gone in, uh, this account would have been overdrawn? Yes. Okay. Thank you for explaining that. And, again, is the bulk of the income that month from those two checks from Lynn? Yes. And then moving down to the expenditures, um, again, anything that you haven't already mentioned, or is it sort of more of the same places that you're taking note of? Uh, there's a lot of the same places. There is uh, payments to Ford Motors. Um, there's a payment to a Credit One card. Um, there's a Synchrony Bank card. Um, I believe the rest of them are all cards or places we've dealt with at this point. Okay. Fair to say at this point that you're starting to see patterns of life in Ms. Krzyzewski's account? Yes. Okay, let's keep going. Um, here in August to September of 2017, again, what kind of expenses are we seeing? What kind of locations, I should say? Same locations. Stalas Palace, we're seeing payments to uh, rent for Jennifer Flower, payments to a Synchrony Bank card, uh, payments to that credit or the Capital One credit card associated with Jennifer Flower. A payment to um, the USPS for uh, PO boxes. And what's the end balance there? The end balance is seven hundred four dollars and sixty seven cents. Okay, next slide, please. And we'll start to move through this a little faster. But anything that jumps out as far as the expenses, and I should note for the record, we're on slide twenty. Thank you. Um, anything that jumps out as far as where the money was going that month? No, it's fairly con it's consistent with what we've seen so far. Okay. Anything notable about the end balance? Uh, I was in the negative. It was negative ten cents. Okay. Next slide, please. Again, uh, I'll take my time on this slide because you've included a great deal of information as it relates to money coming in. What was happening in this month? Uh, this month there were. Um, there was, a, there was a payroll check. Uh, there was a, a deposit um, on 11-8 of 2017 uh, for $3,000. And there was also the check from Lynn's BMO Harris uh, 7601 account, that check 2018. Um, there were loan pay, or I guess like we talked about the payday loans, there was a $2,000 loan that came in there. There was also a $3,970 net credit loan that was deposited into this account. However, it denoted the name Jennifer Flower. And if we drop down to expenses again, same sort of pattern we're seeing or anything jump off the page as being new in this month? Same, same pattern. Okay. Next slide, please. Again, I want to highlight on this slide, which I believe is 22, um, your note above the second source of income that month. That was the, uh, the deposit of Lynn Hernan's 7601 account check 2019 that was identified as CAR. Uh, that was $5,300. Um, at the time that that was, I guess, just previous to that being deposited, the balance of that account was $140.91. And then uh, if we go two over from that, two over to the right, do you see Rise Loan Company? Yes. And do you know what Rise Loan Company is? Rise Loan Company is uh, another one of those quick, I guess, I guess payday loans. Okay. And so if we drop down to the expenses then, anything you're seeing that's like a new expenditure? Uh, well, we're seeing a payment uh, to Rise Loan. Other than that, everything else has been fairly consistent. Okay, and if we go to the next slide, please. Again, here we have uh, a few sources of incoming money. Is that fair? Yes. We have. What's the what's the sort of general nature of those? Uh, those are cat. Those are 
loans, like those payday loans. There's some payroll checks, but they're less than $1,000. Um, but the bulk of the money is coming in from, one is a $3,500 SunTrust bank loan, and then a $2,600 CashNet USA loan. Uh, and that, again, was uh, in the bank statements that identified the name Jennifer Flower. And just to be clear, uh, Ms. Kershevsky is still drawing a paycheck, it looks like, from a, a family dental clinic, perhaps? Uh, it does appear that she's still obtaining a paycheck, yes. They're, they're smaller uh, paychecks at this point than we had seen previously, but yes. Okay. And then again, anything notable in the expenses or, or same general pattern? Um, same general pattern. Okay. Next slide, please. Again, anything in this next month? Now we're into January to February of 2018. Anything notable on this page? She did receive uh, three. Um, well, it appears we received, she received pay, uh, payroll checks, um, which was the bulk of the money in this account deposits at this time, but there was also a deposit of um, another, believed to be like payday loan, or credit, it was $1,400, it says Jora credit, and that was also denoted the name Jennifer Flower. Okay, and what's that ending balance that month? Uh, $34.07. Next slide, please. Okay, here in March uh, 1st to March 27th of 2018, anything that kind of jumps off the page at you that you want to mention? Well, this is the month that the $30,000 uh, Goldman Sachs uh, loan or payment is received into this account. Okay, and if we drop down to expenses, just below that and to the left, with this $30,000 uh, loan coming in, we have almost the same amount in expenses, correct? Correct. And do any of the expenses you documented pertain to Lynn Hernan? No. But that $30,000 loan was in Lynn Hernan's name, <coughs> correct? Correct. Okay. And so what's our ultimate end balance after that $29,630 is spent? $2,160.99. Next slide, please. Your Honor, can I object quickly and might be resolved with a quick sidebar? Sure. Thank you. Please be seated. I had turned the exhibit off, so let me know when it's back in the jury box.
apparently we all need to work on our patience today, and the universe is telling us that. There we go. All right, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, Detective Plenis, before, this is slide 25 of Exhibit 150. Do you see the second item down uh, in your list of where money is being spent? Yes. You listed five separate ATM withdrawals? Yep. Okay. If, if one of those turned out to be a teller withdrawal, do you think maybe you just miscategorized it, perhaps? Yes, that's possible. Ultimately, the official records in Exhibit 118 would tell the story where all of the money adding up to 29000 plus would have gone to, correct? Correct. Again, you're keeping track of sort of a, a trend or a pattern of, of life behaviors. Yes. Okay. Let's move back to Exhibit 26, please. I'm sorry. Thank you. Slide 26 of Exhibit 150. Okay, and I don't remember where we left off on this slide, but is there anything that sort of jumps out off the page that you need to explain, or is it just sort of more tracking the patterns? It's more tracking the patterns of money coming in and money going out. And in fact, what's the ending balance after money goes out? Uh, the ending balance is negative $355.56. And in fact, uh, in your list of uh, places or businesses that money is going to, there's a new one with Goldman Sachs sort of in the middle. Is that fair? Yes. Okay, and we kind of talked about that a little bit, but for two months, I think you said this morning, uh, there were payments made out of this account to that Goldman Sachs loan. Correct. Okay. Um, next slide, please. Again, here we're looking at April to May of 2018, correct? Yes. Still seeing paychecks coming in? Seeing paychecks come in and then still seeing loans come in, payday loans. And again, uh, a lot of those expenses are related to Ms. Kershevsky's credit cards. Uh, for the expenses, yes. And we see Potawatomi as well? Correct. Okay. And again, what's the ending balance there? Um, it's negative $589.47. Okay, next slide, please. And here we are in May to June of 2018. What are you seeing here? Uh, we're seeing just two deposits, uh, payroll checks. Okay. What about the ex expenses? The long list of expenses has sort of ended and we have a new one. Correct. We have $700 of overdraft fees. Okay, and in fact, what's the ending balance there? Um, it is negative $573.03. Next slide. 29, off 29, I believe, for Exhibit 150. Uh, what are we seeing here between June and July of 2018? Uh, we're seeing, we still see um, some payroll checks coming in, um, but then there's also a $3,800, uh, an ATM check that was deposited into the account. Um, it was a Citibank, like a check that you'd get from like your Citibank account. They offer credit cards, offer checks sometimes, for like advances, cash advances and things. Um, the deposit was written out to Lynn Hernan. So let me back up. The check was written to Lynn Hernan but deposited in this account. Correct. And that was possible because why? Well, Lynn had been added to this account in March of 2018. Okay. And after that um, check from a Citibank credit card account was deposited, what happens to this account? Uh, it's in the negative. It's closed. It's closed. It looks like maybe there's a withdrawal of $4,500 that leaves it at $0? Yeah. Okay. Now, on the right hand of, of this slide, 29 of Exhibit 150, you have something documented there with a phone icon. What, what's that about? There was, a phone, there was a phone call that was provided from Wells Fargo uh, that when a subpoena was done to see if there had been any communications that had been retained or during the course of this account. Uh, there was a phone call that they were able to retrieve uh, from, I believe, it, yeah, it's June 29th of 2018. And have you had a chance to listen to that call? Yes. And is that uh, why you were able to put some notes about it on this exhibit? Correct. I'd like to 
play exhibit 119, please. And if we can, I'll just play the first five seconds or so and ask the detective if he can recognize it. And, Your Honor, I object to this based on the lack of foundation. We're looking at a summary document. We've had no um, foundation laid that this call occurred when it did about you know, the, the contents of this account. Um, I just don't think the foundation's been laid for us to get into that. Um, I'll sustain the objection if you could please lay a, a more thorough foundation. Sure. Detective, uh, we talked this morning a great deal about your uh, department subpoenaing records from financial institutions, correct? Yes. And we spent the bulk of our time talking about paper financial records, fair? Correct. Is that the only kind of thing banks or financial institutions send you in response to subpoenas? No. In fact, you were just talking about some communications that banks sometimes keep. Correct. And did you receive such a communication from Wells Fargo in response to your subpoena? Yes. And I believe you just stated, but roughly what time was that uh, recording or communication from? I believe it was in June of 2018, possibly June 29th of 2018. And was it uh, referenced in, <coughs> excuse me, relation to Ms. Kraszewski's 8149 account? Yes. And that was the account Ms. Hernan had been added to in March of 2018? Correct. And again, you've had a chance to listen to it? Yes. In your course of this investigation, since you came on, have you had a chance to listen to things such as interviews with Ms. Kraszewski by your fellow detectives? Yes. Have you had the chance to listen to uh, jail calls that have been referenced in this case? Yes. Do you believe you recognize Ms. Kraszewski's voice in an audio recorded format? Yes. And having listened to this call provided by Wells Fargo, do you believe it's Ms. Kraszewski's voice on that phone call? I do. All right. Your Honor, at this time I'd uh, move Exhibit 119 and ask to play it. Any objection? Not at this point, Your Honor. All right. Exhibit 119 is received permission to publish and play um, is granted before you play it. Ladies and gentlemen, you're about to hear an audio recording. Recordings are proper evidence and you may consider them just as any other evidence. Listen carefully. Some parts may be hard to understand. And again, Mr. Walton, may we play the first five seconds or so? Welcome to Wells Fargo. This is Brittany. How may I help you? Um, yes, I'm calling. I'm trying to update the... Can you pause it? Thank you. And where did you pause it, Mr. Holcomb? Right at five seconds. Thank you. Detective, you heard that brief audio clip? Yes. Do you recognize it? I do. Do you know? What is it? It's the call that Wells Fargo provided uh, of the recorded call they had retained in their systems. Okay. I'd ask to play the duration of Exhibit 119. Go ahead. Thank you. Information. Um, there's two people on this account. And I'm just trying to update my current information. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I'll be glad to update your information. Um, may I get your first and last name, please? Lynn Hernan. Okay. There you are, Ms. Hernan. Okay. And then may I get the last four of your social, please? 7283. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, ma'am. And... Okay. Okay. All right, Ms. Hernan. And then I do need to get you verified a little bit further. Uh, would it be all right if I send you a one-time verification code by text message? Um, I don't have a cell phone listed on there. Okay. Gotcha. No problem. Well, I can give you one, but it's not on there. It's not on there? Okay. Gotcha. Nope. Not a problem. Okay, Ms. Hernan. So we'll just go the other route. Um, what I'll do is ask you four questions about people, places, or property that you've been associated with. Uh, based off of data from public sources. And so the first question I have is, who is or was the lender for an auto loan open around June of 2016? I have Nissan Motor Acceptance, Fifth Third Bank, Transamerica, J.P. Morgan Chase, or none of the above? None of the above. Okay. Next question is, which of the following is a current or previous <laughs> employer? I have Avon Sales. Dr. Brian F. Thornley, retired, Comfort Inn, or none of the above? What one was a previous employer? Current or previous, yes, ma'am. 
you can put retired, but none of those I've worked for. Okay, gotcha. So retired. And then the next question is, which of the following matches the last four digits of your phone number? I have 2283-8910, 2735-8589, or none of the above. Okay, repeat all those one more time. Yes, ma'am. 2283-8910-2735-8589. Okay, yes, ma'am. And last question, which state issued your Social Security number? I have Delaware, Wisconsin, West Virginia, Maine, or none of the above? Wisconsin. Excellent. There we go. Okay, Ms. Hernan. And then this is going to be both your physical and mailing address. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And did we need to update that phone number as well, Ms. Hernan? Yes. Okay. Not a problem. We'll get that done. All righty. And what is that address, please? Um, the address is N16 West 26543. I believe you guys have that, but I am switching it to the mailing. Okay. That's just the actual physical, but the actual mailing address is the P.O. Box. Okay, gotcha. P.O. Box. And it's 320 603. And it's Franklin, Wisconsin. Uh huh. 53132. Okay, perfect. All righty. And then we need to add, um, did we need to take off this uh, 3555 number off this turn Yes, because I'm not sure what number that is. <laughs> okay, gotcha. So I'll take that off. And um, is 9702 still a good house number? Um, no, I'm actually changing that too. Okay, gotcha. So I'm deleting everything off of here. Correct. Okay, so um, may I get the house number or the cell phone number, please? 414. Mm -hmm. five, one, or, I'm sorry, I completely said that wrong. Sorry, 262. 262. 421. 421. 5290. 5290. And that's the house? Correct. Okay. And then cell phone? No cell phone. No cell phone. Gotcha. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. So uh, we left the physical address alone, and then we just changed the mailing address. So the mailing address is P.O. Box 320603, and that's Franklin, Wisconsin, 53132. And then the best phone number is 262-421-5290, and we deleted everything else. Sounds good. Thank you very much. You're very welcome, Ms. Hernan. So I'm getting that all changed for you. There we go. Get that updated. There we go. Okay, so I have updated your account records with that information. So. That is only on your side, Ms. Hernan. Um, that is just for your mailing and, and your phone number. Thank you very You're much. You're very welcome. Again, my name is Brittany, and All thank right. you for being the best part of Wells Fargo. You have a wonderful day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Just for the record, I believe that was a 5-minute and 24-second audio file. Detective Plenis, you said you recognized Ms. Kraszewski's voice on that call? Correct. But the person identified themselves as Lynn Hernan. Correct. Does that cause you to doubt your recognition of Ms. Kraszewski's voice? No. And did you hear Ms. Kraszewski then change uh, contact information for Lynn Hernan? Yes. Was there anything notable about the timing of that call at the end of June 2018 as it relates to the payments to the Goldman Sachs loan coming to a stop? I believe uh, the payments stopped after June. And that's around the same time Ms. Kraszewski is changing the mailing address and the phone number on that account? Correct. And did you hear the phone number ending 5290 that Ms. Kraszewski changed Lynn Hernan's phone number to with Wells Fargo? Yes. And did that come up in the Goldman Sachs loan application? That was a phone number that was provided for the Goldman Sachs loan. And again, you stated that phone number ending 5290. You and your fellow detectives could not attribute to Miss Lynn Hernan. No. Now, going back to um, the financials, we talked 
about how you reviewed seven different financial accounts for Jesse Kershevsky, correct? Correct. We spent some time this afternoon going through trends and patterns you saw in the checking account with Wells Fargo on behalf of Ms. Kershevsky. Yes. When you looked at all of the accounts, those uh, three bank accounts being two at Wells Fargo and one at Landmark, and the four credit card uh, that Ms. Kershevsky had, did you see similar trends and patterns? In regards to the usage? Yes. Yes. What about um, any patterns related to paying off bills or paying down balances on credit cards? Uh, it appeared that the balances weren't necessarily paid down. There may be payments here and there, but they maintain a balance. We saw several times as we went through the checking account that her account was overdrawn. Do you remember that? Yes. When we shift over to credit cards, were there credit cards of hers that were close or over the credit limit? Yes. Did it appear she paid those off very quickly to get them back under the credit limit? No. And again, I'm asking you to summarize these, but what is the basis of your knowledge for these things? For the accounts associated with Jesse? Yes. Uh, the basis, or I guess the a summary, a summary of that would be the payments were, they were used at Stalas Palace, Potawatomi, um, Scotty's Pub, you know, restaurants, bars. Uh, there were um, other, obviously, things that were paid. They were pick and save in Hales Corners. Um, the majority of the things happened in Milwaukee County. Uh, the West Dallas area, the Franklin area, the Hales Corners area, um, the credit cards maintained a high balance. They weren't often paid down to zeros, um, and that was consistent through the records that we had received for those accounts. Okay, and if somebody wanted to, they could go through these exhibits we've introduced, the actual financial documents, and they could go line by line to look at all these expenditures, how much is going to what place. Correct. You've just done your best to try and summarize your observations as you did that. Correct. Okay. When you got done sort of um, looking into all of those seven financial accounts for Ms. Kershevsky, did you uh, compare the level of spending to the level of various income sources? Yes. All right. I'm going to ask to publish Exhibit 164, please. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay, so on Exhibit 164, Slide 1, can you break down what you've put together here? This is a comparison between the the incoming, so basically the paycheck income that Ms. Krzyzewski received compared to the spending associated with her accounts. Okay, so that line running along the bottom, that green line, what is that? That would be the paycheck income that Ms. Krzyzewski received during that time frame from the accounts that I reviewed. Okay. And then that orange line that has several, I guess, spikes to it, what is that? That is the monthly spending of Ms. Krzyzewski. And towards the right-hand side of that uh, slide, do you see a sort of pronounced spike? Yes. Can you just kind of tell the jury what time frame that occurs in? That is around the end of September, early October, November area of... Uh, 2018. And that would be the time surrounding the death of Lynn Hernan then? Correct. Okay. If we go to slide two, please. <coughs> Your Honor, I would object to slide two. It appears that they have Keep taking it off. included a pie chart that includes both income and spending for the same time period, which is not a fraction of the whole. Um, just seems a bit misleading and simply wrong. <coughs> well, I received it earlier. Um, I, that goes to wait not the admissibility at this point. You can certainly cross-examine on that. That would be appropriate. Understood. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. 
Okay, and Detective, you also now didn't limit it to just paycheck income. You added a few other sources of income on slide two. Is that fair? Correct. What were those other sources of income? Uh, checks from Lynn, uh, cash advance loans that we could identify being deposited into the uh, account. Okay. And again, uh, the purpose of this pie chart is not to say these are a percentage of some overall number, correct? Correct. It's just sort of a visual of explaining sort of what the, the earnings or the income look like compared to the spending you saw across these accounts. Correct. Okay. And so that, um, that $144,000 figure towards the upper right, what is that? That would be the checks uh, attributed to uh, Lynn Herndon between the 7601 or the 5336 accounts. Okay. And then that... Uh, Blue slice, that's, I think it says 49000 something. What is that? That would be the paycheck income that Jesse, Ms. Krzyzewski received um, in her bank accounts. Why was this something you wanted to note? Well, that was the, the amount of money that we can, I guess, attribute to employment that was coming in for employment that Ms. Krzyzewski was receiving. Okay, were these various totals of sources of income compared to... Uh, expenses by Ms. Krzyzewski notable to you in your investigation? Yes. Why? Well, because it showed that, I guess, the spending that we could see in the accounts was a lot more than what Ms. Krzyzewski was receiving or was earning at that point from it, her, her job that we could, I guess, uh, identify. Okay, and to be fair, that spending total $532,000 Plus, that's just what you saw leaving the accounts, correct? Correct. Some of that could be one bank account paying off a credit card, right? Yes, it could be balance transfers from one account to another. It's not necessarily all money that was spent. It's just money being moved between the accounts associated with Mr. Okay. Shesky. Did you have the ability to try and sort of track if account one paid off account two to kind of take it out of that total? No. Okay. This is just sort of your bare bones saying I total up what came out of an account and added them all together. Correct. Okay. Fair. Can we move to slide three, please? And then finally, why did you put uh, slide three together of 164? Well, this is, I guess, ba basically the, the pie chart just broken down into, I guess, a bar graph. Okay. Same information, just presented differently. Correct. Okay. Um, we can take exhibit 164 down, please. Publish it for the moment? For the moment, yes. Thank you. Okay. I'm just going to work with Mr. Valkanier on some exhibits to show Detective Plenis. Yes, please do.
Detective, while those uh, are being pulled up, you talked a lot about the patterns uh, that you were looking for, correct? In both Ms. Hernan's accounts and Ms. Krzyzewski's accounts? Yes. So if you had to summarize what patterns you saw in Ms. Krzyzewski's accounts, what would you say you saw as, as far as patterns of life? Uh, that Ms. Krzyzewski frequented the, I guess, Franklin, West Dallas, Greenfield, the Milwaukee County area. Um, there were, she spent time at Potawatomi. She um, didn't appear to spend, the majority of her spending was in Milwaukee County. She spent money that, um, uh, numerous credit cards, um, and maintained balances on those credit cards. Um, her pattern, I, I basically, Ms. Krzyzewski's pattern of life and Ms. Hernan's pattern of life were very different in okay. regards to locations and where they spent their money. Okay. And as we start to bring up uh, Ms. Hernan's accounts here, do you see Exhibit 101 depicted in front of you now? Yes. And do you recognize what it is? Yes. What is it? That would be Lynn Hernan's uh, 8803 account with Capital One. Do you believe this is a fair and accurate depiction of the records given to you by Capital One related to that account? Yes. I would move exit, well, let's move on to Exhibit 102, and then I'll move them all in together. Do you see Exhibit 102 on the screen? Yes. Do you know what that is? This would be Lynn Hernan's uh, 4692 Capital One account. You believe it's a fair and accurate depiction of the records you were given in relation to that account? Yes. Let's move on to Exhibit 103, please. And if we could scroll down. Okay. Do you see on page three, can you recognize what this is? This is going to be Lynn Hernan's uh, 2932 city bank or city account. Okay. And does it appear to be a fair and accurate depiction of the records you received related to that account? Yes. If we move on to exhibit 106. So no 104. No 104. I was trying to keep track as you said them off. Really? Sorry, Ron. Throwing a wrench in the works. You are. It's exhibit okay. 106, do you see that on your screen? I do. Do you know what that is? This is going to be uh, the certification of records from J.P. Morgan Chase. And if we scroll down <coughs> to page three, can you determine whose account it is? Yeah, this will be Lynn Hernan's uh, 5639 account. And does it appear to be a fair and accurate depiction of the records Chase Bank sent you in relation to that account? Yes. Okay, next to Exhibit 107, please. Do you recognize this item? Yes. What is it? It's the Discover Affidavit or Certification of Records uh, for Discover. Okay, and if we scroll down to page 4, can you tell us whose account that is if we scroll down on that same page a little bit? This would be Lynn Hernan's uh, 1222 uh, Discover account. Okay. Does it appear to be a fair and accurate depiction of the records you received from Discover Card? Yes. Okay. Moving on to Exhibit 108. Do you recognize what page 1 of 108 is? Yes. What is it? This is the record certification for Capital One Services or Capital One Bank. Okay. And if we scroll down in the document on page 2, can you see whose it is and uh, the last four digits? Yes, it's uh, Lynn Hernan's, and it would be the 1662 account. Does it appear to be a fair and accurate depiction of the records you received related to that account? Yes. On to Exhibit 109, please. And if we could actually scroll down on this page. Oh, I'm sorry. Never mind. Go back to page one. I'm sorry. I missed it. Do you see uh, page one of Exhibit 109? Yes. Are you able to tell what it is? It's a letter of authenticity. Uh, for a First National Bank of Omaha. And if we scroll down now to page two, can you tell us whose account it is? The Lynn Hernan's. 
And if we scroll down further, can you give us our last four digits to identify it by? Yeah, this would be the 3372 account. Again, does 109 appear to be a fair and accurate depiction of the records you received? Yes. Moving on to Exhibit 110. You recognize Exhibit 110? Yes. What is it? This is the uh, Certificate of Authenticity for um, American Express. Okay, and if we scroll down to page 2, are you able to tell us who uh, the account holder is and, and a way to identify this account? Uh, it's The account holder is Lynn Hernan, um, and the account uh, is the 6-11007 account. Does it also appear to be a fair and accurate depiction of the records you received in this case? Yes. Moving on to 112, there is no 111, or at least not yet. Uh, do you recognize Exhibit 112? Yes. What is it? This is a certification of records. Uh, for Coles Incorporated. And if we scroll down, can you tell us, scroll down one more please. Okay, on page 14 we get to a monthly statement. Can you tell us whose account that is? That is going to be Lynn Hernan's Coles account. Okay. And are there a last four digits you can identify it with? Uh, I think we have the possibly refer to it as the 9110 account. Okay. Does that appear to be a fair and accurate depiction of Ms. Hernan's Coles card? Yes. Okay. Or I should say the records associated with that. Correct. All right, moving on to Exhibit 113, please. Do you recognize page one of that exhibit? I do. What is it? This is a declaration of records for uh, Menard Incorporated. Okay, and if we scroll down. Can you tell us whose name appears on the account as it appears on page 10? Uh, Lynn Hernan. And I'm sorry, you said this was a Menards account? Menard, yeah. Okay. Does that appear to be a fair and accurate uh, representation of those documents you were sent from the Menards Corporation? Yes. Next to exhibit... We refer to that as like the 7224 oh, account. Oh, okay. Thank you. You said 7224. I think I cut you off. Yeah, I believe that's what it was, 7224. Thanks, sir. Moving to Exhibit 114, do you recognize what this item is? That's a record certification for Synchrony. Okay, and if we scroll down, can you tell us whose account it is? It's going to be Lynn Hernan's. Okay, and any card number associated with this that you can find? There's an account number, 0896. And do you know of any stores this account is affiliated with? I believe this was affiliated with uh, J.C. Penney. Yeah, J.C. Penney. Okay. Does this appear to be a fair and accurate representation of what you received related to that account? Yes. All right. And finally, Exhibit 115. Do you recognize what this is? It's another uh, it's record certification for Synchrony. Okay. And if we scroll down, can you tell us whose account it is if we keep going? <clears throat> It's uh, an account, account associated with Lynn Hernan. Okay. And do you have a last four digits to identify with? Uh, yeah, 4248. Okay. And does that appear to be a fair and accurate depiction of the records you received related to Ms. Hernan's Synchrony Bank account? Yes. All right. All right. At this time, I would move exhibits 101 through 115, save for 104 and 111 into evidence. No objection. Save for 105 as well. 
uh, exhibits 101, 102, 103, 106, 107, 108, 109, 110, and 112, 113, 114, and 115 are all received. Thank you, Judge. All right, and before I ask to publish anything, can we now go through exhibits 136 for the witness? Oh, I need to pull them up. Thank you. Sorry. Detective, well, those are being pulled up. Um, again, like we've been talking about, when you reviewed uh, Lynn Hernan's financial records, did you do your best to put together summary documents? Yes. Did you do that uh, with all of these accounts we just went through pretty painstakingly? Yes. Okay. And so uh, we'll go through a few PowerPoints to see if you recognize them in just a moment. <coughs> Detective, do you have anything on your screen? I do. Is it Exhibit 136? Uh, it is. Okay. <clears throat> That's good. Do you recognize Exhibit 136? I do. What is it? It is the summary um, exhibit associated with Lynn Hernan's uh, 8803 Capital One card. Okay. Moving on. And you helped create that uh, summary exhibit. Is that fair? Yes. All right. Moving to Exhibit 137, please. You recognize that? This would be the summary exhibit for Lynn Hernan's 4692 Capital One card. What about exhibit 138? This would be the summary exhibit associated with Lynn Hernan's uh, 2932 Citibank card. And moving on to exhibit 139. This is the summary uh, exhibit for Lynn Hernan's J.P. Morgan Chase 5639 card. Okay. What about Exhibit 140? <clears throat> this is the summary exhibit for Lynn Hernan's uh, 1220, 1222 Discover card. Okay. Moving on to Exhibit 141. This is the summary exhibit for Lynn Hernan's uh, 1662 Capital One card. Card. What about Exhibit 142? This is the summary exhibit for Lynn Hernan's uh, First National Bank of Omaha card. It was a 3372 card. It was a Speedway Gas uh, card. Okay. How about Exhibit 143? This is the summary exhibit for Lynn Hernan's uh, American Express uh, 1007 account. 
Okay, what about Exhibit 145? I don't know what happened to 144 at this point, Your Honor. This is a summary exhibit for Lynn Hernan's Coles uh, card, the 9110 account. Okay, how about 146? Uh, this is a summary exhibit for Lynn Hernan's Menards uh, card, the 7224. Okay, what about 147? This is the summer exhibit for Lynn Hernan's J.C. Penny uh, card. It was the eight nine six one. And then finally, exhibit one sixty nine. This is going to be. Uh, I'm going to take 169 off the table at this point. I think I got my exhibit numbers wrong. Let's go and ask you, are these all fair and accurate representations of the summary uh, exhibits you put together? Yes. And like I asked you with Ms. Kraszewski's accounts, did you take all of the information from these exhibits from the financial reports themselves? Yes. All right. And I move exhibit 136, 137, 138, 139, 140, 141, 142, 143, 145, 146, and 147 into evidence and ask to publish. No objection to those. All right, all of those exhibits are received, including 136, 137, 138, 139, 140, 141, 142, 143, 145, 146, and 147. Permission to publish granted. Thank you, Your Honor. Could we start by publishing 136, please? Thank you. And, Detective, we can see, now we can see this is a one slide exhibit? Correct. What were you trying to document as you put all of these slides together related to Ms. Hernan's accounts? We're trying to document when the account was opened, um, the credit limit, the types of usages, um, and if we had statements, what the balances were and where they were used. Pa general patterns of life like you described? Yeah. Same things you were looking for when you uh, looked through Ms. Krzyzewski's accounts? Correct. Okay. And this account is related to Ms. Hernan's Capital One account? Yes. All right. What uh, summary findings did you uh, have when you got done looking through this account? Uh, this account was opened in it was July 29th of 2010. Uh, it wasn't used very frequently. It was very minimal. It was used um, between August 26th of 2015 and May 25th of 2018. A lot of time during that time frame, there was, if there was a balance, it was very minimal. Um, it would be paid off um, free, you know, fairly quickly. Um, we notated that going through this, that in the statement identified as the May 26, 2018 through the June 25th of 2018, uh, that there did, it had a beginning balance of zero, and there were $925 in purchases that month. Right above that, you talk about IP activity. Yep. What is that? IP addresses would be um, so, or are associated with online activity uh, with an account. IP addresses are usually captured by financial institutions uh, when an account is accessed or um, basically accessed online. So as far as this account, the bank had none of that uh, IP or Internet activity prior to June of 2018? Correct. During that statement is when IP activity began for that account. In that same time frame, June of 2018, did you see a change in pattern as far as this account of Ms. Hernan's? Yes. What was that change? There was uh, more significant spending, and the spending was occurring in the Milwaukee area at places that were, um, I guess, that we could attribute through the investigation being associated with Jesse Krzyzewski. 
Okay. And ultimately, if we skip down to the end, by the time around Lynn's death, what is the ending balance of that account? Uh, the statement, uh, 926, 2018 through October 25th, 2018, the ending balance of this account or this credit card was $2,211.85. And if we look over to the left, that's over the credit limit for this particular account, correct? Correct. Was that uh, a pattern of Lynn's? No. Okay. If we uh, put up Exhibit 137, please. Okay. And what account are we talking about here for Ms. Hernan? Uh, this is her 4692 Capital One account. Okay. And again, we can see uh, under that dollar sign logo to the left, the credit limit on this account is $3,000, correct? Correct. What did you see as far as uh, Ms. Hernan's patterns early on in the records you got back? Uh, early on, like it was similar to the other card we just talked about. The, 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 it was used infrequently. There weren't high balances. There weren't uh, a ton of payments or uh, purchases. If there were purchases, they were paid off in a fairly fast uh, time frame. And then that was between May 13th of 17 through July 13th of 18. Okay, and again, that ending balance... Well, on, I'm sorry, but between August 14th and September 13th, 2018? I'm sorry, can you repeat? Sure. What is the ending balance you put on this slide uh, under August 14th to September 13th, 2018? The ending balance of this account was $2,985.47. Right. So not quite maxed out, but close. Correct. The okay. majority of the payments occurred beginning in the July 14th of 18 through August 13th of 18 statement. Okay. Also when the IP address, or the IP activity began. Okay. And again, was that area where you documented almost $3,000 worth of new purchases, was that a change in pattern from what you saw earlier on in Ms. Hernan's account? Yes. If we could go to Exhibit 138, please. <coughs> Detective, what is this... Uh, Account summary? It's the account summary for Lynn Hernan's 2932 Citibank account. And again, uh, you look like you put down a, an original credit limit of $7,000. Correct. And then at some point it went up to, she must have gotten a credit, sort of increase of the credit limit to $9,600. Correct. Again, early on as you went through the financial records, what kind of patterns did you see on behalf of Ms. Hernan? Uh, infrequent use, uh, balances were paid, there wasn't a high bal balance amount left uh, every month. Did there come a time where that pattern shifted to something else? Yes. When was that, roughly? Uh, that roughly began in June of 2018. The statement um, I believe it was June 9th of 2018 through July 9th of 2018. Okay. What about that time frame <coughs> showed you that there was a change in patterns here? Well, the beginning balance of this account at that statement period was zero. And at this point, during this statement period, there was balance transfers of $2,500 and $65 uh, into this account. And ultimately, if we skip down to that uh, third box in the middle of the screen, August 21st to September 21st, 2018, what did you document there? That there were new purchases, there was balance transfers again, and that the balance of this account was at $9,650.88, which was over the credit limit of this account. Okay, so again, around the time Ms. Hernan died, this card is maxed out as well. Correct. All right. Going on to Exhibit 139, please. We have a few slides on this exhibit to get through. On uh, slide one of 139, what kind of information have you included for us? Well, this is the JP Mor This is Lynn Hernan's JP Morgan Chase account, the 5639 account. Okay. This account, this account was opened in 
it was April 11th of 2016, and had a credit limit of $31,000. Okay. And this uh, area on the screen where there's a number of boxes, what is that depicting? That there was no activity on this account during the time frame of August, 20, of August of 2016 through March of 2017. Okay. And it looks at the bottom of the screen, by the time we get to May of 2017, there's a balance just under $400? Correct. If we go to slide two of Exhibit 139, please. Do you see anything that stands out to you as far as uh, Ms. Hernan's pattern of life? No. Uh, she maintains, she made a small purchase during this time frame, and by the statement period of October 11, 2017 through November 10th of 2017, there were no purchases and the balance had been paid down to zero again. So as you testified previously, she might carry a small balance but ultimately pays it off over a, a couple months. Correct. Okay, and if we go to slide three of 139, uh, what are we seeing here? Uh, this statement is one of the larger purchases that we had identified as being Lynn's Hernan, Lynn Hernan's purchase. It was just, this was the time frame between November 11th of 2017 and December 10th of 2017 where she made a large purchase of jewelry. Okay, and you learned that through your investigation that Ms. Hernan bought herself some pieces of jewelry in 2017? Correct. Okay, and what can we see happening? Obviously, that leads to a balance of $19,653. Over the next few statements, though, what did you see happen with that balance? Uh, she began to pay it down. She made a large payment from her BMO, the 7601 account, that $15,000 uh, payment. It ended up bringing down the balance by February 11th of eighteen through March 10th of 18, the ending balance was down to $4,272.08. Okay, if we continue on to slide four, please. Again, what do you see happening with that balance over the next few months? She continues to make small payments towards the balance of this account. Okay, and continuing to slide, slide five. What do we see now, though, in August 11th until September 10th of 2018? August 11th of 2018 through September 10th of 2018, that statement period, we see um, numerous uh, payments towards uh, payday or cash advance loans and balance transfers. Was uh, Ms. Hernan, in the earlier portions of these accounts that you reviewed, uh, did Ms. Hernan make a lot of balance transfers between her credit card accounts? I don't believe we saw any balance transfers in the early, onset, in the early investigation of her accounts. Did you see any uh, balances even on Ms. Hernan's credit cards nearing $14,000? No, the only time we saw the balance is when she made the purchase of the jewelry. And when we talk about balance transfers, can you just explain briefly in case anybody doesn't know what that is? A balance transfer would be you take the balance you have from one credit card and you put it on, you basically pay that amount, that balance off with a different credit card. Sometimes credit cards have Specials, I guess you'd consider it, where if you do a balance transfer, there'll be less interest, that kind of thing. But that's what a balance transfer is. You're basically paying off other loans or um, debts. Okay, and again, in that month of August to September of 2018, Ms. Hernan's balance went from roughly $2,000 all the way up to $30,000 plus. Correct. And what was the credit limit on that account? I believe it was $31,000. And in fact... Uh, in that following month, September 11th to October 10th, uh, did Ms. Hernan make any payments to that account? She did not. And did that fit her pattern of handling her finances? It did not. And ultimately, uh, at the time of her death or around that, this card is also maxed out? Correct. If we could go on to Exhibit 140, please. Let's do one more or two exhibits, and then we'll take our afternoon break since we started earlier today. Absolutely. Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. All right, Detective, Exhibit 140 before the break. This is for what account? This would be Lynn Hernan's Discover account, or Discover card. It was the 1222 account. And what can you tell us about early use uh, by Ms. Hernan as far as the records you got? So what was at the earliest part of the records you received? The earliest part of the records we received, uh, there, again, was infrequent use. If it had a balance, it was paid off. It, just ma it was maintained a zero balance regularly. Did that uh, 
habit or pattern change at some point? That pattern did change uh, in the bank statement uh, between August 27th of 2018 and September 27th of 2018. That statement period, um, there were numerous uh, balance transfers to this account. And again, were balance transfers uh, the normal for Ms. Hernan prior to the August to September of 2018 time? No, they were not. Okay, and again, the ending balance is very close, just under the, the credit limit of $5,000 for that account. Correct. All right. I think now is a good time to take a break. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we'll have our afternoon break uh, between 15 and 20 minutes. So I'll rise for the jury, please. Thank you, everyone. Uh, please be back here at 3.05. You may step down.
Be seated. Be seated. Or if you're just standing to stretch, that's fine too. <laughs> I wasn't sure if you heard me. And Pete, on your way back, if you would bring in our jurors, that would be great. Sure. We are back on the record. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. <laughs> I feel very blessed. Thank you. All right, uh, Attorney Sitzberger, when you are ready, you can continue with your examination. Thank you, Judge. And could we please bring up the Exhibit 141 for everyone? Okay, uh, Detective Plenis, we were sort of in the middle of your summary uh, exhibits of Ms. Hernan's financial accounts. Fair? Fair. So picking up, where are we at with Exhibit 141? Uh, this would be Lynn Hernan's Capital One, the 1662 uh, account. 
Okay. And what can you tell us about this account as far as its uh, early days, as far as the records you received? Uh, it was in frequent use, uh, like the other cards. Okay. And again, you've documented some purchases here uh, on slide one of Exhibit 141. What are those? Uh, so with this account, the purchases, I guess, the statement of October 22nd, 2017 through November 21st, 2017. Uh, there was a new purchase uh, associated with the jewelry that Ms. Hernan uh, purchased. Okay. Can you tell what uh, Ms. Hernan did with that balance then going forward? Um, looks like she, there was a, the purchase on November 17th, 2017. Uh, there was another purchase during the statement period of November 22nd, 2017 through December 21st of 17, there was an ending balance of $7,003.59. Uh, she didn't make any purchases following that. Uh, there was payments uh, were made in the December uh, statement between, so basically between December 22nd, 2017 and August 21st of 2018. During those statement periods, there were no new purchases. Uh, there were payments totaling $3,500 towards the balance and at the at that time, at the end of August, or mid-August, August 21st of 2018, the balance was $4,174.23. Okay, starting then in August, or the end of August, August 22nd, does the pattern of life evidence you've been describing change on Ms. Hernan's account? Yes. How so? Uh, during the statement period between August 22nd, 2018, and September 21st of 2018, uh, this account uh, obtains its 11 cash advances totaling $3,028 uh, and their new purchases totaling $2,925.45. Some of these purchases included uh, Hiller Ford and purchases that occurred in the Dells, Wisconsin Dells area. Why were purchases being made in the Wisconsin Dells uh, notable to you? Uh, Basically, through this investigation, I mean, it was determined that Lynn wasn't in the Dells during that time frame. Um, Lynn ended up, I believe, in the hospital around September 15th of 2018. Okay. And if we can go to slide two of Exhibit 141, please. Uh, what have you included here? This was the actual statement, uh, the, the statement form, or the statement that was associated with that time frame. Okay, and this would be taken directly from Exhibit 108, which we earlier moved into evidence? Correct. Okay, and uh, in fact, there's some page numbers at the bottom of this excerpt. Do you see that? Yes. What page number of the actual Capital One account is referenced in this slide? That would be page 63. Okay, and that references back to Exhibit 108? Yes. Okay, and you've circled some purchases on this exhibit? Correct. Why did you do that? Uh, because these are the purchases that were out of the ordinary uh, that had occurred in Lynn's account. Okay. And then at the bottom, you've included uh, some sort of message. What is that? So this was uh, an excerpt from the, found, the phone download uh, of, I believe it was Scott Craig's phone. And why did you include it here? Uh, because there's a message uh, from Scott to an individual uh, on August 30th of 2018. In the message from Scott, he stated that, and this is the message, I just wanted to tell you that Jesse and I are going to the Dells for the weekend in case you need to get a hold of me. And were you present in court when Mr. Craig testified that they did not take Lynn Hernan to the Dells with them? Correct. But this is Miss Lynn Hernan's account where there's expenses being paid in the Wisconsin Dells. Correct. And the dates of the purchases, does that match in time with the message from Mr. Craig's phone you've referenced? Yes. Okay. If we go to slide three, please. And then what is on this sort of end slide here that we're looking at? This uh, just goes to show that... Um, the previous balance, well, it turned into $9,875.49. Uh, we did indicate that there was the IP activity associated with this 
account began again in June of 18. So there's no IP activity up until that point. Okay. But Sorry, through, I cut you off. Go ahead. But going through the rest of the statements, uh, the statement September 22nd through 2018 through October 21st of 2018, uh, there's a cash advance on S September 22nd of 2018, leaving that account at uh, an ending balance of $10,220.30. Okay, so at least at that point, this uh, credit card account as well at the time of Lynn Hernan's death was, was over the maximum limit. Correct. And then at the very bottom, you have a term called charge-off balance. Do you see that? Yes. What does that mean? A charge-off balance is um, a credit account or a financial account that has a balance where they end up, I guess, not recouping the funds and they end up closing the account. They just get to charge off. They basically eat the cost. The balance at that point, uh, the last statement was March 23rd of 2019 to April 22nd of 2019. The charge off balance of that account when it's closed was $11,457.40. So that account wasn't paid. Okay, and I wanted to be clear about that. That's not meaning somebody finally paid that amount back down to zero. No. All right, if we could go to Exhibit 142, please. Detective, what are we looking at in Exhibit 142? Uh, 142 is Lynn Hernan's at National Bank of Omaha uh, credit account, that 3372. It was that Speedway gas card. Okay, and what were the um, early patterns you saw in that account as you reviewed it? It was, again, in, in, in infrequent use. Uh, the accounts, when they did have a balance, were paid to zero within a fairly short time, a couple months. Uh, we did indicate that that card between August of 2016 to November of 2018 was only used in the Sunset Avenue, or Sunset Gas Station and Summit Avenue Gas Station in Waukesha. Uh, both... I know Waukesha is written next to Summit Avenue. Is the Sunset Avenue location, do you know that to also be in Waukesha County? Yes. Okay. Uh, again, similar to other accounts, did that pattern you've just described change at some point? Yes. And in what time frame did it change? Um, the statement period, I have the statement due date, so we used the due date, which would be the end date of the statement, which was 11-14 uh, of 18. Now, Detective, let me stop you. That's well after Ms. Hernan died, correct? Correct. So what did you see with the statement ending 11-14-18? Well, it, it notated the transactions that occurred uh, in late September, early October okay. of 2018. And what were some of those transactions? Uh, there was uh, transactions at Speedway in West Dallas um, on the 23rd of September, the 24th of September, the 25th of September, the 27th of September, and also on October 1st, there was uh, a transaction at the Speedway in West Dallas. Okay. There were cash advances, and these were the new purchases. Okay. Also. Again, the dates of September 23rd through September 27th of 2018. Where have you learned Lynn Hernan was? Lynn Hernan was in the hospital uh, between September 15th of 2018 and September 28th of 2018. Not at the West Dallas Speedway gas station? No. Okay. And then uh, under where you've labeled it statement due 12 14 18, what information have you included there? There was a, a purchase with that card on October 22nd, or in between, in the statement period of October 22nd through November 14th of 2018, there was purchases of $814.87. And those were all in the West Dallas and Franklin Speedways. And obviously those are all after Lynn Hernan had passed away. And again, uh, around the time of Ms. Hernan's death then, is this account uh, sort of getting near that credit limit? Uh, yes. Okay. Moving on to Exhibit 143, please. All right, Detective, as this comes up on our full screen, what are we looking at here? This would be the this would be Lynn Hernan's American Express account. It was the one zero zero seven account. Okay. And what have you documented as far as early patterns you saw on this account? As the rest of her cards, it was infrequent. Balances were low. Payments were made. 
And in fact, you have a number of boxes next to each other in the middle of the slide. What is that uh, document? So during that time frame, there were no statements between November 17, uh, November of 2017 to July of 2018. There were no statements, which is indicative of no account on the activity, or no activity on the account. Okay. And did that pattern of keeping low balance or infrequent use, did that change eventually? It did. When did it change? Uh, it changed um, in... in um, late August of 2018. And how did it change? Uh, there was a new purchase with this card uh, on August 28th of 2018, totaling $3,682.79 through Square. Okay. Do you know what that is? Uh, usually is Square, I guess, can be like a mobile payment where like you slide a card or some type of electronic payment. And you've indicated uh, some sort of name under that square payment? Yeah, it was indicated as locks by Lynn. And earlier you stated one of Ms. Hernan's accounts was like a business account of some sort with that same name, correct? Correct. That was the associated bank account. Did you search through that uh, financial record to see if this purchase came from there or this uh, same amount corresponded with that account? Yes. Did you find anything? Didn't find anything. Were you able to ultimately see where this new purchase or whatever this 3682, where it came from? No. Okay. Regardless, though, in, in late September of 2018, what is the ending balance on Ms. Hernan's account? Uh, $3,823.75. Again, very close to the $4,000 credit limit? Correct. Okay. Could we move on to Exhibit 145, please? All right, and Detective, what account are we looking at here on behalf of Ms. Hernan? Uh, this was Ms. Hernan's uh, Kohl's account, a 9110 account. Okay, and it looks like you've documented some early purchase history on this card. Correct. Can you just describe those generally? Uh, there, were, there were purchases made uh, between August of 16 through December of 16. There was three purchases totaling $270.98. Um, in the statement between... Uh, December 9th of 16 through January 8th of 17, there was one purchase totaling $86.49. She made a payment during that time. The ending balance was $232.39 in January of 2017. And if we skip down to the bottom entry between March 9th and April 8th of 2017, what uh, had become of the balance by then? Uh, Ms. Hearn, there were payments made to this account, and at that point, uh, at the end of April, or April 8th of 17, the ending balance was zero. Okay. If we could continue on to slide two of Exhibit 145, please. Uh, what are we seeing as we continue on this uh, exhibit? Uh, there were no statements between April 9th of 17 through October 8th of 17, um, which would indicate no activity. Uh, there was a purchase on October 6th of 17 for $154.14. Um, during the statement period between October 9th of 17 through November 7th of, 19, of 17, there were uh, two purchases, uh, both in Waukesha. There was also a return uh, of some items and also a payment, a uh, small payment. The ending balance in November as of November 7th of 17, was $163.09. And again, if we skip down to that bottom entry, by January 8th of 2018, what has become of that balance? Uh, the balance is down to $53.88. And so are these first two slides on Ms. Hernan's Kohl's account, are they pretty indicative of what you've been talking about, where she might uh, accrue a couple hundred dollars on credit cards but then slowly pay them down? Yes. Okay, and if we continue to slide three, please. Uh, again, what are we seeing here in the early portion of 2018? That there were no purchases and that the balance ended up, it was at zero. Okay, and uh, does that remain true until the statement ending October 8th of 2018? It remains true until the statement ending, yes, October 8th of 18. Okay, within that statement that ends October 8th, did you see anything uh, of note in your investigation in this case? Yes. What was that? On October 3rd of 
of 2018, there was an online purchase totaling $1,303.02. Okay, and Ms. Hernan's credit limit on that account was what? Uh, $1,500. And of course, October 3rd, 2018 is a significant date in this case, correct? Uh, correct. It, it is the day that Lynn Hernan died. Okay. And then beyond that, these statements that you've sort of grouped together between October 9th of 2018 through May of 2019, why did you note those? Um, because there was one other purchase after Lynn Hernan died. On, it was documented on November 1st of 2018 um, for $25.47. There were no other payments received on the account accrued interest fees and late fees. And so ultimately, in this case, after Ms. Hernan dies, her card becomes maxed out. Correct. Can we please move on to Exhibit 146? What are we looking at here, Detective? This would be Lynn Hernan's Menards card. Okay. The 7224 account. Okay. And again, at the top, you've sort of grouped a, a great many statements together in that top entry? Yes. What What was the purpose of that? Because there were in-store transactions during that time, but they were all out in, in the Waukesha area. There was a store indicated on Blue Mountain Road and then also on Capitol Drive in Pewaukee. Okay. At some point, uh, was there a purchase in October of 2018 that you took note of? There was. There was a purchase on October 1st of 2018. And what was that for? Uh, it was an online purchase for three um, yes, an, an entire bedroom sets totaling $3,134.31. And this is uh, Ms. Lynn Hernan's Menards card, correct? Correct. Did the purchase on October 1st, 2018, uh, did it show like a delivery address for those bedroom sets? It did. Whose delivery address was listed? Uh, it would have been Jessie's uh, address in West Dallas where she was living with Scott Craig. And again, uh, were you present in court when Mr. Craig testified to those bedroom sets kind of arriving unexpectedly in early October? Yes. And then, uh, again, what's that last entry on Exhibit 146? Uh, there was, on October 11th of 2018, there was, um, a re I guess there was a return associated with a box, a box spring that was a part of that original bedroom set that was ordered on October 1st. Okay, and fair to say on October 11th, 2018, Ms. Lynn Hernan was not making that return? No, she was not. Okay. Moving to Exhibit 147. Detective Plenis, what are we looking at uh, with this account? This is the J.C. Penney's... Uh, 8961 account. Did you have a chance to look at early patterns of behavior on this account? Uh, no. Why not? Because it wasn't opened until October 3rd of 2018. And in fact, if we go to slide two of this, uh, is this uh, slide taken directly from Exhibit 114, the actual financial documents you received from Synchrony Bank, J.C. Penney's? Yes. And you have something highlighted and circled at the bottom of the screen. What is that? Uh, that was the uh, purchase on October 3rd of 2018. Okay. And it says approved there. Does it give a time? It says 10.39.59. Okay. Would that be approximately 10.40 in the morning? Approximately. And again, that's on the significant date of October 3rd, 2018. Correct. And in fact, was this card opened that same day? Yes. Can you tell by this screen uh, how this card was applied for or opened? Um, well, it would have been opened online because there's an IP address that is associated. Okay. And again... Uh, from what you know and what you learned in your investigation in this case, did Ms. Hernan have the ability while at her house to access the Internet? From what I'm told, no. Okay. And if we could go to slide three, please. What are we looking at uh, in slide three for that account that was opened on October 3rd, 2018? 
those were the transactions or the queries that they provided in the records, uh, just showing that there were attempts to purchase, I guess the attempts to make purchases on October 3rd, 2018. Okay, and so for example, the third row and fourth row down appear to be identical transaction reports, fair? Fair. And you see the credit limit uh, available on that account? Yes. What is it? It was $200. And that third and fourth line down, what was the attempted purchase price? Uh, $446.94. Can you tell from this whether that was a successful transaction or whether it was denied? Um, I, can't, I can't tell if it was denied, but it, it appears that it was because the available credit remains the same until the uh, bottom two lines. Okay. And uh, that authorization time column next to the transaction date, does that tell you anything about when these transactions were either attempted or made? Yes. And so there was a, a number of attempts to purchase things with this new JCPenney card, correct? Correct. All on the day Lynn Hernan died? Correct. We can take that exhibit down, please. If we could pull up uh, Exhibit 115, which is in evidence, please. Sorry to surprise you, Mr. Vulcanier. And if we could go to page 13 of Exhibit 115. And, oh boy, that is small up there. Thank you, Mr. Vulcanier, for zooming in. And if we scroll down on page 13, uh, and Detective Plentis, do you know what account, <clears throat> sorry, Exhibit 115 is referencing? It was a synchrony account. Um, I can't recall the account number off the top of my head. If we scroll back up to the top of <coughs> page 13, yes. four, right, right yep. where Mr. Walkner has it. Four, two, four. The 4248 account. And who's the account holder on that? Lynn Hernan. And if we can just scroll back up, right there is great. Do you see any purchases on this account that you took note of? Yes. And uh, why did you take note of this particular purchase? Because this statement identified a transaction date of, or a transaction. The transaction date was listed as October 9th of 2018 and it showed a posting date of October 10th of 2018, which was after Lynn Hernan had died uh, for an ABT Electronics in Glenville, Illinois. And if we could take down the screen, please, for a second. Could you please pull up 148? Thank you. Detective, as this is coming up, uh, related to that purchase you just mentioned, did you uh, try to do some investigation into what that purchase was? Yes. Were you ultimately able to get an invoice for that purchase? Yes. And that was for that company in Illinois, you said? Correct. All right, and like you've done with other financial records, did you put sort of a, a summary PowerPoint together related to that Synchrony Bank account? Yes. And is that uh, depicted in front of you in Exhibit 148? It is. Okay, Your Honor, I'd move Exhibit 148 into evidence at this point and ask to publish. No objection. Exhibit 148 is received. Permission to publish granted. Thank you. All right, and so just very quickly on slide one of 148, what information did you include here? The same information that we included or that we included in the other summary exhibits is this was Lynn Hernan's Synchrony Bank 4248 account. It's later changed to a different uh, account number, but we, we went with the 4248. Okay. Um, there was a credit limit of $2,000, and there was no activity between June 29th of 16 till October 8th of 2018. So, though Ms. Hernan might have had this credit card, from your review, she never used it, at least not since June 29th of 16. Correct. And... You talked about that October, I'm sorry, is it October 8th or October 9th purchase? Well, it's, it, there's a difference in, I guess, there's a transaction date and a post date. Okay. 
and then obtaining the receipt, there was an additional date. Understood. Okay. Let's go. Well, before we do, if eventually that October 8th or October 9th purchase, either way, it's after Lynn Hernan's died, correct? In the bank statement, correct, yes. And that has caused that account, too, to be over the maximum limit? Correct. All right. Could we go to slide two of that exhibit, please? What are we looking at here? This is the uh, statement from the 4248 account. Okay. And then if we go to slide three, you said you were ultimately able to get an invoice from this company in Illinois, correct? Correct. Is that what we're seeing in slide three of exhibit 148? Yes, it is. And uh, you have obviously a, a highlighted feature there up at the top left corner. Why is that? Because that was the date that the... I guess the order was necessarily placed. Okay, so we have an October 3rd purchase date, and then it processes later on a few days later. Correct. Okay, but this purchase, it looks like, is being made on the day Lynn died at 9.41 a.m. Correct. And uh, you have a blue circle there as well. Why do you have that circle? Because that was the information that this ABT Electronics gave as to where the item was going to be shipped. And again, can you tell if this was an online order or something different? Um, I don't know if I could t tell if it was online. Okay. We can certainly see that it's billed to Ms. Hernan's account, as you've testified. Correct. But to be shipped to Ms. Krzyzewski. Correct. And what address did she give there on that uh, invoice? That was the 10562 West Cortez Circle, apartment 26 in Franklin, Wisconsin. That is not the residence she shared with Scott Craig, is it? No. Do you know whose residence that is? I believe that is Jennifer Flowers' residence. And do you see the items that were purchased that totaled that $1,992 figure? Yes. What were those items? Uh, it looks like a 75-inch TV, um, a TV, like a, a tilt mount. Uh, I believe it was an Apple Watch Series 3. Thank you. That uh, exhibit can come down. Moving back to Exhibit 103 briefly, that is, you said, Miss Hernan's Citibank account ending 2932? Correct. Again, like we talked about with Miss Krzyzewski's Wells Fargo accounts, uh, sometimes in addition to the financial records like we've been talking about all day today, you get... Uh, Recordings and communications with banks. Yes, if they retain them, yes, we can hopefully get them. Okay. In the documents your department received from Citibank, did you receive any such recordings? Uh, yes. Do you recall approximately what date those recordings were from? I believe there was a June of 18 and an August of 18. Okay. Did you document the, the dates and times of these calls in any police reports, to your knowledge? Yes. If I showed you that police report, would it refresh your recollection? Yes. All right, Your Honor, I, what exhibit number are we on? I'm sorry. I believe we're on 223. I'll have this uh, report marked, and I would ask to take down the screen uh, for the courtroom and just show the witness. Go ahead. And I don't have a hard copy, but I can tell. I'm sorry, what supplement did I tell? 166. Is supplement 166 council. That's what we're working on says right now. So this is the supplement report. I'll bring up a hard copy. Yes, Showing Attorney Nebreski on my computer, uh, Supplement 166. It's on all of our screens. Oh. Well, there you go. Thank you, Judge. You're welcome. Detective, is that on your screen? Yes. All right. Can you uh, just read through the first few paragraphs and tell me uh, when you're finished reading it?
Okay. Have you had a chance to review that? Yes. And can we take that down from the witness then, please? Thank you. Does reading uh, supplement number 166 refresh your recollection as to the dates and times of these calls from Citibank? Yes, there were two calls on August, I believe it was, I'm sorry, 27th, 2018. Okay. And do you recall uh, either of the specific times? Uh, it was in the afternoon around 2 p.m. Okay. How many calls did you document? There were two. Okay. And again, have you listened to those in your investigation? During the investigation, yes. Okay. Do you believe you can recognize at least one of the voices in those recordings? Yes. And whose voice did you recognize as you reviewed them in your investigation? Uh, Jesse Krzyzewski's voice. And again, were these recordings received in response to your subpoena along with that certificate of authentication prepared by Citibank? Yes. Okay. Could we please play Exhibit 104 first and then 105? For the record, this is a two minute and nine second file. Can we play all of it or just a portion of it initially? I was going to play the whole thing, but we can properly, I should play five or ten seconds of it first. All right, go Thank ahead. Calling, uh, City. My name is Melanie. Can I have your name as it appears on your card? Lynn A. Hernan. Okay. There. All right, we've paused it at ten seconds. Detective, do you recognize that recording? Yes. Did you recognize at least one of the voices in that recording? Yes. And whose voice was it? I believe that's Jesse Krzyzewski's voice. You know, at this point, I'd move Exhibit 104 into evidence and ask to publish the entire two minutes and nine seconds. No objection. Exhibit 104 is received. Permission to publish is granted. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, you're about to hear an audio recording. Recordings are proper evidence, and you may consider them just as any other evidence. Listen carefully. Some parts may be hard to understand. Thank you, Ms. Hernan. Give me just a moment here while I pull up your account. Okay, I want to let you know City has the ability to record and store your voice print and use it for verification. Do you give us consent to do this? Sure. Okay. Okay, and how can I help you today, ma'am? I don't use the online very often. I'm having problems logging in. Okay. Let me see here. Basically, there's like a temporary block. I was on it, and I normally use my mobile app, and I was trying to go online. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll refresh that for you. That's not uh, blocked anymore. So Sure. Yeah, if you would like to try it again. Um, okay, thank you so much. Well, you're welcome. Um, I would like to let you know you have a 0% um, a interest rate. I can add to your account until 3-1-2019. If you would, it doesn't cost you any extra, and it's on your foregoing um, purchases from today. Oh, sure. Okay. All right. So let me get that added on to you. The promotional rate of zero percent is valid until three one twenty nineteen on your new purchases. After the promotional period, any unpaid promotional balance from this offer will be charged the standard purchase APR, currently fourteen point seven four percent. The APR will vary with the market base of the prime rate. And this offer will be activated. This offer will be activated immediately on your account. Only eligible purchases made between today and the offer end date will receive this promotional rate. Okay. Thank you so much. Well, you are so welcome. And um, you have a couple more things here if you want me to go over them with you. Um, no, that's a, that's okay. perfect. Don't okay. worry about it. But thank okay. you. Thank you, Maybe Have a wonderful day. All right. Bye -bye. You too. Okay, and if we can uh, start playing Exhibit 105, just again, the first five to ten seconds, please, Mr. Volkner. Welcome to City Online Support. My name is Sumit. How can I help you today? Yes, I'm calling. I use, use my mobile online app, um, and I'm trying to go. Oh, I'm 
sorry. Thank you. Yes, we paused it at 13 seconds. Uh, Detective, did you have a chance to listen to that brief clip? Yes. Do you recognize what Exhibit 105 is? Yes. What is it? It's the second call to Citibank. And did you recognize at least one of the voices in that small clip? Yes. And whose voice was it? Jesse Krzyzewski's. Your Honor, at this point, I move Exhibit 105 in. This is a 6 minute and 54 second clip. I ask to play the remainder of it. No objection. Exhibit 105 is received permission to publish granted. Again, this is a recording. I won't read the instruction again. You just heard it. Under the regular online app, and I am not sure what I had originally set my three security questions up under. Um, I know one of them for sure. I can't remember the other two, and I'm trying to log on. I'm having an issue with them. Oh, I'm sorry to hear about this. Let me just check what I can best do, do here for you. And uh, don't you worry, we'll definitely fix this problem before we end this call. So sure. could, you, could you please verify your complete name exactly as it appears on your preferred MasterCard? I'm sorry. Lynn A. Hernan. Thank you, Ms. Hernan. Do you have your card handy? I do. Could you please verify the last row of the card number? 2932. Thank you. And what is the three numbers at the back of this card? 201. Thank you. Could you please verify your best friend's last name starts with letter F as in father? Power. Thank you. Thank you so much for the verification. I'm in your account now. And let me tell you one important thing here. Uh, if you don't uh, remember the answers to these security questions, then in that case, we'll verify your identity in a different way uh, by sending a one-time identification code on your number. And uh, sure. we can only send the code on the number that is registered under your name. So could you please help me with, the, uh, with your cell phone number? 262. Four two one five two nine zero. Thank you. And is that number registered under your name? No, it is not. Because that's the only way by which we can identify, uh, verify your identity. And if that number is not registered under your name, then in that case, the last option. Let me let me give a try. Uh, let me delete what all the security. I'm so sorry, but uh, there are only three options. We can give a call, sure. text, and the third is verify me another way. And if you're selecting verify me another way, then uh, you need to answer in, uh, in the security question, which you don't remember the answers to that. So uh, let me uh, give a try. Uh, I'm deleting this, all the security questions. And uh, if something is missing, then you might get this option to receive a text at this time. So. Sure. I'm giving a try. I mean, I'm calling from the number right now. Can you receive any text uh, at the same time? I'm not sure. I've never tried it before. Oh, uh, is that a cell phone or a home phone? Cell. No. Cell phone. Then you can receive that. Let me just check that. Okay. I'm going to delete the security questions. It's almost done. Oh, your account is blocked permanently, Do not, not see. Because that's what I was just under. <laughs> yes, I can see here. Because you tried to answer these security questions, if I'm not wrong, that more than five times. Okay. Yeah, so that's the reason why your account is locked. So I have unlocked your account. Let's give another try. And this time, I sure. request you to please enter your user ID and password, both the things manually, and then try to log in. Okay. Do you want me to do that while you're on the phone? Yes, please uh, try it while I'm here on the phone with you. Sure. Okay, give me yeah. one moment. Yeah, because that's the only way by which I can figure out what's, what's the exact problem.
Okay. So if I hang up with you, can I just do the call me then? I'm so sorry for that, ma'am, but there is no option by which I can call you uh, back on the same number. On my phone, it's giving me that option. Is it giving you the option to call me? Yeah. Oh, that's great then. Uh, then it's fine. You, you'll you get a call on this number, and after that, uh, in that call, you'll get a, a one-time identification code. Once you verify that code, then you'll be able to create a new password or log into your account. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. So does it answer all your questions today? Yes. I'm going to make sure I write them down this time. <laughs> sure. Now, uh, like, you just need to request for a call, and once you get a call, please uh, write down that code which you'll get in the call, and once you verify that code, it yes. will work perfectly fine, right? You'll not face this kind of problem Thank again you. in the future. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, do you have any other question? No, that is all. Have a good day. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for calling, City. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye and take care. All right, Detective Plenis, you heard those two phone calls? Yes. What was it about those two calls that you took note of in your investigation? Uh, there were <clears throat> there was references to the 5290 phone number uh, when, she, when it was provided to the representative from City. Um, that was the number that was on the Marcus Goldman Sachs loan. That was a number that we were never able to attribute to Lynn Hernan, and during the calls, uh, Ms. Krzyzewski is attempting to gain access to the account because she's locked out. And that, again, is Ms. Hernan's account? Correct. If we could bring up for the witness exhibit 111, please. <laughs> And do you have that on your screen, Detective? Exhibit 111, yes. Okay. And do you recognize what Exhibit 111 is? 111 is the um, certification of records for Associated Bank for Lynn Hernan's uh, Locks by Lynn account. Okay. And you've referenced this before, but I don't think we've ever gone through this exhibit. And so is this a fair and accurate depiction of the records you received from Associated Bank? Yes. All right. Your Honor, move Exhibit 111 into evidence and ask to publish. No objection. Exhibit 111 is received permission to publish. Granted. And, Detective, I, I really just want to pull up page 4, for example. And I'll wait till everybody has it up on their screen. Gone. <laughs> Seems to be later in the day. It doesn't <coughs> like this very much. Okay. Great. All right, Detective, we're not going to get all into another financial account this late in the day, but would you say your review of this account was fairly similar to the other accounts of Ms. Hernan that you've testified to at length this afternoon? Yes. Okay. One thing I wanted to clear up. Have you been in court when a few times it's been stated that Ms. Hernan was either on food stamps or receiving benefits or something like that? Yes. In your entire review of all the accounts we've looked at of Ms. Hernan's, did you ever find anything related to food stamps? 
I, I didn't. Sometimes um, we hear things about quest cards and things like that, which are similar or, the, or maybe just a different way to say it. Did you find anything like that related to a quest card? I didn't. Did you find any accounts that were related to government assistance in any kind? Government assistance, no. Okay. And if we look at, specifically at page four, this is just the start of a random monthly statement of this account. Would you agree? Yes. Do you see under uh, deposits uh, and other additions what kind of income is coming in? Uh, there's a check, uh, Social Security check. Okay. And is that pretty consistent throughout this account, that Social Security income? Yes. I think you stated earlier that Ms. Hernan was retired as of 2017, 2018? This is my understanding, yes. Anything unusual about a retired person getting Social Security income? No. Okay, and that's vastly different from any food stamps or things of that nature that's been referenced? Yes. Okay, just wanted to clear that up. Thank you. We can bring that exhibit down. And now I'm moving on to my last big area to cover with you, Detective Plenis. Um, and if we could pull up Exhibit 65, please, Mr. Volkmeer, as well as Exhibit 157. Are these new? 157 is. Uh, 65 is already Correct. in. Correct. You said 167? 157. Sorry. That's okay. Detective, well, this is coming up. Um, you were in court when Anthony Poza testified yesterday? Uh, yes. And he referenced a number of receipts he had been given related to the probate case? Uh, yes, sir. Unfortunately, I was here. Yes, I do recall that. As the lucky detective who was appointed to review all these financial accounts, did you uh, have to take further action with those receipts? Yes. What kind of action did you take? I uh, tried to verify the payments associated with the receipts and the accounts that are documented in the receipts that were obtained from Anthony Poza. Okay, and, and part of that, would that have been based off a review of that estate account that came into evidence yesterday in Exhibit 123? Yes. And then you uh, presumably would have looked at all of the receipts that Mr. Poza was given? Yes. And just to be clear, how did you get a hold of those receipts? I ended up getting them from Anthony. Uh, okay. after I started working on this case. Okay, and with that background, as you have with a number of the financial uh, accounts we've been looking at today, did you put together sort of a summary of your efforts in looking at those receipts? Yeah. Is that what Exhibit 157 is? It is. And um, does that appear to be a fair and accurate depiction of the summary account you put together? Yes. Okay. Uh, again, not to short, you had Mr. Valkanier's help, correct? Correct. Okay. And I would move Exhibit 157 into evidence and ask to publish. No objection. 157 is received, permission to publish, granted. Thank you. And actually, if we could start with Exhibit 65, Mr. Valkanier, thank you. Um, Detective Plenis, when you put Exhibit 157 together, um, did you try to go sort of in the same order as the documents came to you as they're presented in, in Exhibit 65? Yes. Okay. And so if we were to go through, we don't have to, but if we were to go through all 52 pages of Exhibit 65, it would start with this Credit One Bank uh, alleged payment, correct? Correct. All right. Let's flip back over to 157, please, Mr. Volkner. And in fact, is the... Is, is that the same uh, sort of first sheet we saw in Exhibit 65? Yes. You've just made some electronic markings on it, correct? Correct. What did you learn when trying to verify this Credit One payment? I learned that I couldn't find the payment documented in here. What do you mean? Uh, that it was, there was no account 1822... Uh, associated with Lynn, where that payment is documented on November 10th of 2018. We've gone through a number of Ms. Hernan's financial accounts, Detective Plan. You're saying none of them ended in 1822? No. 
Did you reach out to Credit One Bank to try and say you guys must have missed an account or something like that? I believe we have we have it was she uh, Credit Bank Credit One Bank was subpoenaed for any accounts associated with Lynn Hernan throughout this investigation. Okay, let's go to slide two, please. And in fact, uh, is this your response from reaching out to Credit One in that fashion? This was a response that yes, the sheriff's department received uh, in the beginning of this investigation. And so on the left-hand side, what are we looking at there? The left-hand side is just uh, identifying that there was a subpoena served to Credit One Bank. Um, it indicates that the subpoena required documentation within the specific time frame of August 1st of 2016 through the present, which I can't exactly recall uh, when exactly that subpoena was sent. Um, However, I don't believe this investigation necessarily began until about 2019 in the financial aspect of it. Um, and they would, that's what's on the left. Okay, what's on the right? On the right, um, it states this is the response from Credit One Bank that Credit One did not locate any account records in the names and the dates of births of Lynn Hernan or Jennifer Flower. Okay, so if we go back to slide one for a second, this whole receipt that was given to Anthony that states it was paid on 11 10 18 over the phone, that's just not true. Correct. Okay. Let's skip ahead to slide three, please. And here we're talking about sort of the next receipt in Exhibit 65 uh, referencing a Wells Fargo payment. Correct. What have you noted in slide three of, of your summary exhibit? The summary exhibit and the, rec uh, the receipt that I received... Um, shows the Wells Fargo credit card services at the top. It says post office. It should say box, but it says docs with a D. Um, it indicates that this receipt was received or letter was received on November 13th of 2018. And it's a reference to a Wells Fargo account um, ending in 2931. Did you find any accounts belonging to Lynn Hernan at Wells Fargo at all? The only account that had anything to do with Lynn Hernan was the 8149 account of Jesse Krzyzewski that she was added to in March, on March 8th of 2018. And that account, as we discussed earlier, was closed well before October 31st of 2018? Correct. And in fact, uh, when this says in that handwritten note that it was paid October 31st of 2018, was the estate account, that is Exhibit 123 in this case, the estate account... <laughs> of Lynn Hernan. Had that been opened yet as of October 31st, 2018? I don't believe so. Okay. And if we go to slide four. Now we're um, moving into the third receipt that Anthony Posa was given. Is that correct? Yes. And what account of Lynn's does this allegedly have to deal with? Uh, this would have been the Menards, uh, Menards card. Okay, and uh, what information have you highlighted from the receipt Mr. Posa was given? Well, it shows an amount, a payment amount of 2077 I believe it was 2775 and 35 cents, but it shows it was a, the transaction type was a withdrawal. Okay. Um, and it shows that it was a withdrawal from the Tri-City National Bank on November 16th of 2018. Okay, and that Tri-City Bank account that's referenced, that's the estate account that came in yesterday as Exhibit 123? Correct. In the bottom right corner, did you look at that account for this time frame when this payment was allegedly made? Yes. And did you see any withdrawals or outgoing money that matched that total that Mr. Posa was told about? No. Okay, so that receipt for Ms. Hernan's Menards cards was also not true? Correct. Okay, let's move to the next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. Here you've included some more information about why that receipt to Mr. Posa was not true. Can you explain that? Uh, it, re it shows that um, the total that would have, I guess, been paid would have been, the total of the Menards card at that point was $3,134.31. And, in fact, to your knowledge, was that $3,134, was that ever paid off to that Menards card? No. Okay. Let's move to the next slide. 
which is slide six. Uh, here we're talking about what appears to be a Capital One account payment. Correct. And does it reference a, uh, an account number for Capital One? Yes, it shows a 1662. Okay. And what was uh, purportedly paid to that account? Um, reportedly a payment of $3,866.49. Now, uh, a Capital One account ending 1662 is a legitimate account of Ms. Hearn's, correct? Correct. We've gone through that this afternoon? Yes. And so if we go to the next slide, did you pull up documents related to that account? Yes. And why do we have these three entries on the next slide? These are just to show the payments. These are payments, um, I guess, well, it's starting with the September 22nd of 2018 through October 21st of 2018. The subsequent... Um, the subsequent statement of October 22nd, 2018 through November 21st of 2018, and then shows the final, uh, the final statement received at the time the account was charged off between February 23rd of 2019 and March 22nd of 2019. Okay, so in fact, no payments of any kind were made on or even around October 17th, 2018. Correct. And again, you described that term, <coughs> sorry, charged off before... And what does that mean again? That was where the bank ends up, they, they charge off the account, they close the account, and the balance is what it is, and they haven't received payment. Okay, so that fourth receipt given to Mr. Poza, also fake. Correct. Moving on to the fifth receipt given to Mr. Poza, what is this for? Uh, this was a receipt for a Capital One uh, 8803 account, for, it says for Lynn. Um, and it says that there was a payment made of $13,663.12. Does it say, uh, did Ms. Krzyzewski indicate to Mr. Poza when she paid that? Uh, it says it was paid online November 20th of 2018. Again, uh, Capital One account ending 8803 was an account of Ms. Hernan's? Correct. Okay, so if we go to the next slide, you had the ability to verify that payment? Yes. Pretty simple to see if a payment was made or not, correct? Correct. And what did you find? There was no payment made. And in fact, um, you've included the, the summary between February and March of 2019. Why did you do that? Because the that was the last statement that Capital One provided before they charged off the count. It shows a previous balance at the time it's charged off. Okay, and again, that means that nobody paid it. Correct. Capital One just kind of ate that money. Correct. Okay, so that fifth receipt given to Mr. Poza, also not true. Correct. So going to the sixth one, um, and this is not the next slide, we'll get there, you can keep it up, but the sixth receipt to Mr. Poza, if we were to go back to <coughs> Exhibit 65, had to do with a collections agency to Chase Bank. Do you recall that? Uh, yes. And do you recall whether you were able to verify if that was a legitimate payment? Yes. Again, setting aside... Who necessarily accrued that credit card debt? That was a true payment to Chase Bank. Correct. Okay. And so the seventh receipt given to Mr. Poza, again, if we were to go back to Exhibit 65, was from Pewaukee Ambulance for $96.92. Do you remember that? I do. And were you able to verify whether that was true? Yes. That was, was it? That was a true payment from the account or from the estate account. Okay. Likewise, the eighth receipt uh, of those 52 pages in Exhibit 65 was a pro health care bill for $1,816.24. Uh, do you recall that? Yes. And do you recall trying to verify that? I did. Were you able to verify it was true or not? It was true. Okay. So now going back to the ninth receipt, again, trying to go in order of Exhibit 65, do you remember the, the VET bill? Yes. And in fact, Ms. Kirby came in and testified yesterday, correct? Correct. You were the detective that went out and spoke with Ms. Kirby? Yes. And were you able to get uh, the actual invoice from Lynn Hernan's cat being put down? Yes. And what are we looking at on the left in slide 10 of Exhibit 157? That is the receipt that was turned over to Anthony Poza. And if we pop up on the right, what are we looking at there? That is the actual receipt uh, I received from VCA. 
associated with the euthanasia of the cat. Okay. So the left one was given to Mr. Poza that he gave to you in that packet. Correct. The one on the right is the real one you got from Ms. Kirby. Correct. And Ms. Kirby went through all the differences yesterday, so we can kind of quickly... Okay. And going to the next slide, please. Uh, what is this 10th receipt that was given to Mr. Poza? What is this in reference to? This is a receipt... Uh, for it says Coles, Lynn Hernan, or it says L Hernan, it's Coles, uh, debit, credit card debit for $429.61. Looks like it's a, it's a receipt that it's paying Lynn Hernan's Coles card from the Tri City estate account. Okay, again, you had access to both Miss Hernan's Coles card account, right? Yes. As well as the estate account? Yes. Were you able to verify this payment ever being made? I wasn't able to verify that the payment was made. Okay, if we can go to the next slide, in fact. Uh, what did you include here? This is the uh, account. Um, this is the Lynn Hernan's and Cole's account. Uh, the date of the statement is 10-9 of 18 through 11-7 of, of 18. Uh, it shows the balance, and it shows that during that time frame, no payments were made. And, in fact, there's a late fee accruing, it looks like. Late fee and interest. Okay. So that uh, tenth receipt given to Mr. Poza, also not true? Correct. Moving on to the eleventh receipt, what is uh, this in reference to? This is a receipt indicating that a payment was made to uh, First Bank Card. It's a Speedway. Um, it identifies a 3372 uh, account, uh, which I believe would be the First Bank of Omaha Speedway card associated with Lynn Hernan shows that a payment of $262.14 have been posted to the uh, account on November 20th of 2018. Again, Ms. Hernan's Speedway account is something you were able to look through that we've talked about today. Correct. Were you able to verify this payment? Uh, no. Could we go to the next slide, please? What is uh, this slide number 14 showing us, Detective? This is the statement from uh, this the Speedway First Bank card. Um, the dates, uh, I believe, was well, a statement closing date of December 18th of 2018. Any uh, payments that match the invoice that Ms. Kraszewski gave to Mr. Pozo? No. And in fact, is the balance down to zero at all by chance? No, the balance is at. $3,513.81. Again, so that receipt as it relates to the Speedway card, also not true. Correct. If we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, Detective, what is it we're looking at uh, on the left side of the screen there? That's the receipt from Anthony Poza, or that Anthony Poza received. Uh, it indicates that it's a city, it, it's Portraying a Citibank uh, payment confirmation, I believe the account was 5382, if I remember correctly. Yeah, 5382. That shows that there was a payment made um, of $7,116.89. And there's obviously the, the posted on there, or the, the scan copy shows it says it was paid online on April 2nd of 2019. Okay, and again, we talked some, what about Ms. Hernan's Citibank account, correct? Correct. I don't remember it ending in 5382. Is that my error or something different? No, it, it didn't end in 5382. It ended in 2932. Okay, if we go to the next slide, um, what, what is this we're looking at? This was a subpoena for any records that Citibank might have uh, for any other accounts associated with Lynn Hernan. Okay, and what made you send off that sort of additional subpoena with a specific account number or something like that? To verify any other accounts that were in the receipts that were obtained from Anthony, by Anthony, from Anthony Poza. Okay, and what did Citibank tell you in response? That there weren't any okay. other ones. Okay, and going on to the next slide, please. Uh, 17. What are we looking at on slide 17? This is 
on the left is the serve pro receipt that was given to uh, Anthony Poza that indicated that there was a, a payment made to serve pro that was attributed to the receipt that was given to him states on the bottom it's handwritten it says condo smoke removal so that was paid on December 18th of 2018 and uh, this is largely what Todd Zada was in yesterday to testify about correct and ultimately did your investigation reveal whether the invoice given from Ms. Krzyzewski to Mr. Poza was legitimate or not? Uh, it was not legitimate. Okay. And stepping back for a second, um, as it relates to that Citibank card, can we go back one slide, please? Or two slides, I'm sorry. Uh, this payment amount of $7,116.89 you said it was not made in Lynn's Citibank account number, correct? Correct. Did you see that amount of money come out of the Tri-City estate account, though? Um, I believe I did, but I'd have to review those. I'd have to review that account. Okay, we'll come back to that. Let's continue after the... Sir yep, next slide, please. I'm sorry, one more. Thank you. So this, as I have it, is uh, the 15th receipt that was given to Mr. Poza by Ms. Krzyzewski. What is it in relation to? This is, uh, portrays itself as a, a, as a U.S. bank credit card payment. Uh, the header of the email says, your U.S. bank credit card payment posted. Um, it states the payment was $5,333.48, as it posted on April 3rd of 2019. It also states that it, um, it's associated with account 9921. And did you recognize the account number ending 9921? Uh, I don't believe so. Did it sound like anything you had reviewed as it as far as Miss Hernan's accounts? I, nothing that was associated with Miss Hernan's accounts. Okay. If we go to the uh, next slide, though. Again, you had access to the estate account, though, correct? I did. And this is taken from Exhibit 123 that's in evidence? Yes. And you have this same uh, figure, $5,333.48 circled. Did you ultimately learn where that money went? That was a payment to Jesse Krzyzewski's U.S. Bank uh, account, or and credit if we, card. In fact, go to the next slide. You've included that information as well? Correct. And that went not to Lynn Hernan's account? Correct. Despite it being paid from Lynn Hernan's estate? Correct. Okay. And so that receipt that was given to Mr. Poza indicating that money had been paid to Lynn's credit card, that was false? Correct. Okay. Moving on to the next slide. What are we looking at uh, on this slide? Uh, this is going to be uh, the estate account, that Tri-City estate account for Lynn Hernan. Uh, there is a payment, again, to uh, totaling $3,305.97 on April 26th. Uh, it's a card member, pay, uh, card member service payment, which we've attributed to U.S. Bank. Okay, and you've talked a lot today about uh, having to check certain time frames of multiple different financial accounts to try and find where money's going, correct? Correct. Did you do that in terms of this $3,305 figure? Yes. And ultimately, where did you find that that amount of money went to? That was a payment to Jesse Krzyzewski's uh, U.S. Bank card. Okay. And that was not part of the receipts given to Mr. Poza, correct? No. You sort of found that when you were reviewing the estate account for the other receipts? Correct. Okay, just wanted to clarify. Moving on to the uh, next slide. What is this now? Uh, this is another payment from the Tri-City Estate account, totaling $7,116.89. Okay. Did you try and track down what Citibank card this payment went towards? Uh, I believe I did, yes. And were you successful? I believe so. Okay. Uh, before we move on, uh, let me ask you this about the 711689. Did you compare that against Lynn Hernan's Citibank account? Yes. Did you see any payment uh, 
that matched that amount go into Lynn Hernan's Citibank account around April 4th of 2019? No, that did not go into any of Lynn's accounts okay. at Citibank. So wherever that $7,116 went was not related to Ms. Hernan? Correct. Okay. Now moving on to the next slide. And this has to do with a Bank of America payment? Yes. Okay. And does it give an account uh, number ending that purports an amount of money was paid to? Yes, 0077. Okay. Did you ever find such an account? I don't believe so. Okay. And if we scroll to the next slide, what are we looking at here? Oh, yeah, we did. <laughs> it was, uh, that was the Bank of America account associated with Lynn Hernan. Okay. It's been a long day, Detective. I get it. It has. But you, <laughs> you circled the time frame on this Bank of America uh, document for Lynn Hernan, correct? Correct. And why did you circle way back in September and October of 2016? Because there was no account act. There was no account activity. It was zero balance at that point. Okay. And in fact, this is not one of the accounts we've gone through for Miss Hernan this afternoon, is it? No. Okay. And if we go to the next slide, um, again on the left, is that a portion of your department's subpoena sent to all financial institutions? Correct. The time frame you were asking for documents is from when to when? August of 2016 through October of 2016. And in Bank of America's response on the right, have they indicated the length of time for which they had records related to 0077? Uh, 0077 would have been August of 2016 through October of 2016. Okay. I believe I misspoke there. But yes, that was when they had documents that would have been from August of 2016 through October of 2016. They would have had documents associated with Lynn Hernan's 077 Bank of America account. And they indicate under paragraph 3 on the document on the right that what they've given you in those essentially two months from 2016 is a complete production of bank records, correct? Correct. So if you ask for documents all the way to the present... And that subpoena looks like it was signed in August of 2019, and they gave you through October of 2016. What did you take that to mean? That there were no other bank accounts or statements. Okay. And if we go back a slide then, um, in fact, that October 7th, 2016 has zero balance, correct? Correct. Nothing needed to be paid on that account? No. All right. So that... Receipt given to Mr. Poza for Bank of America, also not true. Correct. All right, moving on uh, to this slide 27 of Exhibit 157. What are we looking at here, Detective? This is a receipt that indicates that a payment was made to Barclays uh, credit card. It states that the amount was $1,711.36. states the payment was made on November 21st of 2018. Were you, in your searching for Lynn Hernan's financial documents, ever able to find a Barclays account for Lynn Hernan? If we go to the next slide. Yes. And uh, anything notable about this time frame related to Ms. Hernan's Barclays account? Uh, in September of, I'm sorry, in October 8th of 2018, the statement balance... Uh, was zero. And again, uh, with Ms. Hernan dying on October 3rd, there shouldn't have been any purchases made after October 8th, correct? Correct. So really no need for $1,711 to be paid to this account? Correct. So that receipt given to Mr. Posa was also fake? Correct. Okay. Moving on to the next slide. What are we looking at here? This was a, this was a payment to Care Credit, to Synchrony Bank. So the receipt that says it was a care credit to a synchrony bank? And <clears throat> how much uh, was supposedly paid to this account? $3,698.89. And you've got a pretty large note in the lower left corner of this slide. What does that mean? Just that Lynn didn't have a care credit account through synchrony bank. She and did have a synchrony bank account. Didn't end in 8464. Uh, but... 
there was no care credit account. And I mean, are you just missing words at this point? Is there a difference between care credit through Synchrony Bank and just having a Synchrony Bank account? Care credit, yes. There is a care credit that Synchrony, you can get through Synchrony Bank. I believe that there's, there's vet bills and things that you can pay with the care credit. Okay, so that's more for like pet care? Yeah. And Lynn Hernan didn't have such an account? No. And her Synchrony Bank certainly didn't end in those last four digits? No. So that uh, receipt to Mr. Poza appears to be fake? Correct. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, here you've included the uh, receipt given to Mr. Poza for a, well you read the name of the business if you can, sir. It's JDM Pro Painting, LLC. Okay. Now, if we just skip right ahead to the bottom, is there any difference between the amount paid between the one on the left and the one on the right? There is no difference for the amount paid. And was the one on the right, where did that come from? The one on the right is, I obtained from JDM Pro Painting LLC. Okay, and to be fair, that seems to be a bill to Jesse Krzyzewski, fair? Yes. It's got Miss Hernan's condo address there? Correct. And so why did you include this? It appears to be a legitimate uh, payout at least. Uh, it does. The one on the right is the legitimate invoice associated with the work that was completed at Lynn Hernan's um, condo. Um, the one on the left indicates that condo paint was purchased by client prior uh, we went together to Home Depot on 11-5-2018 to pick out the right paint. Purchase price was $612.92. Does that information show up on the legitimate invoice? It does not. What, if you look up in the left-hand corner of both documents, does it appear to be any differences in the business uh, heading? The, the address is different. Okay, but ultimately you determine that Ms. Kroszewski properly paid out $1,748 from the estate account? Correct. For these services? Yes. Do you have any idea why, Detective, then she altered the invoice to give to Mr. Pozo? Uh, probably to, uh, through my investigation. I would object not based on speculation. Sustain. Let's go to the next slide. What are we looking at here, Detective? This is a receipt um, for Capital One, ending in 4692, it states that there was a payment of $7,287.33. It states it was paid on October 26, 2018. And is this a legitimate Capital One account belonging to Lynn Hernan? I believe the 4692, yes, was a legitimate number or account. So you had the means to verify this then? Yeah. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, when you tried to verify it, what did you find? I found that there was no payment made. And in fact, uh, way into March through April of 2019, what's the ending balance there? Um, the ending balance is $3,509.98. So in fact, no payments were made in late October 2018? Correct. Again, that appears to be not true. Yes. Moving on to the next slide. What are we looking at here? This is a payment, well, it's a, receipt, it's a payment receipt uh, to one main financial group. Uh, it states that payment was received from Lynn Ann Hernan, or Lynn A. Hernan, uh, account 3434. Total payment was $8,816.22, and it states that it was, uh, it's dated 1110 of 2018. And just to sort of... <clears throat> Recalibrate here. These are all receipts that were given to Mr. Poza when he asked for what's happening with the estate, correct? Correct. Did you ever find a one main financial account in the name of Lynn Hernan? No. Did you look for one? I did. You didn't find any? I did not. So this uh, invoice or receipt also appears to be not true? Correct. Moving on. Uh, what are we looking at here in the next slide as it relates to one main financial? This was a response to a subpoena that was served to one main financial. Uh, it, showed, it indicates that they had researched all available records using the information provided in your request, but they were unable to locate any records for Lynn Hernan or Jesse Krzyzewski. Okay. Uh, you said earlier that you were looking for financial accounts for Lynn Hernan 
Jesse Kershevsky, and Jennifer Flower, correct? <coughs> correct. And one main financial said, we don't find anything for Lynn Hernan and Jesse Kershevsky, correct? Correct. Did they tell you that there was an account for Jennifer Flower? They did. Can we go to the next slide, please? And uh, so what are we looking at here, Detective? This was part of the uh, returns from the one main, one main financial uh, accounts uh, associated with Jennifer Flower. And again, uh, that total you have circled, why did you circle that total at the bottom? It shows it was paid off. There's a zero balance after that payment is made. Okay. And it was on 11, November 6th, 2018. Okay. And is that uh, roughly around the same time that Ms. Kraszewski is telling Mr. Poza that this one main in Lynn Hernan's name is being paid off? Correct. Okay. But again, as far as Mr. Poza being told this money is going to Lynn Hernan's bills and affairs, that appears to not be true. True. Now moving on to the next slide, and I believe this is the final slide, 36 of 157. Detective, what are we looking at here, please? This is a receipt that indicates um, there was a payment made to Quality Fireplace and Chimney Service. Uh, it shows it was from a 9994 account. Uh, it indicates that it was paid on uh, January 3rd, 2019. It says it was paid in person, and it was for condo fireplace clean. Does it list an amount on the invoice given to Mr. Pozo? Uh, $80. Okay. And on the right-hand side of the screen, what are we looking at there? The right-hand part of the screen is the um, U.S. Bank uh, statement associated with the 994 account, which belongs to Jesse Krzyzewski. <coughs> And this was the time frame of December 5th of 2018 to January 3rd of 2019. Do you see any such payments come from Ms. Kraszewski's Visa card ending 9994 that match up to the invoice she gave Mr. Poza? No. All right. Thank you. That uh, exhibit can come down. I just have probably 10 to 15 more minutes, Your Honor. Right, let's just stand for a minute then. Oh, my jurors, do anyone need a restroom right quickly before we complete this? All right, no hands. Speak now. <laughs> Raise your hand, no hands. Okay. <coughs> All right, thank you. Be seated. and 166, I believe, will be my last two exhibits. Okay. Okay. Can you see those exhibits on your screen, Detective? Yes. Okay. Um, do you see exhibit 161? I do. Now, before when we were talking about all the financial documents you reviewed, you stated that Ms. Kraszewski had a Discover card account? Correct. And Ms. Hernan had a Discover Card account, correct? Correct. Is there anything unique about how Discover Card produces their financial statements in terms of a person's credit score month to month? The monthly statements do provide a credit score for the individual who owns the account. And so over the course of however long you had those Discover Card monthly statements for, were you able to track both Ms. Kraszewski and Ms. Hernan's credit scores over time? Yes. And when you tracked those credit scores over time, did you compare them? I did. Did you find it noteworthy in your investigation to compare them? Yes. Why? Well, it shows the credit and I guess the spending history, financial history uh, associated with both Lynn and Jesse. And in fact, as you've done many times, uh, today, did you uh, prepare a sort of summary chart based off those credit scores? Yes. And uh, do you see Exhibit 161 on your screen? I do. And can you tell us what it is? This is the credit score 
uh, based upon those records obtained from the Discover statements of Lynn Herning from the, the begins in August of 16 all the way through uh, October of 2018. Okay, and uh, I would move Exhibit 161 into evidence and ask to publish. Are you going to do page two no first? No I, I was going to do page two first, in fact. I'll, I'll hold off because I believe there needs to be more on page two. Okay. Um, Despite there being no objection. <laughs> Detective, as it relates to Ms. Kershevsky and those credit scores, again, where did you obtain the reported credit scores from? It would have been from uh, Discover statements. Okay. And, in fact, and I'm switching gears here a little bit, but when we talk about Ms. Hernan and her Discover card account, those financial statements actually extended beyond her death, correct? For Ms. Hernan's? Yes. Correct. And, in fact... We've talked about how a number of her credit cards became maxed out around the time of her death. Yes. And that negatively would affect someone's credit score, fair? Correct. So when you put these summary charts together, did you uh, sort of stop reporting on Ms. Hernan's credit score as of October of 2018? Yes. Now, with Ms. Kershevsky, her credit score went beyond October of 2018. Is that fair? Correct. And that was obviously her being alive and going about her day, living out those patterns of life we've talked about, correct? Correct. And so when you compiled Ms. Kershevsky's uh, credit score, it will go a little bit beyond in time Ms. Hernan's reported credit scores. Is that fair? That's true. All right. Your Honor, at this point I would move Exhibit 161 into evidence and ask to publish. Still no objection. Thank you. Exhibit 161 is received permission to publish granted. <laughs> And we are going to start on slide two. And so, Detective Plenis, whose uh, credit score are we looking at here in this, uh, I think it's a bar graph? This is uh, Jesse Krzyzewski's credit score. And can you tell from what time that uh, sort of chart begins and when it ends? Uh, it begins uh, around March of 2017 and ends around January of 2020. Okay. And is that sort of the time frame for which you had uh, Discover Card accounts for Ms. Kershevsky? Yes. And in fact, you've heard some evidence, and you probably know through your investigation, that Ms. Kershevsky was arrested in this case in July of 2019. Yes. So if you would, just can you just draw a line sort of... Um, vertically from July of 2019, so we can see where that moment in time is. Okay, and uh, I think it's fair then to discard what's to the right as we look at that image uh, as far as credit score. Would you agree? I would agree. Okay, so at the very highest point, you can see Ms. Kershevsky's credit score over the years. What number do you see? Uh, 631. And when was that reported, if you can tell? It in October of 17. Okay. And at its lowest point, again, left of the red line, what number do you see there? Uh, four, 473. And when, what time frame roughly was that? That would have been between September of 2018 and October of 2018. Okay. Anything significant about that period of time as it relates to the rest of your investigation you've been talking about? Yeah. What was that? Well, Lynn Hernan uh, died in the October 3rd of 2018. Uh, numerous accounts associated with Lynn Hernan uh, changed their, I guess, their patterns of life, as we've talked about in detail today. Everything changed with the transaction history and how those accounts went on towards... Um, leading up to October of 2018. Okay, and, and you're saying that's sort of consistent with that low point in Ms. Kershevsky's credit history, or credit score, I should say? That's correct. Okay, and if we go back to slide one of Exhibit 161, please, and could we please clear the screen? Thank you. Um, what sort of scores do you see for Ms. Hernan at their, at their topmost score? Topmost score was around an 808. And that would have been in around October 
of 2017. And uh, what do you see as the lowest credit score reported by Ms. Hernan's Discover Card reports? Uh, the lowest is 589. And what general time frame is that, Detective? It would have been uh, September of 2018. Again, is that significant in your investigation? Yes. And why? Well, it shows that Lynn's pattern of life changed drastically, uh, at least with the Discover card and what they've documented with their credit score. You know, looking at, you know, between maybe end of June or end of June of 2018 and July of 2018, things start to, um, I guess, uh, the credit score goes down okay. significantly. And if we go to slide three of Exhibit 161, please. Uh, did you sort of plot both credit scores uh, on the same chart in this one? Yes. And why did you do that? Because uh, of the way that the credit scores, uh, the, the pattern that they had. And again, what's the uh, beginning time frame of this chart to the end time frame? The beginning of this chart is March of 2017. Um, the end, the last date on this chart is like, uh, April of 19. Okay. We can take Exhibit 161 down, please. Can we go to Exhibit 165, please? I'm sorry, 166. Now, Detective, uh, we've talked a lot about the financial accounts, and really that's because you were investigating the theft counts that are involved in this case, fair? Correct. And yesterday, were you in court when Attorney Taylor testified to the cash withdrawals from the estate account? Yes. She sort of had a ballpark figure in her mind, correct? Correct. Did you actually go through each of the cash withdrawals and the checks written to Jesse Kershevsky and Jennifer Flower from the estate account and total them up? Yes. And in chart, I'm sorry, in Exhibit 166, did you sort of do another summary report as to those totals? Yes. And um, is that a fair and accurate copy taken from all the financial <coughs> records that we've been talking about all day today? Yes. All right. I'd move Exhibit 166 into evidence and ask to publish. No objection. Exhibit 166 is received permission to publish granted. Okay. So... Um, Detective Plenis, what are we looking at in the chart along the right side? These are the withdrawals uh, from the Tri-City Estate account, the 5138 account. And did you total those up? I did. And what figure did you reach on the left there? For the total from the, the, total from the estate, all of them included? All the in-person withdrawals, the cash withdrawals? Yes, just the in-person cash withdrawals that you've noted on the left side of that oh, chart. The total for the in-person cash withdrawals was $44,889.53. And then you've also factored in that check written out to cash. That's the fifth line down on the chart. Is that right? Correct. That was dated April 5th of 2019. And then likewise, you documented that $5,000 check written out to Ms. Kershevsky herself. Correct. And if we go to the next... Uh, slide. Why did you include this uh, $5,000 check to Ms. Kershevsky that we saw in the chart on the previous slide? Uh, it's written, uh, the memo on this uh, check indicates that it's reimbursement for funeral expenses. Okay. And uh, did you go through that final estate account sheet in the probate case that we talked about yesterday and identify the various costs that Ms. Kershevsky claimed added up to the funeral expenses? Yes. Was it $5,000 or was it less? It was less. Okay. And so did you figure out what the actual amounts were? Yes. The difference between what was put in the account and this check? Yes. Yes. And roughly what was that figure? I believe it was around $2,800. Okay. So this check for $5,000 with something funeral EXP, that's an overage, that's, not, that's more than the actual funeral costs from what you could tell from the financial accounts. Correct. 
Did you factor that in, if we go to slide three, to this middle section uh, related to cash withdrawals and checks to cash? Yes. Okay. And so the total of all those uh, cash withdrawals, and do you recall approximately how many from that chart, how many cash withdrawals from that chart on slide one? Um, I can't recall. Okay. If we go back to slide one briefly, how many cash withdrawals were there? The in-person cash withdrawals? Or just you're talking cash in general? Just cash withdrawals in general. So everything except those two checks. How many transactions are there? Seventeen. Okay. And then there's the two checks we've talked about. If we could go back to slide three, please. So the middle section is all those numbers added up plus whatever that sort of overage is from the funeral expenses. Fair? Correct. What's that top number? The top number is the inheritance loan funding. And that's what Attorney Beth Taylor testified to yesterday? Correct. Okay. And then what's that uh, bottom number about payments to non lin accounts? What is that? Those were payments from the Tri-City Tri Tri Estate account that went to accounts that weren't LINs. That were accounts to Jesse Krzyzewski or the accounts to Jennifer Flower. Okay, so when we saw those, those three transactions as we went through the receipts given to Mr. Poza, correct? Correct. Where you found uh, payments that actually, two of them went to Ms. Kershevsky's credit cards, is that fair? That's fair. And you're saying the total of those three was $15,756.34? Correct. And so that total that you have circled there, that 87000 is that what you've investigated and found to be the theft from Lynn Hernan's estate? Yes. Judge, I'm done asking questions today. And we will conclude for the day, and we'll start with Cross tomorrow. I do need to read to you the uh, instruction. I know you've heard it, but it needs to be repeated. Uh, please do not begin your deliberations and discussion of the case until all the evidence is presented and I have instructed you on the law. Do not discuss this case among yourselves or with anyone else until your final deliberations in the jury room. This order is not limited to face-to-face -face conversations. It also extends to all forms of electronic communications. Do not use any electronic devices such as a mobile phone or computer, text or instant messaging or social networking sites to send or receive any information about this case or your experience as a juror. We will stop or recess from time to time during this trial. You may be excused from the courtroom when it is necessary for me to hear legal arguments from the lawyers. If you come in contact with the parties, lawyers or witnesses do not speak with them. For their part, the parties, lawyers and witnesses will not contact or speak with the jurors. Do not listen to any conversations about this case. Do not research any information that you personally think might be helpful to you in understanding the issues presented. Do not investigate this case on your own or visit the scene, either in person or by any electronic means. Do not read any newspaper reports or listen to any news reports on radio, television, over the internet, or any other electronic application or tool about this trial. Do not consult dictionaries, computers, electronic applications, social media, the internet, or other reference materials for additional information. Do not seek information regarding the public record of any party or witness in this case. Any information you obtain outside the courtroom could be misleading, inaccurate, or incomplete. Relying on this information is unfair because the parties would not have an opportunity to refute, explain, or correct it. Do not communicate with anyone about this trial or your experience as a juror while you are serving on this jury. Do not use a computer, cell phone, or other electronic device, including personal wearable electronics, applications, or tools with communication capabilities to share any information about this case. For example, do not communicate by telephone, blog post, email, text message, instant message, social media post, or in any other way on or off the computer. Do not permit anyone to communicate with you about this matter, either in person, electronically, or by any other means. If anyone does so despite your telling them not to, you should report that to me. 
I appreciate that it is tempting when you go home in the evening to discuss this case with another member of your household, but you may not do so. This case must be decided by you, the jurors, based on the evidence presented in the courtroom. People not serving on this jury have not heard the evidence, and it is improper for them to influence your deliberations and decision in this case. After this trial is completed, you are free to communicate with anyone in any manner. These rules are intended to assure that jurors remain impartial throughout the trial. If any juror has reason to believe that another juror has violated these rules, you should report that to me. If jurors do not comply with these rules, it could result in a new trial involving additional time and significant expense to the parties and the taxpayers. You are to decide the case solely on the evidence offered and received at trial. With that, you are excused for the day. Thank you for your time and attention. I'll rise for the jury, please. Tomorrow, 8.30. You can step down after they do. I've got to do a couple things with the parts, but you can step down. You can be seated. It's kind of a non-sidebar sidebar, but uh, obviously the parties um, talked amongst themselves, and then you let me know that you had worked it out and uh, it had to do with a $12,000 figure. Uh, there was a question about that. Attorney Sitzberger, um, I think, asked a question about it. That I don't know the document number off the top of my head, but essentially um, that's what the sidebar was about. Otherwise, we did not have any other sidebars. So is there anything I need to address prior to all of us breaking for the evening from the state? Nothing from that sidebar, Your Honor, but uh, the last exhibit I put up, 166, um, I had modified it this morning prior to coming to court, and I think we emailed all the parties, and then we ended up showing the old version anyway, so it just has an extra line of information on the first of three slides in 166, and I just wanted the record to be clear on that. Okay. Nothing else from us, Your Honor. All right, then we are all done for the day. We'll see you all tomorrow. Remember, come early, test your equipment, and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Judge.